All right, council member, and I apologize to everyone listening for the delay. We are now live on YouTube and you may begin when you're ready. Uh, thank you. My apologies as well. We had a previous hearing uh, wrapped up as quickly as we could. Uh, but good afternoon. I'm Robert White, council member at large and chair of the Committee on Government Operations and Facilities. Today is Thursday, September 22nd, 2022. The time is now 12.15 p.m. and I'm calling to order this hearing of the Committee on Government Operations and Facilities regarding Bill B-24-558, the Stop Discrimination by Algorithms Amendment Act 2021, or SDAA. This bill comes to us from Attorney General Carl Racine, who worked together with a coalition of local civil rights advocates to propose some thoughtful solutions to a problem that has emerged as technology and the use of data and algorithms has expanded. As policymakers tasked with overseeing the Office of Human Rights, we on this committee need to be attentive to dynamics that threaten to undermine the core promise of the Human Rights Act of 1977, quote, to secure an end in the District of Columbia to discrimination for any reason other than that of individual merit, end quote. Federal and local law prohibit discrimination based on race, gender, religion, age, and several other characteristics in settings such as employment, housing, and public accommodations. And for decades, businesses have been amassing an ever-increasing range of data points about each of us, and they've developed increasingly sophisticated ways to use this information to predict everything from our shopping habits to our likelihood of having a heart attack. Now, I appreciate technological innovation and efficiency. In many cases, these commercial programs are developed with reasonable intentions. A manufacturer might reasonably not want to pay an advertising platform to show its product features to someone when the manufacturer can predict to a statistical near certainty that that consumer will never buy that product. Or if a home mortgage lender has reason to believe that people who graduated from one graduate program are significantly less likely to default than people who graduated from any other school, they might think it fair to offer those graduates a lower interest rate. Data scientists and programmers who are watching this hearing will be familiar with the phrase garbage in, garbage out. Today and throughout the period of recent history when most of the relevant underlying data were produced, historical and ongoing biases and barriers produced disparate outcomes along democrat demographic lines that have nothing to do with people's individual innate aptitude or individual needs. When you take data polluted by irrational biases and use it uncritically to make decisions about new actions, you run the risk of replicating those biases. The result can be an algorithm that, for example, predicts that a Black patient may have worse health outcomes due to future racism, rather than any inherent health condition that's tied to their race. Not only that, you might actually accidentally give bias practices an aura of scientific validity that make the biased decisions harder to notice and remedy. In a letter accompanying the introduction of SDAA, Attorney General Racine has gathered some very troubling examples of this type of phenomenon. With the SDAA, the Attorney General and his collaborators have proposed a blueprint to find and fix patterns of unjust denial of opportunities and benefits based on protected characteristics. The bill bans using automated systems to perform certain actions, such as targeting people for job ads or ruling them ineligible for housing units in ways that are tied to protected characteristics. It requires entities that meet certain size or business volume thresholds to check their algorithms for bias and submit annual reports to the Attorney General. And it requires transparency to let consumers know when algorithms are part of an application process and further discloses when an algorithm is actually used to screen someone out of an opportunity. I look forward to discussing these proposals with Attorney General Racine and our other government representatives today. We have also received written testimony from members of the public, including local employment law experts, civil rights watchdogs, and representatives of numerous industries that are very important to the District of Columbia, such as housing, insurance, education, and healthcare. I know that legislating in this area is a new endeavor for the district and the nation that 
that algorithms underpin much of our economy and that anything we do in this space must be carefully considered. That's why I call this hearing and I look forward to a thoughtful discussion of the best ways to achieve this bill's important goals. I do want to note that we will have to recess this hearing for about 20 to 30 minutes at four o'clock PM to allow the committee to complete a markup of several pieces of important pending legislation. We will resume as soon as possible after the completion uh, of that markup, immediately after the completion uh, of that markup, uh, to the remainder of the witness list. Let me now turn to uh, my colleagues, if any are here, uh, Council Member Henderson. Um, I think Council Member Pinto is here ahead of me. I have no idea the order. Um, Council oh, Member Pinto has also been having some tech issues, so I hope that we are able to hear and see her. Um, uh, I hope. Can you hear me now? We we can. Council member, uh, Pinto, are you, uh, do you have a, a statement, an opening statement? Um, I do. And thank you, council member Henderson. I don't mind whichever order. Um, we will start with you, council member Pinto, council member Henderson. Thank you. We'll come to you next. Okay. Appreciate it. Um, well, I'm glad that you can now hear me. Sorry. You can't see me yet. Uh, we're, we're halfway there, but thank you very much. Chairperson White for holding this hearing on the Stop Discrimination by Algorithms Act. I am really grateful to the Office of the Attorney General for highlighting a continued problem in our city and across the country of bias and bias-related outcomes as a result of screening, advertising, and other tools that have been utilized. As we have fought to root out discrimination in our society, the increased use of algorithms and machine learning and the lack of transparency around these tools has introduced a new challenge. We've seen algorithms used to screen out job applicants who have disabilities and to unlawfully target Facebook ads to renters or buyers based on race, religion, sex, or family status. We have seen healthcare algorithms suggest that healthier white patients should receive more services to manage their health than sick or black patients. These forms of discrimination are pernicious and we need updated tools to address them. We've also seen major innovations made in public and private sectors through the use of algorithms, often leading to heightened consumer preferences on which our residents have come to rely. We will hear from a number of witnesses today who have concerns that this bill in its current form is overly broad. And we must ensure that as we work to achieve our shared goal of eliminating discriminatory practices, that we do so in a targeted way that will meet that goal and will not be too overly broad. And so I look forward to hearing from all of our witnesses today and working together with the Office of Attorney General, civil rights advocates, and various industry leaders to ensure that this bill targets unfair discrimination where it is happening. As we move forward with this conversation, I encourage all of us to keep in mind our central overarching goal of preventing and addressing unfair discrimination in all of its forms and keep an open mind about how best to do so. So thank you again, Chairman White, for holding this hearing and to your team and all of our witnesses testifying today. Thank you, Council Member Pinto. Uh, Council Member Henderson. Uh, thank you, Council Member White. I don't have a long or official opening statement. I do want to thank all the witnesses who have signed up to testify. Uh, interested in this legislation um, in that a interesting cross sector, uh, a cross section, I would say, of industries and groups have contacted my office about this particular bill. Um, enough so that it, it piqued my interest and curiosity that uh, Industries that are not normally aligned um, happen to be aligned here in some of the concerns that they have raised. And so I'm interested in um, hearing more um, from those individuals, but from our government witnesses in terms of um, what we are trying to achieve by this bill, um, but also how um, this bill is seeking to, I guess, fill in the gaps of other federal already existing federal law and practices, whether it be in healthcare or banking or others, um, that also seek to ensure that we're not discriminating against others from a consumer affairs protection standpoint. So I look forward to hearing the testimony today 
And then of course, you know, Mr. Chairman, joining you at four o'clock for our markup. Uh, thanks so much. This will be an interesting hearing. Uh, I'm looking forward to it. Uh, now we are going to turn to our public witnesses. Everyone should have received a copy of the witness list yesterday. I'm gonna call witnesses in the order uh, um, on that list. And when I do, the staff will, well, except for uh, two where I made the mistake, uh, when you are called, uh, you will drop out of the hearing momentarily. You will come back in as a panelist, at which point you can unmute yourself and turn on your video. Uh, public witnesses have four minutes to testify. Advisory neighborhood commissioners have five minutes to testify. We will do panels of eight. Our first panel is uh, Margaret Durkin, Jim Peretti, Matthew Kronzek, Kara Bonder, uh, or Bender, my apologies, Benjamin Winters, Shea Brown, Matt Konowski, Konaki, uh, Michael Richards, and Daniel Castro. Margaret Durkin, welcome. You can begin when you're ready. Thank you. Good afternoon, Chairman White, members of the committee, and Council Member Mendelson. My name is Margaret Durkin, and I serve as Mid Atlantic Executive Director for the Technology Trade Association, TechNet. Thank you for the opportunity for allowing TechNet to express their opposition to the Stop Discrimination by Algorithms Act. We agree that preventing bias and discrimination through the use of algorithms is a critical goal. Many, if not all, of the practices prohibited in the current bill are already covered under the DC Human Rights Act. The bill presents many operational challenges, including implementation issues due to definitions that are broad and vague, compliance issues, as well as unintended consequences. A fundamental aspect of the bill, what constitutes an algorithm, is not adequately specified. The bill defines an algorithmic eligibility determination as an algorithmic process that uses AI, machine learning, or similar techniques. However, algorithmic, algorithmic process is not specified throughout the bill, and businesses are left only to guess what is meant by similar techniques. This could unintentionally cover common harmless actions, such as recommendations or delivering results from a search. The expansively broad definition of algorithmic information availability determination will create uncertainty regarding what encompasses this bill. Additionally, vast swaths of marketing and advertising that are beneficial to and generally enjoyed by consumers, such as presenting an online clothing ad, are categorically covered in this legislation. In terms of compliance requirements, the lack of flexibility makes it difficult for businesses to comply and offers little guidance. Additionally, the audit requirements require companies to provide government consumer data and possibly divulge proprietary information and trade secrets. Compounded with the definitional ambiguities and the risk of private action, Companies will be hesitant to customize marketing to their customers based on their preferences, preferences that go above and beyond racial and gender stereotypes. Finally, the bill has several unintended consequences. As drafted, paragraph A1 in section four could have the unintentional effect of keeping advertisements that highlight programs or community opportunities to those groups such as racial minorities, women, or others, because they segregate, discriminate against, or otherwise make important life opportunities available to an individual or class of individuals. The bill's data retention requirements violate standard best practices of data minimization. To report and retain five years of data requires storage, transfer, and protection, which could expose sensitive user data and be expensive to both businesses and government to implement. Because of this uncertainty, if enacted, this bill may result in service disruptions for citizens in the district. There is a real possibility that our members may have no choice but to temporarily disable service offerings in the district. 
We understand the concerns this bill is attempting to address, and our members are continuously adding protections to mitigate bias and discrimination in AI. Regulating algorithms deserves a thoughtful and consistent approach to avoid unintended consequences. Unfortunately, TechNet is opposed to this proposal to overregulate the use of AI technology, especially when that technology provides so many benefits to the citizens in DC and to commerce in the district. Thank you for your time, and we look forward to having further discussions with you on the bill. Uh, thank you so much, Jim Peretti. Thank you, Chairman. Thank you, sir. Chairman White, members of the council, good afternoon. Uh, my name is Jim Peretti, and I am a shareholder in the law firm of Littler Mendelssohn PC. I'm also a member of the firm's Workplace Policy Institute, or WPI, based in Washington, DC. WPI is Littler's public policy arm, and we work with national and international employers, as well as startup companies and others, uh, to provide experience and subject matter expertise to local, state, and federal policymakers in crafting labor and employment laws. And while I'm based in the nation's capital, I am speaking to you today somewhat improbably from the nation's water park capital, Wisconsin Dells, Wisconsin. Uh, the people are lovely, the internet not so much, so please bear with any technical difficulties. WPI submitted written testimony to the council on the subject of today's hearing. Uh, in the limited time that I have today, I'm gonna highlight a few key points that we raise in our submission, which includes recommendations for amendments to the proposed legislation and underscores concerns we have with the underlying bill. First, we recommend that the council amend the legislation to explicitly ensure its application is to employers doing business in the District of Columbia or seeking to fill positions within the District of Columbia and to employees and job seekers who are residents or seek to obtain employment within the district. As written, the legislation conceivably applies to any employer of significant size, including those who may not do business in the district or employ district residents, and indeed may have little or no nexus to the district whatsoever. Second, we recommend that the definitions within the legislation be amended to apply only to those employment tools which actively use algorithms and AI technology in their application. Uh, and I second the remarks of the prior panelist in terms of uh, our view that the uh, definitions within the law currently are overbroad. Third, we submit that the notice requirements of the law, both substantively and procedurally, are flawed and in many instances will be simply impossible for any employer subject to the law to comply with. Fourth, we recommend that the legislation be amended to recognize that under existing federal and District of Columbia civil rights laws, the mere fact that a screening tool may have a measured adverse impact on some category of protected workers does not in and of itself render its use unlawful. Indeed, even where such a tool results in disparate impact, an employer may be justified in its use if the purpose is job related and consistent with business necessity and the tool is narrowly tailored to attain those goals. Finally, while we respect what appears to be the legislation's intent to provide a simple standard framework for the use of algorithmic technology across a range of measures, from employment to credit to housing, consumers, and beyond, uh, we submit that the sheer complexity of this technology makes a one-size-fits-all approach inapt. Uh, indeed, even solely within the context of employment, the use and regulation of AI technology will differ radically. An employer who contracts with a vendor to design a screening and recruitment tool based on its own needs and data derived from its own workforce is vastly different than another employer who merely turns to publicly available tools or websites to assist in canvassing, screening, and ranking resumes. Different still are those third-party companies who seek to assist employers in obtaining temporary or contingent workers who are often needed immediately, as in within hours, if not days. Yet the proposed law imposes the same regulatory framework on each of those users who each have, or more important, may not have access to or control over source data, let alone the workings of algorithms that may assist them in their recruiting and hiring activities. Uh, we submit that a more nuanced approach that recognizes, the, recognizes these different use cases is necessary. Finally, I think we'd all agree that used correctly, AI technology has the capacity to increase efficiency, reduce discrimination, and increase opportunity for district residents. At the same time, if used or designed incorrectly, this technology can have the unintended effect of continuing patterns of unlawful discrimination. I think the goal for all of us is to craft a measure that addresses that problem while still recognizing the myriad lawful salutary purposes for which this technology is used. I and my colleagues at Littler's WPI stand ready to assist the council in doing so, and we thank you for the time and opportunity to be heard today. Thank you very much. Our next witness is Matthew uh, Kronzek. 
Are you with us? Cara, uh, wait, there we go. Cara uh, Bender, Bonder. Hi, yes. Can you tell me how to pronounce this? I don't mispronounce your name again. Sorry, it's Kara Bunder. Kara Bunder. Thank you very much. Welcome. You can begin. Thank you, Chair White and members of the committee. Thank you for the opportunity to testify today. As I mentioned, I'm Kara Bunder, State Policy Director at the Computer and Communications Industry Association. CCIA is an international not-for-profit trade association representing a broad cross-section of communications and technology firms. We respectfully oppose B24-558. While CCIA shares the council's concern and agrees more work can and must be done to study the potential impacts of automated decision-making, this measure is not the solution. We appreciate the opportunity to share some of our concerns today. Ambiguous and inconsistent regulation at the state or local levels may undermine business certainty and create significant confusion surrounding compliance. The National Institute of Science and Technology is leading efforts to establish best practices and guidance to not only evaluate and verify AI systems, but also better manage risks in the design, use, and evaluation. These ongoing studies by national experts should signal the complexity of the issue. Lawmakers should wait for and review these forthcoming best practices to inform the development of national standards and regulations. Practitioners and stakeholders should be part of conversations about what constitutes best practice. Online businesses are already taking steps to ensure a safer and more trustworthy internet. The Digital Trust and Safety Partnership is working to develop and implement best practices and recently reported on the efforts to implement such commitments. We urge council members to study both the benefits and drawbacks of algorithmic technologies and to engage with practitioners and stakeholders to support the ongoing development of practicable solutions. Broad definitions of the types of AI systems subject to audit would force online services to collect additional information and submit disclosures for an unwieldy number of systems. These definitions would apply to a large number of AI systems and to comply with auditing requirements, covered entities would be forced to collect significantly more information from consumers than they otherwise would. The requirement conflicts sharply with data minimization principles. Covered entities would also be required to conduct audits for an incredibly large number of AI systems and the bill provides little clarity about when to conduct such audits. Assessments should be reserved for systems that make decisions that result in a legal or similarly significant effect concerning an individual. Disclosures for low-risk automated decisions provide little benefit to consumers while impeding business activity and diminishing the personalization of consumer services. Overly prescriptive annual auditing reporting requirements risk exposing business-sensitive information and may unintentionally harm consumers. The bill requires covered entities to annually disclose a long list of granular information. Disclosure requirements should not risk exposing trade secrets or business sensitive information as this would have a chilling effect on customer service and innovation. Such expansive disclosures may also inadvertently provide bad actors with a playbook for circumventing and hacking algorithmic tools rather than protecting consumers. Lengthy data storage requirements coupled with sharing such data also potentially poses a threat to user privacy online. Finally, we'd like to express concern with the bill's private right of action. Speculative lawsuits are extremely costly and time intensive to litigants and the judiciary. These costs may be passed to district taxpayers, online services, and local brick and mortar businesses in DC that use these services to advertise online. These costly proceedings would disproportionately impact smaller businesses and startups across the district. In sum, while we support the council's concern regarding the potential for algorithmic discrimination and bias, we encourage council members to resist advancing legislation that is not adequately tailored to this objective. We appreciate the committee's consideration of these comments and stand ready to provide additional information. Thank you for your time. Uh, thank you very much, Benjamin Winters. Chair White, members of the committee, thank you for allowing me to testify today in strong support of B24058, the Scott Discrimination by Algorithms Act. My name is Ben Winters, and I'm counsel at the Electronic Privacy Information Center, or EPIC, where I lead our work on AI and human rights. EPIC was founded over 25 years ago to focus public attention on emerging privacy and civil liberties issues, and has been working on issues related to AI transparency and accountability nationwide. 
Epic has been researching automated decision-making systems used across the DC government over the last 14 months, including many provided and completed by third-party contractors, like Rent Grow for public housing tenant screening reports, Pandera for investigations into potential benefits fraud, and more. These systems are deeply opaque, incentivize sensitive data collection, and more. In commerce, these systems are used for hiring, education, credit decisions, ad delivery, and housing, just to name a few. Five student proctoring companies are using unfair and deceptive trade practices, which my colleague Sarah Gagan will explain in her testimony and Epic explained at length in an Office of Attorney General complaint last year. These tools are usually given deference in an era of objectivity, but bias and discrimination are reflected in tools based on the data that the algorithm is learning from and the systems the tools are used in. At present, there's no accountability for the impact nor transparency around the developer or the human and fiscal cost they cause. The SDAA will mitigate discriminatory impacts of these systems by explicitly bringing civil rights protections into today's context. The SDAA will also help because there will be required oversight in the forms of audits, impact assessments, and reports to the OAG of important considerations around data use. The bill, although should be improved by more clearly delineating between these three different oversight mechanisms, is strong because it lays out what must be considered in yearly internal audits and what is exposed to the Attorney General. Without that, companies will be left to their own devices to decide what an audit is, what an impact assessment is, and will never be good enough to help protect consumers. Um, so in this, we believe that SDA strikes a good balance in the minimum required information and not overburdening businesses of all sizes. Uh, in written comments that we're gonna follow up with, we'll follow up with recommendations on how uh, the council should delineate those three different mechanisms. Uh, but the SDA allows the OAG and the individuals to achieve recourse for harms they suffer. In other words, it's regulation in the space with a little bit of teeth, which is always necessary and rarely achieved. The private right of action is sensible and essential. Based on decisions by these algorithms, people suffer individual harms and should have an individual remedy. And the claims are based on impact without intent needing to be proved. And that is absolutely the correct move and not an unreasonable un or unwarranted impact on business, otherwise that you might hear today. Discriminatory impact is the basis of the Civil Rights, of, Civil Rights Act of 1964, the Fair Housing Act, and the Age Discrimination and Employment Act. We do not need to reinvent the wheel, and business should not get special deference just because they're operating in the digital sphere. This bill does not put an unreasonable onus on businesses and will protect consumers. In response to a few prior comments, I'd love to just reorient us a little bit. The expansive definition of an algorithm is a good thing. <laughs> Simple tools or systems like ad servicers should absolutely not be exempt from this bill. That is the point and the discriminatory potential of an algorithm has zero correlation with this discriminatory danger. But compliance costs will go down if less personal data is used. Lastly, trade secrets are less important than stopping discrimination, full stop. This bill would allow Washington to make clear its commitment to fairness, transparency, and non-discrimination non -discrimination, and be the country's leader in this space. I urge you to support this bill. Thank you for your time and I'm happy to take any questions you might have. Thank you very much for your testimony. Shay Brown, uh, welcome. Thank you very much. I'd like to thank the council for allowing me to, uh, to comment. Uh, my name is Shay Brown. I'm the CEO of Babel AI. Uh, Babel is a company that audits algorithms for ethical risk, effective governance, bias, and disparate impact. So I really have th just three main points, all of them sort of centered around the concept of audit and uh, risk and impact assessments. Um, I first like to say this law is a welcome attempt to mitigate uh, real harms that some of these systems can cause. Um, however, I think that uh, my first point is about independence. So I think in the law currently, uh, it doesn't really specify anything specific about uh, what level of independence that both audits or uh, risk or impact assessment should have. Well, I'm not necessarily advocating for third-party independent auditing of these systems. I do think uh, from our experience, we've noticed that uh, having some level of independence, whether it be uh, in the context of internal audit, like, a, like model risk management, some, le some level of independence is necessary for actually uh, you know, effectively auditing these systems. So it could be internal independence, but I think that it's important if you're moving forward with this law to make it clear exactly uh, you know, who should be doing these assessments. Um, the second is normative standards. Uh, what, what counts as uh, an effective audit or risk or impact assessment varies wildly 
uh, in industry right now. And it could go from a, a very simple checklist, which is has almost minimal impact uh, or ability to mitigate risk, to a very deep and thoughtful uh, assessment. And I think that some level of normative guidance, and as a previous uh, testimony uh, talked about the NIST uh, risk management framework, which is being developed. I think that's a good thing. Uh, and so referencing some sort of external standard to give companies some idea as to how to actually perform these and what, what sort of bar should be set for, for these practices, I think is critically important because if not, you'll end up getting a very minimal checklist, which will actually not mitigate risk or disparate impact in, in any way. And finally, related to that, uh, the notion of contacting or uh, uh, talking to external stakeholders, in, including people who are impacted by these, uh, is something that we've noticed in our practice is very important for catching uh, the potential for disparate impact in these systems. So actually understanding how people interact with these socio-technical systems, I think, is critically important. And, and so some sort of reference in, in the law to uh, at least having companies consider uh, communicating with people who are impacted by these systems is going to be a, a big step forward uh, for actually mitigating risk in these systems. Um, thank you very much. I appreciate the opportunity. Thank you very much, uh, Matt Konecki. Uh, Good afternoon, and thank you for the opportunity to testify. My name is Matt Kaunacki. I'm the Director of State Research and Policy at the American Financial Services Association. Our members provide district consumers with credit cards, vehicle loans, and leases, and mortgages, among other types of credit, and they include national banks and sales finance companies. We share the council's concerns and other witnesses about discriminatory outcomes, and our members are committed to equality in lending and utilizing technology to increase access to financial products and services. Financial institutions are heavily regulated at the federal, state, and local levels, and the financial services industry has faced unique scrutiny and regulation over these issues of discrimination. For this reason, for decades, our industry, more than any other, has spent time, resources, and community capital to combat discriminatory practices. While automating a process does not by itself guarantee elimination of discrimination, it does limit the impact. In fact, many of the technological tools that would be affected by this bill have been crucial to reaching these goals. For example, automating credit underwriting and other processes decreases the likelihood of individual bias that could exist from face-to-face -face interactions, and it lowers the cost of credit availability, which significantly expands access to credit for district consumers. Importantly, these tools were developed and implemented in full compliance with existing laws. The Equal Credit Opportunity Act already prohibits discrimination in credit transactions. The Gramm-Leach-Bliley Act protects the privacy of consumer financial information. The Fair Credit Reporting Act ensures the accuracy of credit reporting, and all of these laws make credit transactions more transparent. Because these protections already apply to the use of algorithms and automation in credit transactions, the proposed legislation would not provide any new material benefit or improved consumer protections. Instead, the cumbersome and impossible to implement provisions would result in excessive and ineffectual compliance costs that would make credit more expensive and less accessible for district borrowers. Uh, I, outside of the uh, areas where existing financial consumer protection laws don't overlap, the legislation may in fact be inconsistent or at odds with existing laws and even the district, district's own regulatory guidance for financial institutions. This is particularly concerning with regards to federally insured mortgages and those sold to GSEs like Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac. Many of these products rely on automated processes over which financial institutions have no control and thus no ability to audit or meet the bill's other transparency requirements. Uh, I'd like to just briefly share uh, a slide here and uh, if if you can see my screen up here oops uh, <clears throat> so we have uh, this is straight from the FHA website uh, the Federal Housing Administration identifies its own total mortgage scorecard process as a statistically derived algorithm developed by HUD to evaluate borrower credit history and application information. 
This algorithm was developed and is maintained by a federal agency, but any financial institution participating in HUD programs could not comply with the legislation due to the inability to force FHA to comply with the legislation as required of service providers. If the law cannot be complied with, then district consumers could lose access to numerous federal programs aimed at increasing mortgage affordability with the greatest impact on those consumers with lower credit scores and income who rely on these programs most. Uh, finally, the additional compliance burden extends beyond credit underwriting and crucial to consumers and financial institutions alike is fraud prevention. Fraudulent transactions annually amount to billions of dollars making the need for fraud prevention greater than ever. AI models uh, are crucial to this process and make it more efficient and effective and have proven to be extremely valuable in identifying fraud and stopping it before it hits a consumer's account, which keeps costs down for all consumers. At a time when fraud operations are becoming increasingly sophisticated, diverting critical resources away from fraud prevention and toward compliance with this legislation will not benefit consumers. I appreciate the opportunity to testify and look forward to discussing these issues further with the council. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, Michael Richards. Well, Chairman White. Yep, thank you. Uh, Chairman White, distinguished members of the council. My name is Michael Richards. I'm a policy director at the US Chamber of Commerce Technology Engagement Center. CTEC is the tech hub of the US Chamber where we work with the business community to review and analyze the impact of legislative proposals, advocate for policies that provide certainty to the business community and help craft solutions to many of the most pressing issues facing the business community across the country. In my testimony today, I will give more context to the current federal and international landscape on AI policy, as well as how the U.S. Chamber and business community at large are leading in this space, and why it's in the interest of the D.C. Council not to move forward with this legislation. Due to the legislation's impact on businesses of sizes and sectors, including small businesses, it's essential to understand the complexities being discussed abroad, as well as at the federal level. AI has become an essential tool for small businesses. CTEC just last month put out a report which found that technology platforms, many of which rely on AI, played a critical role in helping small businesses, business owners in the U.S. survive the current economic turbulence. And small businesses that fully embrace technology are both outcompeting their peers and more optimistic about the future, despite uh, continued headwinds. A few of the major highlights of that report are the following. 93% of small businesses are using at least one technology platform. When small businesses use technology, they contribute $17.7 .7 trillion to the U.S. economy. 86% of small businesses, businesses say technology helped their businesses survive during COVID. 63% of small businesses plan to use most, the most advanced technology, including AI and VR. The Small Business Administration has determined the District of Columbia has 79,814 small businesses which makes up 98.2% of DC businesses. Sadly, the legislation we are here to discuss would disproportionately impact these small businesses as they would be left to cover the increase in compliance costs and legal fees associated with the legislation. At a time when our small businesses, business communities continue to weather turbulent economic conditions from unprecedented increases in inflation to worker shortage, any legislation which, is, which would significantly impact the small business community should be thoroughly thought through and developed in partnership with all stakeholders. For this reason, we recommend waiting for other streams to be finalized on the domestic and international stages before moving forward. So what are these work streams? Uh, we've already discussed a little bit about uh, the National Institutes of Standards and Technology is working diligently to develop an AI risk management framework. This framework's first iteration will be finalized in January of 2023. The framework is intended for voluntary use to improve the ability to incorporate trustworthiness considerations into the design, development, use, and evaluation of AI products, services, and systems. Furthermore, I believe the council will be interested to know that NIST is also developing a set of best practices to adapt a comprehensive socio-technical approach to testing, evaluation, verification, and validation of AI systems, an approach that looks to conduct, connect the technology to Sasoto societal values to develop guidance for recommend, uh, recommended practices in deploying automated decision systems. The first one will be actually on credit underwriting and subsequently we'll look to develop other best practices in other places. On the international stage, we see quite a bit of work developing rules and regulations on AI, specifically in Europe, is diligently working to establish the EU AI Act. Legislation has taken over two years to draft and the initial draft currently has over 4,000 amendments to it. This illustrates how complex of an issue this is and the importance of governing body 
taking the necessary time to receive input and analysis to have constructive dialogue about the pros and cons of any such legislation. Finally, I want to highlight that we at the U.S. Chamber and Broader Business Committee understand the concerns regarding potential negative externalities that AI and other made decisions could have. Therefore, the Chamber has proactively working to address this issue by creating the U.S. Chamber AI Commission on Global Competitive Inclusion and Innovation. This commission is compiled representatives from the business community, academia, think tanks, to address three core issues, how to regulate AI, how to prepare the workforce, and how to ensure the United States stands ready to compete uh, internationally and globally. Uh, in conclusion, international and domestic work teams, as well as the business community efforts, are all diligently working to develop thoughtful solutions to help mitigate many of these issues. These work teams show great promise, which is why the U.S. Chamber strongly advises the Council not to move forward with what's this legislative uh, proposal until these work teams are finalized and provide the necessary answers around how we can strike the right balance between mitigating issues and concerns with AI technology, and while at the same time providing a powerful and essential tool to allow small businesses and communities to thrive. Thank you. Well, thank you very much. Um, final witness for this panel, Daniel Castro. Thank you. I'm uh, Daniel Castro, director of the Center for Data Innovation, a nonprofit think tank that studies the intersection of data technology and public policy. So I wholeheartedly agree that policymakers should be taking steps to reduce discrimination in society, but they should be doing so directly by enforcing and strengthening existing civil rights laws. The proposed law here attempts to reduce discrimination indirectly through a broad set of restrictions on the use of algorithmic decision making. And these restrictions risk stifling the development and use of artificial intelligence, hurting both businesses and consumers. So I want to discuss a few of the Act's key provisions. So first, the Act would prohibit organizations from using algorithms to discriminate against individuals in certain situations. While well-intentioned, policymakers do not need to enact AI-specific anti-discrimination laws because existing laws ranging from the DC Human Rights Act to the ADA already prohibit discrimination. AI is not a get out of jail free card. Using AI does not exempt organizations from adhering to these laws. Moreover, if the purpose of the legislation is to prevent discrimination, it should remain narrowly focused on discriminatory actions with adverse effects on individuals, rather than broadly regulating the use of AI for advertising and marketing purposes, which would likely have unintended consequences, such as restricting targeted ads for coding boot camps for women or targeted ads around faith-based faith -based colleges. Second, the act would require organizations to disclose how they use personal information and algorithmic decisions. While transparency can help consumers make more informed decisions, consumers should receive the same level of transparency for automated decisions that they receive for non-automated decisions. If policymakers believe that organizations are making decisions about individuals without sufficient notice, then they should apply disclosure requirements to all organizations, regardless of whether they're using a computer algorithm or a human process to make those decisions. In addition, the proposed law's notification requirements for adverse actions is not limited to only decisions based on protected traits, which means there's a wide array of automated decisions that could fall under this requirement. For example, a credit card denying a charge that appears fraudulent or an employer rejecting an applicant that does not hold a required credential could all trigger these notification obligations. Third, the act would require organizations to audit their algorithms for discriminatory impacts. This provision places an extraordinary burden not only on those organizations using algorithms for decision making, but also on the service providers who offer such functionality to others. Many of the auditing requirements would not be appropriate to require service providers to report because they won't necessarily have the details about, for example, how a particular customer is using their service. Moreover, many businesses and service providers are already struggling to comply with the algorithm auditing requirements in New York City, which only apply to AI systems used in hiring. The audit requirements in the proposed act would apply to a much broader set of activity and present even more challenges. Fourth, the act would authorize individuals to bring civil actions against anyone in violation of the law. Creating a private right of action is particularly problematic because it would likely open a floodgate of frivolous lawsuits. Again, other jurisdictions that have created similar private rights of actions, such as in Illinois with the Biometrics Information Privacy Act, have imposed substantial costs on organizations that are eventually passed on to consumers. So overall, the legislation is very well in, uh, intentioned, but ultimately misguided. Given that AI can help organizations improve the accuracy of their decisions, 
as well as reduce human bias in decision making, the law will likely result in more consumers being denied access to the various important life opportunities that this legislation is designed and intended to protect. Thank you again. Uh, thanks so much to 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 this panel. Um, want to want to flesh things out a, a little bit, and and I'll pick up where uh, where you left off, uh, Mr. Castro. Um, it it is very accurate that that there are benefits, many benefits uh, to to algorithms, the way that they are used to uh, to get information and, and services uh, to us. Um, also true is that. Um, people have biases. Everybody uh, has biases, and, and people are, are building the technology uh, that 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 does these algorithms. And so there there is bias in, in the algorithms. And I think it's not a question of whether um, this is a space that should be um, regulated and or audited. It, the question is how and, and by whom, local governments or, or federal governments. Um, and so this is a, this is a road that, that we have to go down. Now, now I would say that the issue of um, algorithms and bias in algorithms is more important to me than, than maybe some folks on, on this panel, at least where the, the line is, um, because there are, and I, I think it was, uh, um, they mentioned that the line should be sort of a, a legal um, issue. If, you know, on one side, algorithms can impact very serious things like credit approval, um, um, release from, from incarceration, parole, um, and, and, and maybe there's an argument that there's a legal issue there. But I, um, I'm dealing with this issue right now in, in real life as the father of a three-year-old and six-year-old uh, girls. Now, we've put them on YouTube Kids because there's too much stuff on general YouTube. It is important to me and my wife for them to see people of color and other little Black kids and Black families so that as they are defining in their minds uh, what is beautiful, what is good, they are seeing reflections of themselves, which before this generation didn't really exist. And so I, as a parent, have an opportunity to protect my daughters in a way that people of color were not protected for the entirety of life. And so my wife and I realized a week ago that all the kids and families they were seeing were white. And so that's an algorithm issue. So we thought we were smart and we went in and we did a bunch of searches and clicked on videos to alter the algorithm so that they could see options. Well, the algorithms beat us because a week later, still very difficult for them to find on their own people of color. Now, this doesn't rise to the level of significance of uh, a legal issue, but it is very important and it is the impact of algorithms and it does impact my kids, other kids, families in this way and in many other ways. And so we have to wrap our heads around how we address this in, in a way that 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 makes sense. Um, so so let me sort of start by getting an understanding of where a few people testified about uh, developing uh, best practices. Uh, Ms. Boonder, where, where are you? Where are we on developing uh, best practices that may become sort of a national standard? Yes, thank you for your question. Um, I, I believe the 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 efforts at, uh, at the NIST level are ongoing. There was recently a publication in August 2022, which as I understand it is still um, a draft form. And so those conversations are still ongoing. And so there's still forthcoming best practices that are being developed. I'd be happy to follow up with more specific information regarding timelines uh, in written form, but that's the information that I can put, provide at this time. I, I can't recall when I, I, I I think it's England that has developed um, laws on this, and um, and I was I was I, I guess so. So there's no no hard timeline on the the best practices. Is is that right? 
I would need to to look into that in greater detail, and I could follow up in written form. Okay, Ms. Mr. Richard, you, Mr. Richard, you you mentioned uh, development of um, I don't think the term you used was best practices, but but essentially possible regulations that would you know balance out the the need to protect people with sort of the realities of businesses and small businesses. Where is that effort, or how far along is that? He may be, may be gone. Um, Matt uh, uh, Kaunaki, um, you mentioned in your testimony something I was interested in about how um, um, the algorithms can help with fraud prevention. Can you say a bit more about, about how that works? Sure, and I, thank you for the question. Uh, obviously, you know, it's it's a complex issue and um, certainly we can follow up with some written comments, it, but uh, to speak to that a little bit, um, you know, you have global fraud rings, you have patterns of, of fraud that occur around the, the world, really, and so financial institutions will use all of that data from multiple sources of existing fraud, previous fraud, in order to identify, isolate, and stop uh, future fraud. So well, fraud by you know, in, individual people or, or broad categories of people? Uh, you know, it, it, it's really both. Um, you know, we've all gotten those alerts on uh, our accounts where uh, a, a transaction was this you flagging it as, as possibly fraud and yes or no, can you approve it? So, so that is all based on inputs of, of millions, really, of, of pieces of data that um, an individual uh, person couldn't process on their own without the use of, of these technological tools. And, you know, one of the, the concerns with, with the bill that we've heard from um, some of our members is in part, especially in the, in the fraud uh, prevention area, where obviously you guys are not trying to stop us from preventing fraud, but uh, what you have is the bill requiring um, these adverse action notices, where if uh, a transaction that you've done on your own is flagged as fraud for whatever reason by this system and put on hold even temporarily to ask you to approve it and move forward, would now the financial institution have to send you uh, an adverse action notice resulting from that transaction and the delay that was uh, caused by the possibility of fraud. And you have that happening thousands of, of times a day um, across these financial institutions, across accounts, across customers. So, you know, you've got the compliance burden related to that. You've got potential customer confusion because now they're being told that uh, they were subject to an adverse action related to a possibly fraudulent transaction. And, and you could really end up with more confusion than, than a disclosure uh, you might want. Uh, so this, this may make sense on something like uh, fraud prevention, but if the, tech, the same technology is used for something like credit or mortgage approval, um, that, that would raise a significant concern. Um, I don't know a ton about how technology is, is used for fraud prevention, but I do know that facial recognition tools uh, by, by a large margin, to margin disproportionately misidentify people of color. Is it possible that this technology has the same flaw? Well, uh, you know, I mean, I, I think algorithms and technology are always a work in progress. And, you know, but like I said in my testimony, our industry has been subject to more strict anti-discrimination laws than any other industry for decades. And this has been a problem uh, in the past, unfortunately. But, you know, these tools are actually used to remove that possibility of, of, of bias. You know, you don't have the face-to-face -face interactions Instead, you know, you, you are looking at a broader credit profile, you're looking at data inputs that lessen the impact of any individual piece of data that, that might unfortunately result from bias. So, you know, you've got these protections already in place for credit transactions that 
you know, it, it's not legal to discriminate in a mortgage transaction using an algorithm or using a face-to-face -face interaction. And, um, you know, also, I, I think that that also highlights the issue with all of the federal programs where you have the federal government has developed and maintains these algorithms. The FHA example is, is just one of many and financial institutions have no real access to what goes into that process, no uh, authority to dictate FHA actually comply despite being service providers and participating in these programs uh, on behalf of district consumers. I appreciate it. I uh, know I'm a, a bit over time, but let me turn to uh, Ben Winters. Hi, yeah. Um, thank you, uh, Councilmember White. I just wanted to briefly respond uh, just to the, the notion about the use of these algorithms uh, don't always have to necessarily be bad, but that doesn't mean that they shouldn't be subject to disclosure, study, and like audits and reports to the OAG. Um, in regards, regards to the adverse action notices, um, although that may uh, you know, be a logistical difficulty for the fraud detection in that moment, uh, it's something that can be done, uh, you know, and it might be a little bit extra barrier, but it's not something that's impossible. It's not legislating uh, this industry and companies out of business. And for the benefit that it has, a little bit of oversight, uh, I, would, I would argue, and I think many will would agree with me, that that is worth it. Um, and so it's not just because algorithms can be good, uh, doesn't mean that they would be banned by this bill. It means that discriminatory uses it and, you know, resulting in a negative consequence would be banned under this bill. So I just want to reorient there that it's not like we are running everyone out of business if we pass this bill. We're just protecting some or protecting consumers. I appreciate it. Um, let me see if my my colleagues, uh, Councilmember Pinto or Councilmember Henderson, have questions for this panel. Well, let me uh, thank you all again for, for taking the time to, to testify, for, for reaching out to the committee, many of you uh, ahead of this hearing. Uh, we look forward to working with you as we continue to, to develop this, this concept. And, and, and I hear that a lot of work is going on uh, in other realms as well. So, so I look forward to working with you all as this develops. Uh, we will call up our next panel, Cynthia Ku, Michael Carone, Vandana Singh, Chris Grimm, Emily Paul, Allison Taylor, and Shay Ruddle Tabisola. Cynthia Ku, welcome. Uh, you can begin your testimony. Good afternoon, Chairperson White and members of the committee. My name is Cynthia Ku, and I'm a senior associate at the Center on Privacy and Technology at Georgetown Law. The center is a law and research think tank focused on the privacy rights of historically marginalized groups. This includes the civil rights implications of commercial data practices, such as algorithmic decision making. I'm testifying in support of Bill B24-558, the Stop Discrimination by Algorithms Act, or the SDAA. We respectfully urge the committee and eventually DC Council to pass this bill. I'll briefly provide three key points now and will elaborate on them in written testimony to follow. My first point is simple. Banning algorithmic discrimination is the right thing to do. You may hear objections to this bill have heard from industry, such as the obligations are a lot of work or will cost them money. We acknowledge that's the case, but we must also recognize that the right thing is often not the easy thing nor the cheap thing. Justice demands that those who profit from deploying algorithmic decision-making tools into the world do the hard work to ensure that those profits are not reaped at the expense of vulnerable communities and their civil rights. This legislation sets the groundwork to ensure that basic responsibility is fulfilled. My second point goes to the heart of this bill. Algorithmic discrimination is different from traditional discrimination. To illustrate, take a high school or college graduate. They're moving, looking for work, applying for further education. But the apartment declines them because the tenant screening algorithm matched a racially biased arrest record to the wrong name. They miss out on a perfect job opportunity because the targeted ads algorithm wrongly assumed people of their age and gender wouldn't be qualified. The college rejects them because the video interview algorithm scored their personality using indicators that misinterpret their disability as negative behavior. In all these cases, Algorithmic decision-making doesn't just discriminate based on who you are, but on who the algorithm predicts you to be. 
even if that so-called prediction is just a wildly inaccurate guess. Worse, these systems automate that discrimination and impact people's futures without them even knowing. Companies running automated decision algorithms silently in the background are building a more deeply stratified society than ever. To add insult to injury, all of this hidden discrimination is dressed up as state-of-the-art scientific objectivity, concealing the ghost of systemic oppression in the machine. The SDAA bridges the gap between current human rights law and these new dangers that algorithmic discrimination presents. Third and last, I encourage you to question the idea of good actors and bad actors when it comes to algorithmic discrimination. You may hear these terms along with critiques of the bill on grounds that it penalizes companies for unintentional discrimination. However, companies are already prohibited from unintentional discrimination under existing law. Intent is irrelevant. This is well established. The discrimination itself is what matters, regardless of whether an organization directly discriminates against someone to their face or discriminates against them through automated software. These software tools are part of broader socio-technical systems where the development and deployment of a technology is inseparable from the inequity in its surrounding context and inseparable from the unjust values it often upholds. The ubiquitous sales and use of personal data in a society where systemic oppression persists makes discriminatory bias almost unavoidable in many algorithmic decision-making systems. This is why the solution must be to ban the practice where it affects survival needs and important life opportunities. You can do this by passing the SDAA. I greatly appreciate the committee's attention to this critical issue and thank you for the opportunity to present this testimony. Uh, thanks so much, Michael Carone. Good afternoon. Good to see you again, Council Member White. Welcome. Uh, thank you. Thank you. So, good afternoon, uh, Chairperson White and members of the Committee on Government Operations and Facilities. I am Michael Carone with the Consumer Data Industry Association, CDA for short, and I'm here to testify on the Stop Discriminations by Algorithms Act of 2021. A uh, quick introduction about CDIA. We are an international trade association uh, based out of Washington, D.C. We were founded in 1906. We represent the consumer reporting industry, consumer reporting agencies, including the nationwide credit bureaus, regional and specialized credit bureaus, background check and residential screening companies, and others. We promote the responsible use of consumer data to help consumers achieve their financial goals and help businesses, governments, and volunteer organizations avoid fraud and manage risk. Through the use of da these data and analytics, our, our members at CDI empower economic opportunity all over the world, helping ensure fair and safe transactions for consumers, facilitating competition, and expanding consumers' access to achieve financial gains and other products that suit their needs. Um, after that introduction, I'd like to get into the bill. So, uh, so the, stop, the Stop Discrimination by Algorithms Act of 2021 would prohibit users of algorithmic decision-making from utilizing algorithmic eligibility determinations in a discriminatory manner, to also requiring corresponding notices to individuals whose personal information is used, and also provides for the opportunity of civil, enfor civil enforcement. Users who rely on these analytic products and services will have detailed reporting requirements each year, and there will be significant audit oversight regarding the use of these analytics. CDI members generally do not make determinations about consumers. This includes algorithmic eligibility and algorithmic information availability determinations under this bill. However, CDI members do provide analytic solutions that are used by their clients for eligibility determinations in credit, housing, employment, and other contexts. CDI members also provide fraud detection and prevention solutions to their clients in credit, housing, employment, and other contexts. When acting as service providers and performing these determinations on behalf of others under the bill, CDI members may be expected to comply with this new law by their principles. Users will need significant assistance from CDI members who provide these services to comply with this law. CDI members must test for compliance with fair lending, housing, and other applicable laws, including fam family status, source of income, and another context to assure that the products are suitable for the users to rely on. CDI members are currently already heavily regulated at the federal level by several well-established laws, most notably the Fair Credit Reporting Act, the FCRA, the Gramm-Leach-Biley Act, GLBA, and the Equal Credit Opportunity Act, uh, among others. There are other laws as well, but those are the top three. Um, so the FCRA was passed in 1970. It's really the country's first national privacy law. The law has been in many, many times over the years to ensure consumer protections are properly maintained uh, as technology advances and the use of consumer data has evolved over decades. The FCRA has long had robust consumer protections, including the right to know what information is collected about consumers, to know who has accessed that information, to know what information is included in your consumer report, 
and to correct and delete inaccurate information. The FCRA also provides strictly controlled permissible purpose to limit the access uh, of consumer reports by data users. The FCRA also affords substantial identity theft prevention and mitigation rights for consumers and duties for businesses. For and also for enf enforcement purposes, the FCRA provides for rights of action, private right of action, enforcement by state attorney generals, the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau, and the Federal Trade Commission. The FCRA also includes important and necessary protections to consumers, lenders, government agencies, law enforcement, volunteer organizations, and businesses who rely on full, complete, and accurate consumer reports to meet their needs and expectations and to make informed decisions. Uh, the Graham Leach Biley Act, the GLBA, is also a significant, significant privacy law. It imposes significant requirements on businesses to limit the disclosure of information and allow consumers to opt out of certain information sharing. The Equal Credit Opportunity Act also prohibits discrimination based on race, color, religion, national origin, sex, marital status, age, receipt of public assistance, or good faith exercise of any rights under the Consumer, Consumer Credit Protection Act. Uh, this, there, also, there may be uh, some possible federal preemption issues that we can discuss later if you have any questions, but the bill would potentially force CDI members, uh, our consumer reporting agencies, to disclose consumer information without a permissible purpose which would conflict with uh, the FCRA section 604 specifically. There could also be preemption issues with the Equal Credit Opportunity Act, specifically the information sharing requirements, which are regulated under, under the Equal Credit Opportunity Act and Regulation B specifically. Um, there are also some larger privacy concerns with the bill. For example, the audit process may raise privacy concerns by requiring the sharing of identifiable data between private entities and the attorney general. Furthermore, I'd just like to highlight what some of our members are doing here. Um, Mr. Caron, you are yep. almost a minute over. Uh, if you could just My apologies. briefly uh, conclude. My apologies. So, okay. uh, um, in conclusion, we believe there are many protections already provided to consumers that protect them from discrimination. Uh, for these reasons already listed, we would encourage a reconsideration against this legislation that would negatively impact the current structure that is in place and helps consumers outside of the United States and all over the world. Thank you for consideration of my comments. I'll be happy to answer any questions you have. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, Spandana Singh, please welcome. Chairperson White, council members, and staff of the Committee on Government Operations and Facilities. My name is Spandana Singh, and I'm a policy analyst at New America's Open Technology Institute, also known as OTI. Thank you for the opportunity to testify today. OTA is based here in the district and works to ensure that every community has equitable access to technology and its benefits. This includes advocating for privacy related protections and working to ensure that the development and deployment of automated decision making algorithms by both businesses and governments are subject to robust safeguards that prevent bias and discrimination, promote transparency and accountability, and offer meaningful opportunities for redress. First, we would like to applaud the efforts that Attorney General Racine and the Council are undertaking to address discriminatory algorithms in the district. The development and deployment of big data and emerging technologies has rapidly outpaced legislation, and we strongly need protections that will contextualize and preserve civil rights in the digital ecosystem and protect Black, Brown, and other marginalized communities, including immigrants, the LGBTQ community, and individuals living with disabilities. While the district has made some important progress in tackling systemic discrimination, it is still a daily reality for many residents, and these realities can be reproduced and exacerbated by algorithmic systems. For example, systematic racism and injustice have significantly impacted healthcare outcomes for certain district communities. According to national statistics, black women are three to four times more likely to die from pregnancy related causes than white women. According to the district's maternity mortality review committee between 2014 and 2018, black women have comprised approximately half of all births in the district and a staggering 90% of birth related deaths. Several factors, including over-policing, underinvestment, and biased historical health stereotypes around Black communities have resulted in these outcomes. Algorithmic systems can identify and exacerbate patterns in historical health data, resulting in worse rather than improved maternal mortality and morbidity health outcomes for Black communities and other communities of color. 
For example, for many years, it has been a standard practice for US healthcare institutions to use the vaginal birth after cesarean or VBAC algorithm to provide labor guidance to pregnant women who had already undergone C-sections. The original algorithm included a modifier that assigned a higher risk of a complicated vaginal delivery to black or Hispanic women who had previously undergone C-sections. As a result, doctors were more likely to recommend a C-section to Black or Hispanic women who had had a previous one compared to other women, raising their risk for infections and internal bleeding. Last year, the race modifier was removed from the VBAC after outcry across the medical field. But this is just one example of an algorithm that can be deployed in healthcare settings with the intention of improving health outcomes, but that can actually exacerbate racial bias and disparities. Because of this, it is critical that the committee and the council introduce meaningful safeguards and requirements around the use of such high risk and consequential algorithms. OTI has conducted long standing research on algorithmic accountability, and we are supportive of the Stop Discrimination by Algorithms Act as it embodies many best practices in this space, including increasing transparency for consumers via accessible and comprehensible disclosures, promoting accountability via annual audits and impact assessments, providing opportunities for redress to impacted consumers, and prohibiting the use of biased algorithms in critical areas of life. Overall, this legislation, which is comprehensive and the first of its kind in the United States, will ensure that organizations are using algorithmic systems to augment and improve the lives of district residents and not fail the district's most vulnerable communities. Accordingly, we ask that the committee move to pass the Stop Discrimination by Algorithms Act as soon as possible. I welcome any questions and OTI stands ready to support the council in moving forward this critical piece of legislation. Thank you. Uh, thank you so much. Nandita Sampat. Hello, um, thank you Chairman White and committee members. My name is Nandita Sampath, and I am a policy analyst at Consumer Reports, focused on algorithmic bias and accountability. We applaud the Attorney General for introducing this important piece of legislation. The use of algorithms to determine individuals' access to life opportunities can be concerning without robust transparency and oversight, and has the potential to roll back much of the progress we have made from anti-discrimination law. We believe this bill is an important step to identifying and correcting sources of bias and other harm in algorithms that make critical decisions about DC residents. While many companies tout algorithms and AI as being more objective and unbiased in their decision making, often this is not the case. Algorithmic decision making has the potential to not only perpetuate societal biases, but also exacerbate them because of a lack of transparency and accountability. Consider an individual applying for a job where the resumes are screened using an algorithm. If the algorithm is trained on data regarding who has been historically successful in the past from getting a particular job, then this could lead to the algorithm screening out those whose resumes may not resemble those previously successful resumes. For industries such as finance and technology, which have historically been dominated by white men, for example, this could lead to this discrimination and exclusion of women and minorities. Employment is not the only sector where this type of bias could lead to the exclusion of people from life opportunities. Areas like housing, education, and public accommodations, such as credit, healthcare, and insurance are all areas where people could be denied life opportunities, life-changing opportunities due to bias algorithms. This bill bans adverse decisions in these areas based on traits protected by the DC Human Rights Act, which include race, age, sex, and sexual orientation. This bill can be transformative in clamping down on algorithmic discrimination and other harm. This bill also requires covered entities to provide an adverse action notice to an individual if they take any adverse action in full or in part on the results of an algorithmic eligibility determination. This is crucial because often a victim of algorithmic discrimination may not even know when they are being discriminated against or why an adverse decision was made about them. This bill would require companies to provide an explanation to the individual and allow for the individual to submit corrections that could change their outcomes. This is a major step in providing DC residents with more agency over decisions made about them and also disincentivizes companies from using complicated, unexplainable algorithms like neural networks to make decisions about people's access to life opportunities. People deserve meaningful explanations when they are denied these services and complex algorithms can prevent companies from providing them. This bill also requires companies to audit their algorithms and provide a report with the results of the audit to the attorney general. Companies are required to report information about what the algorithm does, um, the data is used to make decisions, the accuracy of the model, and the results and frequency of testing. While we think this lays an important foundation for transparency, we think this would be strengthened with the requirement for companies to get independently evaluated by a third party. 
We believe companies who conduct internal evaluations could exclude important information from these reports when they do not need to go through an external evaluator. We hope to see this suggestion included in future legislation. Ultimately, this bill is one of the first of its kind and sets the bar high for what algorithmic regulation could look like across the country. We urge you to support this bill and thank you for your consideration. Well, thank you very much for your testimony. Chris Grimm, welcome. Thank you, Chairman White, members of the committee. Uh, thank you for the opportunity to testify regarding the Stop Discrimination by Algorithm Act. Uh, my name is Chris Grimm and I represent the Innovative Lending Platform Association. While we support the spirit and intent of this bill and believe that algorithms have been a great equalizing force in the world of small business finance, we must oppose the bill's overly broad language and onerous requirements. ILPA is the leading trade organization for online finance and service companies serving small businesses. Our members offer various commercial financing products and are proud to provide thousands of businesses with working capital to invest in their business, purchase inventory, hire additional hands for the busy season, expand the business, or repair damaged outdated equipment. During the COVID-19 pandemic, ILPA members, along with CDFIs and other non-bank, state-licensed, and regulated fintech lenders, ensure that the smallest of small businesses, including minority-owned businesses, historically the most underserved groups by banks and traditional lenders, uh, were able to access the Paycheck Protection Program. Our members use innovative underwriting and the latest technology to quickly evaluate a customer's credit risk and provide financing in as little as 24 hours. Our digital approach to underwriting takes inherent human biases out of the equation. Unlike in-person, where biases, even subconscious ones, exist, applying for financing online removes these variables from consideration. Our members' algorithms evaluate a business's health and risk as a financing recipient and do not consider actual or perceived race, color, religion, national origin, sex, gender identity or expression, sexual orientation, familial status, source of income beyond the business's financial health uh, or disability at all. Despite already adhering to the spirit of the bill, uh, the notice and appeal requirements would make it impossible for ILPA members to comply, particularly the appeal requirement, as companies that use algorithms exclusively for underwriting it is counterintuitive to their fundamental structure to offer businesses an option for a human review of their application. In addition, the penalties provision would make it extremely difficult to continue to provide DC small businesses with financing, and the audit requirements would be extremely costly and onerous for our members to comply with. No small business should face discrimination when applying for critically important financing. It is our members' experience that algorithms and AI-based underwriting remove much of the inherent bias that applicants can face when applying for financing in person. While the goal of the legislation is laudable, it would unfortunately punish companies like ILPA members using technology to overcome bias and discrimination. Thank you, and I'm happy to answer any questions. Uh, thank you very much, Emily Paul. Welcome. Thank you. Thank you for the opportunity to testify today. My name is Emily Paul. I'm a Ward 1 resident and a project director at Upturn, a nonprofit organization here in DC that works to advance justice in the design, governance, and use of technology. At Upturn, we study and challenge the technologies that impact people's access to basic needs and critical opportunities like housing, jobs, and healthcare. We see the SDAA as a positive step in uncovering and addressing algorithmic discrimination in DC. Today, I'd like to share three key lessons we've learned through our work on these issues. First, people in DC face algorithmic discrimination every day and council should take action to address the discriminatory impacts of algorithms that affect people both on and offline. You may not think of housing or employment background checks when you think of algorithmic discrimination, but they are some of the most widespread and plainly racially discriminatory uses of data and algorithms. Almost everyone searching for rental housing in DC is screened by tenant screening companies. Landlords purchase reports from these companies that include eviction credit and criminal records and that in some cases score applicants or even make recommendations about whether to accept or reject them or to charge a higher security deposit. At large hourly employers like Walmart and CVS, people applying for jobs are not only subject to background checks using data matching, but are also often subject to personality tests. In our research, we found that these tests lacked any apparent connection to the essential functions of the job and that they may have discriminatory effects against protected groups, especially people with disabilities. 
Second, we must address the technologies that people encounter every day, even if they're not novel or newsworthy, and whether they are used by public or private entities. For example, DC, like many states, uses a standardized assessment to determine eligibility for home care through Medicaid. This can dictate whether someone is able to stay in their community and get the care they need. This is just one example of the use of relatively simple technology impacting DC residents, and it demonstrates that it's essential to address algorithmic decisions by both private and government actors. In addition to the SDAA, the council should not overlook other opportunities to address algorithmic discrimination. Public data sources, especially court records, are a significant source of data that fuels discriminatory decisions by both government and private actors. The criminal record sealing and expungement provisions of the Restore Act would keep these records out of background checks for hiring and housing. The third lesson I want to share is that while the discrimination that many DC residents experience when they apply for housing, jobs, loans, or public benefits is not new, the use of algorithms can make it more difficult to address. When these decisions are outsourced to screening technologies and third-party vendors, long-standing discrimination can happen at scale and go undetected. It's often difficult to use existing civil rights law to enforce anti-discrimination without robust investigations into how the technology is being used. A recent investigation of machine learning used by the lending platform Upstart led the company to make changes to its model, which was penalizing loan applicants based on the average SAT and ACT scores of the colleges they went to. Research shows standardized test scores are not correlated with academic merit or success and that they are correlated with race and class. Upstart initially refuted the results of the investigation and further details only came to light after significant advocacy and an inquiry from several U.S. senators. This investigation shows both the benefits of independent research and the significant information asymmetry between the developers of algorithms and those trying to identify and address algorithmic discrimination. The STA would make it easier to do these investigations and making the audits provided to the OAG publicly available would further enable this essential independent research. We would be happy to meet with you in your offices to share more about the harms of algorithmic decision making in DC, as well as how through both the SDAA and other legislation council can tackle these issues. Thank you. Uh, thanks so much. Um, Emily Paul. That was just me. Ah. <laughs> I'm very sorry. And Allison Taylor, I've seen you waiting and I'm trying not to skip anybody and I felt bad that it wasn't you, but now it is you. So welcome. It's me. Yes. Uh, thank you. Good afternoon, Chairperson White and members of the committee. My name is Allison Taylor and I'm Director of Government Relations at Kaiser Permanente. Um, as you may know, Kaiser Permanente is the largest private integrated health delivery system in the U.S., um, and we deliver care to over 12 million members in eight states in DC. Kaiser Permanente of the Mid-Atlantic State, which operates here in the district, provides complete health care services to over 825,000 people in the, in the region, including about 100,000 uh, people in DC. We also operate two medical facilities in the district, one in Northwest and one uh, in the Capitol Hill region. Uh, we definitely support the intent of this legislation and understand the, the risk uh, that a lot of people have identified um, with, with algorithms. However, we want to draw your attention to a couple of concerns that we have as it relates to uh, the healthcare industry. First, um, the bill uh, we think is drafted too vague for healthcare providers to know how to comply. If I can provide an example, um, a healthcare provider could use machine learning to establish risk scores for patients who could deteriorate and need ICU level of care or who are at risk of uh, sepsis or readmission to a hospital, you know, where a patient with a score above a certain, a certain threshold would get additional assessment by clinicians and possible inter intervention. So, that, so they would then be seen by, uh, given additional uh, assessment by an actual person after that. If a protected category, you know, race or gender was associated with the increased risk of, um, uh, of one of these problems, does that automatically mean that the use of that algorithm is an un, uh, unlawful discriminatory practice? You know, we would just like some more clarity on that. Um, a second concern that I wanted to raise uh, for our industry is in some 
cases, a healthcare provider may want an algorithm tuned to address issues that exclusively or more frequently occur in one race or gender. To give a simple example of this, a healthcare provider could use an algorithm to notify patients when they're due for a gynecological exam. Um, and, you know, we, we would expect that that would apply only to those with a female uh, reproductive system. Um, the third, the third um, item I want to discuss uh, is that there's a lot of promise to use machine learning to help healthcare providers correct for health disparities. Uh, and I appreciate that um, Ms. Singh earlier in this panel brought up um, the, the, um, the DC maternal mortality report um, that did show that while Black uh, women make up about one half of births in the district in recent years, they account for about 90% of birth related deaths. And so someone could envision healthcare providers using an al algorithm, maybe it would include race, maybe it wouldn't, to predict a patient's risk for an adverse uh, birth outcome and target those individuals for additional prenatal support. Um, I appreciate the example that was given earlier about the uh, vaginal birth after cesarean and the racial identifier that was removed from that. And um, so we definitely under, uh, understand that this is a complicated area, uh, which we think underscores uh, the need to be careful and thoughtful here. Um, as was recently noted in the Harvard Business Review, uh, it's simply not enough uh, to eliminate demographic information such as uh, race or gender from training data because in some situations that data is needed to correct for biases. Um, the last thing I want to mention real quickly is that sometimes another variable such as geography cor correlates strongly with race and could be used as a proxy. Um, and so just eliminating certain variables such as, as race and the ones listed in the bill could, um, could not do everything that's necessary to eliminate discrimination. So with that, I'll conclude and uh, happy for any questions. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much. And finally, for this panel, uh, Jay Ruddle Tabasola. Uh, good afternoon. Uh, good afternoon, Council Chair White. Uh, Committee Chair White and Council Members. My name is Chair Riddell Tepesola. I am the Director of Government Affairs and Member Advocacy at the Restaurant Association of Metropolitan Washington. Um, established in 1920, RMW is an advocate resource and community for our more than 1,300 members in the Washington metropolitan area. Here in the district, 96% of full-service restaurants are independently owned and operated, and our community includes everyone from beloved neighborhood spots to family-owned restaurants, first-time entrepreneurs, and homegrown restaurant groups. Together, we are one of the city's largest employers and leading contributors to district revenues. At the outset, I uh, want to thank the Office of the Attorney General for putting forward this proposal and the committee for having this hearing. Um, RMW supports the important goals of this proposed legislation to address historical biases by confronting longstanding and in institutionalized tools of destruction, uh, discrimination. To be sure, any food and beverage entrepreneur who has applied for a loan, a line of credit, a retail lease has been subject to the scoring and measuring processes that this bill seeks to address. Um, however, we oppose the proposed legislation as it's drafted. Uh, for one reason, it is far too opaque in how to actually identify instances of discrimination. But more importantly, it's also too imprecise in saying which businesses are subject to its rules in order for the bold bill to effectively accomplish its important aims. And let me go into more detail. Uh, notably, the bill identifies entities covered by um, businesses whose work is unrelated to algorithms. For example, a mid-sized local restaurant group could easily qualify as a covered entity based on their gross receipts. A small single unit restaurant operator could qualify as a covered entity if it had a large online presence and collected more than 25,000 emails. But additionally, all food, beverage, and hospital, um, hospitality and hotel businesses are defined as public accommodations, which is the um, precise area of the Human Rights Act that the bill seeks to protect access to. So as such, um, we are subject to a number of secondary effects, in, in particular data reporting and storage requirements, which are concerning. You know, restaurants frequently engage with a number of vendors that will provide everything such as point of sale systems, customer loyalty programs, and marketing. And we live in a world where these are actually very relatively simple technologies to implement as one of the other panelists had noted. For example, as the bill is drafted, it would appear that if a restaurant advertises by direct mail, 
using geography as a method of targeting, it would be subject to disclose that fact and disclose that fact in a multitude of languages on the restaurant's website. You know, is that the bill's intent? Um, if a restaurant tour conducts a customer rewards campaign by way of its point of sale system, do they have to announce that they intend to do so? And to what audience do they announce that to? And, and the bill doesn't make that clear. Um, if a restaurant tour purchases social media ads, which again are all targeted based on preference and geography, are they responsible to meet the reporting requirements? Of the, or will the platform uh, satisfy the reporting requirements for the restaurant? Um, and lastly, if an operator advertises over LinkedIn for a manager position, is a restaurant tour then obligated to store applicant information for five years? And then how would the applicant be assured that that information is indeed secured uh, storely, uh, stored securely. Um, and finally, the big question is, are any of these intended outcomes of the legislation? I don't believe so, but each is a very strong real possibility as the bill is currently drafted. Um, the legislation's purpose is far too important to be so imprecisely um, defined. Uh, RMW welcomes the opportunity to work with you, the Office of the Attorney General, our other partners on this panel and around the virtual table. To, to make this legislation as strong as possible to meet all of our shared goals and ensure an equal access to healthcare, to housing, to employment, and all the other critical areas of the bill seeks to address. Uh, thank you. Uh, thanks so much. Uh, on that point, I, I, I think you're right that in an, an area that has developed so quickly and, and is, is now used so broadly, there's very little uh, regulation around there. And so uh, I have no doubt that there uh, are plenty of things that, that that can be improved on this uh, this this bill. One thought I have um, is so if so, individual restaurants uh, could be covered according to your your testimony, and and those restaurants are subject to uh, human rights and civil rights laws. And so, if a person uh, who works there engages in discrimination that that would be you know covered and, and protected but but if the but if a person creates an algorithm that discriminates that wouldn't be protected and and that's sort of the the space that we need to to close now um and and it and it will take some some work but i think fundamentally we have to move in that that direction and, and figure out how do we i, I think it, the question isn't do do we go down this road or not? It is how, how do we go down this road the, the, the right way? Um, let me let me get some clarity from uh, Chris Grimm uh, that, that might be sort of helpful in, in illuminating this this conversation. How, how does how does your industry use algorithms for underwriting? So there the algorithms for underwriting are used to evaluate uh, a business's health and their inherent credit risk. So we will look at their bank, their business bank account, their receipts. Uh, if they are a business that ships, you know, products, uh, we'll look at their FedEx or UPS account, uh, and that's all uploaded uh, digitally. So they will, you know, have, um, you know, grant access uh, through our app uh, to those accounts, uh, and then it evaluates that data. Uh, evaluates the health of the business, evaluates how much financing uh, they're eligible to to receive, uh, and and then calculates you know the cost of that financing. Okay, so it only looks at uh, individual aspects. It doesn't categorize businesses broadly. Correct, and okay. we found and we found that things like individual credit scores are actually terrible at indicating how good a business is. Someone could have a great credit score and be a terrible business owner, uh, or or someone could have a terrible business, uh, a terrible credit score, uh, but their business could be doing really well. They're just not good at managing their personal finances. Hmm. Um, you mentioned that the bill would punish companies that have overcome bias. Uh, I'm not sure if overcome was the word you use. I can't remember, but um, the but how 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 have these businesses overcome bias and algorithms? So, so again, I mean, traditionally, um, people who walked into a bank who looked a certain way, um, and and that goes beyond things like like race or gender. It's your appearance. Um, if you're not, you know, the clean cut suit and tie look, um, you're traditionally less likely to get approved for a loan. 
Uh, if you are a, a minority business owner or you live in uh, an underserved community, whether that's uh, in urban areas or in more rural areas, uh, it is just harder to access financing. And so what our members have done is we've taken all of that out of the equation. Um, you don't need to go in person and apply for financing. You're doing it online. The algorithms are looking at your health. It doesn't matter if there's a bank branch within five miles or 500 miles of you because uh, you're doing it from your smartphone, uh, you know, at the end of the day before you go to bed. Uh, and so that takes all of that out of the equation and just focuses on how is the business doing? What's their going? What's the ability of the business to repay the financing uh, and, and calculating it that way? And so as, a, as an industry that has used algorithms to overcome a lot of these biases, uh, the requirements in the bill that are particularly onerous uh, are, are actually punishing us for already doing the right thing. Okay. Um, for uh, Cynthia Ku or Nandita Sampath, um, are either of you aware of any litigation that has been brought to address algorithmic discrimination in, in, in any jurisdiction in the United States? I'm not super aware of litigation, but I'm, I'm more familiar with other um, policy around, around states. I don't know if you're interested in hearing about that. Let me come to that next. Uh, let me. Uh, yeah. um, I would echo Nandita in saying that we're not aware of litigation that's been brought. And I think that actually speaks to the importance of having something like a private right of action in this act, because oftentimes it's hard for people to bring litigation if they don't even know that they have something to litigate in the first place. Right. Uh, now, on that issue of policy development in other states, where, where are other jurisdictions uh, in this trajectory? Are, are uh, any state legislatures considering uh, similar legislation? Have any of them passed uh, legislation here? Cynthia, do you have anything? I can. You can go ahead. I can okay. add after. Um, so California for the past couple of years has been um, attempting to pass a bill which uh, would, and similar to, similar to this bill, would require, um, actually a little bit different. So it, whatever um, government procurement um, processes that like purchase AI, they want those to be disclosed to the public and then also provide um, impact assessments for, for that procured technology that would also be um, publicly available. Same with Washington, or sorry, Washington State as well. Um, but these bills haven't passed into law um, yet. And then Illinois has a bill that would require companies who are using um, uh, algorithms in hiring to notify job applicants of that. Um, although job applicants don't have an option to opt out. Um, th that's kind of all I'm familiar with. I believe Massachusetts also has kind of a similar um, impact assessment bill that they've been working on for a bit. Uh, Cynthia Ku, did you, you have anything to add to that? Um, sure. Uh, echoing that Massachusetts has a portion of the, I believe it's the Massachusetts Information Privacy and Security Act that's currently making its way through committee. Um, New York City has passed a very narrowed hiring algorithms bill, but it came in fact under severe criticism from civil rights advocates and privacy and technology law advocates. Um, I would also note that there's currently a rulemaking process being undergone in California by its Employment and Housing Council. And again, that has not yet been passed, still going underway. And so DC really has an opportunity here to get out front of this issue and provide national leadership. I was going to say, sorry, briefly, uh, this bill is actually much stronger than anything I've seen across the country. And so I think this could set a really good um, precedent for, for future, future state regulation as well. Do, do either of you have any thoughts on uh, Allison Taylor's testimony from uh, Kaiser Permanente uh, raised some, some interesting points about the use of algorithms uh, in, in health settings to sort of predict um, I guess more more likely uh, health outcomes and, and therefore to treat them accordingly. Um, do, do either of you have have thoughts on on that? I'm and sure. How we so might deal with it. 
this speaks to two aspects of the bill that I think have been overlooked a little bit, which are the exemptions to this bill. So at the outset, this bill will not cover all businesses, all entities who have ever used or ever using an algorithmic decision making system. There's a small business exception. So if you fall under the threshold of that small business exception, it doesn't matter what you're doing, you're actually not covered by this bill. So that may include things like local restaurants, mom and pop shops, and so forth. The other exception I would point to is the affirmative action exception. There is a carve out in the bill that if you are engaging in an affirmative action plan pursuant to district or federal law, then you are also exempt from this bill. So if you can show that your plan with respect to the healthcare question is remedial in a way that's meant to advance substantive equality, then it's also possible that you may not be captured under this bill. Uh, Alison Taylor, do you have thoughts on what, what aspects of, of your industry uh, are and are not covered by the, this bill? Well, you know, um, the bill references a place of public accommodation, which can include a healthcare facility. So that um, that was the lens in which I thought that that it would apply to a company called Kaiser Permanente. Okay. Um, I appreciate the the mention of the uh, affirmative action um, exemption. Um, we we want to make sure that the language is is clear that um, any that any circumstance that we might be using an algorithm in that way would would be covered by that language. I appreciate it. Um, this is a uh, th this is very helpful. Um, I, I don't think my colleagues are, are here for questions. I want to confirm that. Okay. Um, yeah, I do want to make sure we're able to get to all of our witnesses. So I'm going to keep moving relatively quickly, but but really want to thank everybody for for, for testifying. Very new issue for us uh, here here in the district um, council. So I appreciate you being part of this this conversation. Um, I will uh, move to the next panel of public witnesses, starting with Dean Hunter, George Lambert, Dan Daniel Jellens, Yasmin Taylor, Caitlin Peter. John Bratsakis, uh, Carl Sabo, Rebecca Strauss, and Edwin Ecke. Dean Hunter, are you with us yet? Hello, can you hear me? I can. There oh, man. Is. Sorry about that, Council Member. So sorry to the whole committee. Um, I'll be very, very quick. Um, my name is Dean Hunter. I'm the CEO of the Small Multifamily and Rental Owners Association. Uh, we're a trade group uh, representing uh, small uh, property managers and housing providers in the District of Columbia. Um, I'd like to thank you for holding this hearing. Uh, to allow us to speak in opposition um, of this measure. Uh, we'd like to, to oppose this bill uh, for three reasons. I'd like to make three quick points on this bill. Uh, one, this legislation is fascinating. Um, two, it's just equally frightening. And three, it would have a very serious uh, and potentially adverse impact on DC small businesses and the district as a whole. Uh, the legislation is fascinating because we're dealing with a emerging area of law and policy that really has, has, has where there is not a lot of study or scholarship about. Um, as the previous panelists just testified, uh, there's no other jurisdiction in the world uh, that has passed uh, such a sweeping measure. Uh, and this is a, these are very important matters. Uh, they do have serious implications. Discrimination um, from, from artificial intelligence is real and needs to be addressed. Uh, and uh, on one hand, I'm glad the district is looking at it in this manner. However, uh, as this bill is written, it is not ready for serious consideration by the council. It would be more appropriate to be subject to a law review article or perhaps a symposium um, of various disciplines. 
Uh, the legislation is frankly frightening because of the potential impact it could have on small businesses as well as the district as a whole. Um, again, this has not been done anywhere else in the entire nation. Housing providers and property managers use these algorithms for everything from marketing to uh, tenant screening. Uh, the same arguments that were just made by the Restaurant Association for small restaurants are applicable uh, to small landlords. Even if arguably uh, small providers would be exempt from the law, the reality of the matter is that they contract uh, with vendors who do provide these subject services and who would be subject to liability. It's a lot easier for a trial lawyer to add a small entity to a lawsuit when they got the big fish to go for also. This would arguably subject small businesses to a lot of potential litigation. Uh, the third reason uh, we oppose this measure, and you know, I've lived in DC since 1983. I'm a resident of Ward 1. We care about this city. And the reality of the matter is that these experimental measures, while uh, a lot of times can do a lot to raise the political profile of the politicians that, that, that propose them, they have real consequences on the District of Columbia, particularly its attractiveness to do business to corporations and others. You know, it's not a coincidence that Amazon is in Virginia. And this is the kind of experimental, uh, uh, unprecedented measure that really will adversely impact and make the district much less attractive uh, to businesses. Thank you. Thank you, uh, George Lambert. Thank you, uh, Chairman White, and good afternoon, Chairman White and members of the committee. Uh, my name is George Lambert. I serve as president and CEO of the Greater Washington Urban League. The Greater Washington Urban League is one of 92 affiliates of the National Urban League movement. It is our mission to strengthen the economic and political power of the Black population and underserved communities in the region and to ensure all of the residents of the region benefit from the awards of full citizenship. Washington, D.C. is a geographic region that has been and continues to yield great economic, political, and social advancement for Black residents. However, it is also a place where those east of the river do not have access to the same opportunities as those in different zip codes, those in certainly different wards, and certainly those in a different tax bracket. According to a recent report in Brookings' article on economic disparities, the median household income for white DC residents is about $141,650, whereas for black residents, uh, the median income is about $45,772, which impacts one's ability to access quality education, own a home, uh, affordable services needed during a healthcare emergency. This stark disparity is a result of centuries worth of policy decisions that center on the well-being and the progress of certain communities and lessen the ability of other communities to thrive. The ways in which historical underserved communities are being left behind and discriminated against does not just exist in the offline world. The increased use of algorithms certainly replicates and to some extent even perfects in the worst ways. The discrimination experienced by communities of color and low income, low income communities is such in such areas as housing, employment, healthcare, education, and even lending institutions. It's imperative that the protections that the Urban League fought for during the civil rights movement more than a century ago are upheld as technology continues to be developed and integrated into the lives of today as the rapid, as we're in a rapid pace. With the Stop Discrimination by Algorithms Act of 2021, discriminatory uses of protected traits in automatic decision-making about important life opportunities would be banned. If passed, this legislation would also require companies to audit, uh, to certainly engage in audit algorithms for discrimination practices. In their Algorithm results, uh, which the Greater Washington Bay certainly supports, we believe is necessary for two reasons. First, technology is not neutral because the people who create these systems are not neutral themselves, whether purposefully or not. Second, uh, companies self-regulating their own systems that impact important opportunities is not enough. Accountability is paramount. And where there are failures to protect and certainly find paths to correct harms experienced by communities of color and other marginalized groups, there must be opportunities for individuals to bring suit 
for these discriminatory harms, which is permitted under this bill. Far too long, our public policies have failed to keep up with the advancements in technology and automated decision-making systems. I urge this committee to be resolute in taking action to protect the citizens in certain communities that are most adversely impacted by these measures. I want to also thank uh, certainly uh, Attorney General Carver Singh for his leadership in transmitting this issue to the city council. And again, I strongly urge uh, the council members to support this important bill. Thank you for the opportunity to speak. Thank you very much. Uh, Daniel Jellins, welcome. Good afternoon, Chairman White and committee members. I am Daniel Jellins, a staff attorney at Georgetown University Law Center's Communications and Technology Law Clinic. I'm also a Ward 6 resident. I'm here to explain why SDAA is an imperative and how we have developed it from the ground up. I have seen tremendous interest in this bill among the clinic students, the DC community, and national organizations, regardless of their respective backgrounds. Why is this the case? I believe um, the answer is simple. The algorithmic discrimination creates harm that are greatly apparent. When I explain how biased data about a person's identity or purported identity can determine whether or not they receive a loan, everyone can see that such discrimination simply does not make sense. When we stop to think about why a bill to protect against algorithmic discrimination is needed, the answer is, it is merely another form of discrimination that should no longer go unchecked. With broad interest in supporting this bill, I'd like to make two quick points. First, I'd like to discuss the history of this bill. And second, I'd like to discuss why math washing, which is at the heart of algorithmic discrimination, creates societal harms. SDAA evolved from a desire to tackle the issue of data privacy for which there is no current federal protections. As we worked with the DCO8 uh, Office of Attorney General and the Center for Privacy and Technology, we realized an urgent need to hone in on combating the practice of algorithmic discrimination. Contrary to others that we have heard today, DC should not wait on others to act to protect its own citizens. We cannot set up temporary camp that turns into a permanent delay. It would only hurt DC residents. Algorithms use data about us all the time in, every, in our everyday lives to do mundane tasks. But these algorithmic decision-making systems have been used by some businesses to determine whether a person will learn about or even be eligible for important life opportunities such as education, employment, housing, public accommodations, lending, and insurance. Since these areas reach all DC residents, we decided to pursue FDAA uh, to present to prevent the prevalent issue of discrimination. Second, one of the fundamental problems behind algorithmic discrimination and what the SDAA is intended to prevent is the illusion that math washing creates. An algorithmic decision-making tool can conceal discrimination behind a veneer of quote unquote scientific and mathematical objectivity or com computational neutrality. That is false and so here's why. A black person may have lived in a particular zip code all their life due to historical redlining. If that person were to look for housing elsewhere, a landlord or bank could not outright refuse to approve a mortgage or rent to them based on race. However, they could use a tenant scoring tool or mortgage risk assessment tool. The tool takes into account the person's previous place of residence, but due to the legacy of redlining and other forms of historical oppression, the black applicant thus may receive a purportedly scientifically calculated poor score as a potential tenant or home, homeowner. We should be clear eyed about math washing's illusions. An algorithm is a product of their creators who may intentionally or unintentionally design it with their personal biases. An algorithm relies upon the use of input data, which may be inaccurate or unfair. And as you stated earlier, Councilmember White, garbage in, garbage out. These factors can, can, can transform an algorithm decision-making tool into a discriminator, and it leaves the typical consumer in the dark about missed life opportunities. The SDAA aims to help DC residents lift the veil from such discriminatory practices so that companies cannot hide behind the facade of math washing. Thank you for your considering this bill and inviting public testimony. I'll be happy to answer any of your questions. Thank you. 
Caitlin Peter. Hi, Council. Hi, Council Member White. Nice to see you. Um, my name is Catalin Peter. I am the Vice President of Government Affairs for the Apartment and Office Building Association, representing uh, housing providers, big, small, medium, um, across the board, as well as office buildings. We, I, I want to take a phrase that the prior panelist Dean said that this is a very fascinating piece of legislation, and even listening to Daniel, I, I think it's it. it there's so much to learn in this um, as far as the area of law. Uh, it, I would, while I can't say that my organization supports how this bill is written, I think that this is an area where everyone testifying or being a panelist today could really benefit from some type of symposium where we really understand exactly how these algorithms are derived and, and we can learn more about them and perhaps see exactly, you know, from a more narrow lens on um, how we can combat um, some of the problems that some of the people brought up today. I think when you do have an emerging area of law and you put together a piece of legislation um, at first bite, I think it's, it, it's very important to do in the sense that it gets the issue out there, it gets people thinking about it, it gets people talking about it. Um, I think we can use this as a jumping off point to really understand how some of these algorithms can potentially have positive benefits. Um, like our colleague from the healthcare providers uh, noted that sometimes you do want to make sure that you're, um, you're finding the right people. Um, perhaps it's to do uh, screenings or things like that from a health standpoint. Uh, and, and then seeing is, you know, is it somewhere where it goes wrong? So our, our association would welcome the opportunity to be a part of such a symposium, learn more about this. Um, I do think even something like a law review article on this and just as an emerging area of law would be really helpful. I think before we um, pass any sort of permanent legislation, it give, give the stakeholders an opportunity to really learn about where perhaps maybe it's going wrong and maybe where it's going right. Um, not maybe, where it is going wrong and where it's going right. Um, so we really have a full depth of understanding of what we're working with. I think we're all, frankly, I think that a number of people that you see on here, I think we're very interested in learning um, and understanding more, um, particularly how it relates to all of our industries, because we can all find a place where, where this comes into play. So I leave this by saying we don't we don't believe the way the legislation is currently written is something that um, we can support Technically, um, we do highly encourage um, the groups on here to be able to work with you, perhaps a work group, um, a summer session study on this topic, um, and be able to fully understand how it impacts um, each of our specific industries. Thank you, Councilmember White, for um, being up, being out front. Um, there's some very difficult issues that you all are dealing with, um, and we do, we do, uh, we are grateful that you were. Um, that you do take bold measures to examine these topics. Thank you so much, uh, John. John Pixakis. Hello, Mr. Chairman. Thank you for the opportunity to testify <clears throat> and members of the committee. My name is John Brett Sakis, and I'm president and CEO of the Maryland and DC Credit Union Association. We're a trade association representing over 125 credit unions in the District of Columbia in Maryland, and there are 2.2 million members. The District of Columbia is home to more than 30 credit unions and with almost 300,000 members. And many of the residents are also members of Maryland-based credit unions. While we support the general intent of the bill to reduce potential discrimination, we respectfully oppose the bill because of the negative effects it may have on credit union members in the district. The bill may hamper lending efforts in communities that are most vulnerable. The average credit union in the district is around $300 million in assets, which is a very small as far as financial institutions go. Just for comparative purposes and for general numbers, the average community bank is approximately $1 billion in assets. These credit unions serve communities of all sizes, often those in the most need of financial services. While the, <clears throat> while the district credit unions are individually likely to be under the threshold of a covered entity into the bill, the third party service providers may not be. Due to their small asset size, most credit unions cannot develop their own algorithmic underwriting or auto decisioning technology. And most credit unions use decisioning tools provided by a third party servicer, such as the Fannie Mae desktop underwriter. 
who do not disclose details for their proprietary algorithms and decision logic. It is not feasible or possible for each credit union to require any third party partner to certify compliance with the bill. For this reason, the bill would cause major issues with lending and extending credit for consumers in the district by the very institutions that are known for being heavily focused on consumer protection. If third party servicers find the burden of compliance too great, a credit union on the ground doing the work for its members may suffer. In closing, Credit unions are under constant supervision and oversight by local federal agencies, bureaus, to ensure that they comply with complex and extensive list of regulatory and legal requirements. For these reasons, we respectfully oppose the bill. Thank you very much. Carl Sabo, welcome. Yes, uh, Council Member White, members of the committee, thank you for having me. My name is Carl Zabo. I'm Vice President and General Counsel of NetChoice. I'm also a professor at George Mason Antonin Scalia Law School. Uh, let's start by answering the question that you just asked, Council Member White, which kind of elucidates how this bill is way out ahead of the fundamental question of what are we trying to do here? You asked a very simple question. Have there been any lawsuits on the use of AI for discrimination? Well, I can name two already. Uh, in May, EEOC uh, was able to file a lawsuit against a group called iTutor Group. And just this past June, the Department of Justice brought an algorithm-based lawsuit in violation of the Federal Housing Act. So already there is evidence of this law being applied, existing law being applied, anti-discrimination law being applied to algorithms. So very simple question. You asked some of the experts, supporting this bill and they didn't have an answer. That shows that this bill needs a big thorough discussion session, section. Second, uh, the small business exemption doesn't work as just mentioned because any small business is going to use a larger service provider. That larger ser service provider is then going to trickle down liability to the small business. Now, turning to the legislation itself, um, it is both unnecessary and is a harmful unintended consequences. So unnecessary. As I just mentioned, there are already lawsuits being brought today against the use of AI, two I just mentioned. And to quote the CFPB director, Rohit Chopra, not exactly a raging pro-business guy. He said, companies are not absolved of their legal responsibilities when they let a black box model make lending decisions. Crystal clear from the head of the CFPB that if you use an AI to engage in unlawful discrimination, it's still unlawful. Uh, let's talk about some of the harms, right? So on line 19, uh, we have, it applies to discrimination based on class of individuals. What does this mean? Let's look at access to education. It makes it harder for schools to reach potential students. Uh, think about scholarships for minorities, they're illegal because while the uh, minority receiving the ad for the scholarship is benefited, the one who doesn't receive the ad is disenfranchised. Let's use another example. Efforts to increase minority population uh, results in discrimination. We've already seen this with the Asian American suits against schools like Harvard. Now there is an exemption in there against uh, legally approved affirmative action programs, but that's not the type that we see with education systems. Let's use another example. Offers of lower insurance for good drivers. Just because you haven't had an accident in a while, you may get lower insurance, not based on race, religion, but that is a class of individuals right there good drivers, people with fewer accidents. Let's look at another example, daycares that make offers to families with children. That's a class of individuals as opposed to showing offers to families without children. And finally, uh, the AARP sending discounts for healthcare to those over 70. That is disenfranchising those of age 69, 68, 67. So you can see how the definitions here are poorly written. And of course, these are absurd examples that likely AG Racine would never bring. But you add in a private right of action with statutory damages, mm -hmm. and we know how that game plays out. So they will walk up to these businesses, they will walk up to the ARP, and they will say, we will either sue you for millions and millions of dollars, or you can settle right now. Second thing on transparency, we've heard a lot about talking about transparency, showing the system. Why would that be hard? Why would that be bad? Well, the bad actors are constantly trying to game the system. We know this. 
that is what uh, trying to search engine optimization is all about. People constantly trying to get their stuff to the top, trying to beat the system. And essentially the transparency requirements are telling the bad actors all the ways to get around. It's like telling the bank robber how to break into the bank. Now, if you do want transparency, you can do that through discovery requests as part of litigation. So anyone, anywhere who has been harmed or thinks they've been harmed by an AI can bring a suit today under existing law. They can, in those suits, engage in discovery. And in that discovery, they will see if the AI system is or is not acting illegally, as we've already seen in the two prior suits I cited. Um, I will finally wrap up with the fundamental legal problems with this law. And it, first of all, there are critical terms used with no definitions. Let's use the word algorithm. Used multiple times, this is all about algorithm discrimination. We don't define what the heck is an algorithm. There's no definition of AI. So this law is an important conversation starter, but it's certainly not something that is at all ready for prime time. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Rebecca Strauss. Thanks. I'm testifying in the hopes that the DC Council delay moving forward with the Algorithms Act as written. I am the Director of Economic Initiatives at the Federal City Council, which is a business civic organization whose 240 members are some of the district's most civically engaged CEO level leaders. Our purpose is to work towards making the district a better place for all its residents. Let me be clear that the Federal City Council believes forcefully in removing any and all discriminatory business practices that put protected classes and minority groups at a disadvantage. But the Algorithms Act could end up casting its net too broad, missing too true discrimination, while burdening far too many businesses with onerous and expensive reporting requirements. The act has the best of intentions, but fails to spear the true problem, while at the same time creating gargantuan and costly new regulatory problems. This 15 page act is woefully vague on the very fine details of what a discriminatory algorithm looks like. The European Union has spent many years and thousands of pages of text trying to tease out how to monitor, police and enforce potentially discriminatory artificial intelligence algorithms. They still haven't settled on something that works well. Major US research institutions are now digging into the hard work of figuring out how to do this. The DC council should wait until there is a clear consensus among experts. The district and its businesses should not have not to be happen. a guinea pig for untested approaches. The act's audit requirement on covered entities will force DC businesses to bear the burden of relying upon third party auditors, a business practice that is currently unregulated and does not have a recognized standard for judging whether data or an algorithm are discriminatory. That judgment has a lot to do with understanding the context of how data is collected, analyzed, and then used. The danger is that these third-party auditors will not fully understand the context and make faulty assessments about whether something is discriminatory or not. The reporting requirements are such that a vast swath of the DC economy would have to hire auditors. Many could be swept up in needless battles over correct data, data use and practices. This act is missing its target. The attorney general already has the authority to go after discriminatory practices. The burden should not be on all DC businesses to report every year to prove their innocence and then do the same with every vendor they hire. We support going after discriminatory de decisions that harm protected classes but, classes, but there must be a better way to do it. We urge the council to put more time into studying better options before putting the Algorithms Act to a vote. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, and finally, for this panel, Edwin Iggy. Thank you, sir. Uh, my name is Ed Iggy. I am Vice President for Government Affairs and Workforce Development at the National Retail Federation. The NRF appreciates the opportunity to testify today. We are the world's largest retail federal, excuse me, retail trade association. We are based here in Washington, D.C. In D.C., 14% of jobs are supported by the retail industry. 84,000 people in the district are directly employed by retail. At a time when retailers nationwide, and especially those here in the district, are still recovering from the pandemic, the bill we're discussing today would stifle job creation and economic development. Because, because of the large volume of an, annual applications my members receive, retailers increasingly have used this software to assist with hiring and promotion decisions. These tools, when properly designed and deployed, have the capacity to greatly assist employers in making smart, efficient decisions to add talent to their workforce. 
They also benefit candidates by matching their skills to open jobs. The legislation is currently written, contain, contains, as has previously mentioned, several undefined and vague terms that make com compliance with this statute difficult, if not impossible, but certainly exceedingly bur burdensome. I want to point out one particular problem, which I think is probably most significant. The bill states that an algorithm that is, quote, used in whole or in significant part, end quote, to make an algorithmic eligibility determination assumes that the employer or the algorithm, it's, the algorithm itself is somehow privy, privy, privy to detailed information about these applicants. For DC employers to avoid, quote, any practice that has the effect or consequence of violating this act, they would need to affirmatively ask applicants to provide detailed information that would otherwise not be required. In fact, DC employers cannot and will not <laughs> legally ask these questions. It is, for instance, broadly unlawful to request an applicant's date of birth. You run afoul of the Age Discrimination and Employment Act. Similarly, the bill requires a disparation, disparate impact analysis based on categories about which an employer would never ask applicants. We would never ask applicants their sexual orientation, their familiar status, their genetic information, their source of income or dis disability. Why would we know these things? It would be difficult or impossible to conduct a disparate impact analysis based on these categories without requiring that candidates disclose this sensitive personal information. Even for those federal contractors who as part of their affirmative action program must, um, must inquire about these things, candidates have to voluntarily self-identify their gender and race. Such employers generally do not collect information about candidates' religion, sexual orientation, familiar status, genetic information, source of income, or disability. The bill would require covered entities as it to, to, as an example of their personal information to include biometric data. The bill again does not define what biometric data is. Instead, the bill states the phrase biometric data includes quote, voice signatures, facial geometry, fingerprints, and iris scans. Are pic pictures, photographs, recorded videos of an, in of an individual considered biometric data? The bill requires DC employers to provide an adverse action dis disclosure that should, that should include the, quote, factors the determination dependent on. The bill states that employers should allow the individual subject to the adverse act action with the opportunity to, to, quote, submit corrections to that information. But this doesn't make any sense in the employment context. If the algorithm determines that someone applying for a legal position is not a lawyer, how does that person correct that information? There are no possible corrections that the candidate could not provide that would alter an, or an adverse action income, outcome. This, this bill requires a five-year audit trail. This, this requirement is highly burdensome and require employers to hold personnel data longer than EEOC requires. In sum, while we applaud the purpose of preventing discrimination through algorithmic, algorithmic bias, we believe that the law as written should not be passed. Based on the burden that the law would impose, the vagueness that permit that permeates many of these terms, and the likelihood for, of abuse, I thank the council. Uh, thanks so much to to this panel. Um, some uh, some support for this bill in this panel. Uh, a good amount of uh, criticism or critiques of, about the bill is is written. Um, there, there's quite a lot written about uh, algorithmic discrimination. I, I come from a, a starting point that algorithmic discrimination exists. Does, does anybody on this panel have an opposing view on that? Can you define the term? Um, do, 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 we, do we agree on the term discrimination? Can we, we, or do we need to like, do we need to have that discussion? So do, I, the purpose of an algorithm is to separate one thing from another. So uh, no, but I, I want to ask Ed: but, Are you are you are you are you saying that, that we don't have enough clarity in this conversation of the concept of algorithmic discrimination to agree or disagree on whether or not it exists? Again, to to the professor's point, this is something that EOC has been handling for for months, if not years. I mean, EOC is taking a judicious, slow approach to this issue. How would um, you define algorithm, uh, Mr. Again, a, Again, you, so, just you don't don't not about the bill or, or even me. How would you define algorithm? I would define algorithm again. I would 
it's it's your piece of legislation. You need to define it in as you write it into law. My we flush it out in hearings. That, so that's why I'm having a conversation with you. You said we need an input. I'm, I'm trying to get input. All right. So what I would say is, yeah, your algorithm. All the algorithm does is separate one class from another class. It it could be based on anything. And the idea that they're in, that these are inherently problematic. It, it, you know, again, they can be used as the professor articulated for any number of, of areas. Um, and again, EOC is looking at this judiciously. Um, they've they under both Republican and Democratic leadership uh, have said that these that these tools can be used properly. Um, your bill would go far too far in tr pros broadly proscribing or at least heavily regulating these tools uh, based on pure assumptions and vague, vague terms. Well, I think we're, I'm trying to get to the place that, that you're getting to, but I'm trying to make sure we're walking there together. I don't have a bill. The bill is before my committee, so I'm having a hearing to make sure we get public input. Um, I'm trying to get your input, but as a starting point, I'm just trying to figure out if we agree uh, as a starting point that algorithmic discrimination exists. Yes. Okay. Let's assume we do, okay? Um my, 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 my next belief is that where there's discrimination, we should do something. Is there anybody who has a different sort of understanding? If where we find discrimination, we should do something. That's my conclusion. Does anybody have a different conclusion on, on that point? So, so once again, we're, we're using the term discrimination kind of cavalierly. Uh, my, my child picking out which book to read at night is a very discriminating behavior. Discriminating is simply making one choice over another, which is the purpose of an algorithm. An algorithm helps us figure out, is, it, is the answer 10 or 12 to 10 plus two? That's an algorithm, that's algorithmic discrimination. Okay, what be, I think we're really okay. talking about is unlawful racial discrimination. That's an aspect of it. So let's, let's stay there then. Uh, racial discrimination. Um, all right. Uh, so it, if racial discrimination exists uh, in a setting, we should do something to address it. Do, do we agree on that premise? Or do we disagree? Does anybody disagree? I I did, so I, I think the first question is, what's the harm we're trying to prevent? And let's work backwards from that. If the, if right. the harm is use of race to, in, to prevent uh, housing access. But let's use that as a starting point. Um, no, no, no. I, I want to say broad about racial discrimination because I, I used an example earlier that is not illegal, but it impacts my family very significantly, which is I have little black girls and I want them to see uh, healthy images of black girls and black families on TV. But I'm having a very difficult time as a parent overcoming the algorithms. There's nothing to my knowledge illegal there, but it does matter. So that's why I'm, I'm staying broad. I'm not just talking about illegal discrimination because I don't think we're there yet. What I'm asking is, should we do something about racial discrimination? It, does anybody disagree? I totally agree, but Councilman White, let me jump in at this point and say to you, I, I appreciate the example that you used earlier regarding your family. What it really says to me, and I think that's what you are you know, certainly articulating here as well, is that to some extent, perhaps the industry is tone deaf. That's, you know, that's kind of what's going on. I mean, it's not illegal, but clearly they're tone deaf that you can't find a channel that you see diversity in terms of your kids. So that's a tone deaf issue. It does flag, in fact, a blind spot. And that's part of the issue here as well. Um, I, I do think that there, there's a blind spot, and I think it matters more than, than, than some folks appreciate. Um, but what I'm trying to get to is, if racial discrimination, just one category of discrimination, uh, as an example, racial discrimination in algorithms exists, I believe we should do something. Then the question is, what do we do and when do we do it? Um, now, the primary critiques I've heard from this panel is we're moving too quickly and this bill needs work. So what I'm trying to get to is, what do you recommend, Mr. Sabo, Mr. Iggy, Mr. Bretsakis, what do you recommend is the right timeline for 
developing this bill, for getting specific recommendations on this bill to the committee? What would be an ideal timeline? So the, the idea of creating a timeline is predicated on first identifying what's the harm we're trying to address. So in the example, council member, if you are not being served and your children are not being served uh, movies and videos of people of color, and suddenly you want the algorithm to increase that, that would be a form of racial discrimination at the end of the day, because now it's selecting movies and content for you based on race. That's a positive outcome that you want, but that is racial discrimination in kind of the overarching category we're trying to identify. I think one of the real dangers I see here, especially with this legislation right now, is simply having somebody like the attorney general suggest that discrimination of housing by race, but using an algorithm is legal today, empowers bad actors to use that as a defense at trial because they can say, oh, I, I didn't engage in criminal activity. The AG of DC actually has a bill to make it illegal, which suggests that today it is not illegal. Now I would say any action that is illegal is illegal, regardless of the medium that you use to use it. And that's what we're talking about here. So to create a timeline, we need to identify what are the specific harms we are trying to address. And then we can figure out what a win condition is on that. If we're trying to assume that passing a law today would eliminate racism, which would be fantastic if that were possible, I think you know, we, we, we should fully support it. But this bill is kind of, it needs to figure out what is it trying to do? And if it's trying to make crystal clear that the use of AI for unlawful discrimination, that's one thing. But this is a much broader bill and we need to figure out what we're trying to do with it. Uh, Mr. Hunter, did you, did you want to add something to, to yeah. this? I, 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 I totally hear you. Hey, discrimination is real. There's no question that discrimination exists. Thank discrimination, you. discrimination exists in algorithms, right? We're subject to it in credit. Um, it, it happens. We know that. Um, and this is an area that needs to be explored, and, uh, but it needs to be done carefully. And you asked about a timeline, Councilman. I think that you asked about best practices. This is the kind of area that would really lend itself to consideration uh, by a group by the National Council of uh, State Legislatures, a, a working group, um, because it impacts uh, so many people. And, and again, it's, it's, it's emerging. Nobody, nobody has the, the right answers. So um, I think the timeline is, is long for us to do something on this. And I think we should move very carefully. Uh, Mr. Uh, Jellis, did you, you, you want to add something? Yeah, that's, uh, thank you, council member. Um, I guess I wanted to sort of recenter this a little bit about the people. I feel as if um, it would be nice um, to say, as you've said, discrimination is real. And let's talk about what this bill is trying to protect against. It's about white people getting ads for some jobs and black people getting ads for others, right? It's about the opaque hiring algorithms that discriminate against people with disabilities. And I think it is um, telling um, that when you asked about a timeline, there was no real answer given. I mean, this bill has been out for almost a year. Um, if they, if we welcome um, sort of discussions to clarify and to talk about sort of issues. But again, this bill has been out for a year. Um, and I, we, as I've said, uh, and I think you've said, right, the problem exists, discrimination is happening now, um, and we shouldn't um, wait uh, for, there are studies, there are law review articles about algorithmic discrimination. If they are uncertain um, about it, there are ways in which we can um, educate ourselves and really get a good um, grasp of the uh, of the topic. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I'm a bit over time. Let me turn to uh, my colleagues. I believe Councilmember Pinto uh, is is with us. Councilmember Pinto. Here we go. Can you hear me? Yes, and see you. Welcome. Great. Thank you. Thank you, 
Chairman Wyden, thank you to all of these panelists um, for sharing your perspective. I want to drill down on this vendor issue of even if there's an exemption for small businesses, how attenuated we really get when we um, have an all out ban. And maybe I can start with you, Mr. Hunter, about some of your concerns about uh, being liable really for all of the activities that your vendors may be responsible for. Yes, thank you, council member. Um, you know, liability is the critical issue of this legislation. Uh, in fact, the manner in which it's written, um, it, that's what it benefits, lawyers. Uh, the lawyers who will be defending these cases and the lawyers who will be prosecuting these cases. Uh, small businesses would just be caught up in the middle because of the re our reliance on the vendors who provide these services. Uh, the reality of the matter is we would be subject to, uh, for the adverse action of this vendor, and even if it's unintentional, right? Um, you know, again, these are very serious issues. They need to be addressed, but they need to be done in a, in a, in a much more systematic manner. Um, not only housing providers, other small businesses uh, could be impacted by this. Uh, we're more concerned about the impact on the district as a whole, even, even as a, it relates to our individual industry. Thank you. Um, and Mr. Sabo, you started to touch on this about um, some of the other potentially positive benefits of using preferences that can be associated with algorithms. I'm wondering if you or others can talk about kind of from a customer service perspective, um, some of the things that district consumers have maybe come to rely upon uh, as a result of more specific targeted information due to algorithms. So thank you for the, the question. Let, let's use a simple example. Let's presume there's a school, new school opening, a new charter school opening in your district. And you wanna send a customized email to families in your district with children from your, your list of uh, potential voters. You would probably use a third party to do the, the processing of that data just because it doesn't make sense for you to have servers in your background. Well, that would be illegal under this law because you are now giving preference to the families on your list with children of an educational opportunity of that new charter school. But that's a great thing letting people, families know about new charter school opportunities. Another example would be uh, somebody taking out an ad, uh, Georgetown University, trying to better identify low income and underprivileged individuals and encourage them to apply to school. That would be illegal under this law because they are giving them preferential treatment. They are discriminating in their favor to show them those opportunities to the disadvantage of those of privileged families. So that's the thing. It, it, we need to identify what is the harm we're trying to do to solve before we start going after the system itself. And Discrimination is, you know, racial discrimination is horrible. I think we can all agree on that. We need to get rid of it. But there's a lot of really good things that will be annihilated under this approach. And if we are willing to throw away all those incredible goods, like helping underserved communities learn of educational opportunities, then we need to address it. I think going into the cart before the horse part, something as simple as affirmative action at universities. We need to have a conversation with the schools, the charter schools, the universities, how this would impact their recruitment process. And I think until we do any of this, uh, we, we really need to take a real pause and have a robust discussion without the threat of legislation in front of us. Thank you. Does anyone else have any other thoughts on that piece about the... I don't want to say unanticipated consequences because they might be anticipated, but the uh, council member, you should also know this legislation is written arguably was subject to district to liability. You mean the district government for our yeah. own? Yeah. The District of Columbia's government could arguably be subject to liability under, under this legislation as written. Well, that wouldn't be the first time that, that has happened. <laughs> yeah needs to be responsible for our own activity as well. Um, yeah, I, I would jump in and make one other point. Sure. And this is just really, quite frankly, putting on my, my civil rights hat. Um, 
I think the point was made earlier that, you know, this has certainly been in the domain in terms of having comment on it, and you've been looking at it almost a year. The clock is still running. Uh, too many times for folks of color, uh, we're asked to continue to wait, okay? That's, you know, I mean, that's how this resonates with me. Once again, here we are, asked as we sit around the table to wait. And the waiting for me is, you know, all the folks that are falling through the cracks on this. So I don't know the timeline. I'm not going to pine on the timeline. But I will say we do need to set a timeline and let's just get this done. I know there's going to be a change in guard at the end of the year. I would love to see something done before then. <laughs> I, I would just say, Council Member, I just this this is so broad that it would snare any employer, even if their algorithms do nothing more than scan, scan the applicant's application. I mean, again, it, this is the broadness of these bills, this bill, the vagueness of these terms is really is really what we have concerns concerns about. Again, we have 84,000 folks who in the district who we directly employ in the retail industry. Um, the shops and restaurants, I'm, you know, I'm right here in city center. They're coming back after the pandemic. This is an, a massive amount of liability to put on their shoulders just at the time that, you know, they need customers, they need employees, and they need, they don't, they do not need to, to the professor's point earlier, trial lawyers knocking on their door day and night, suggesting that under this new private right of action, we're willing to shut down your business over an algorithm you use to determine anything. Um, so, you know, while I take while I take the arguments, look, you know, th this is something and racial racial discrimination is bad. Therefore, we have to do something. This is something we should do this something. You know, I, I would just caution the, the council to be very judicious in how you in how you go about this, regulating the, this our, our industry. OK, and I'm not sure if Ms. Strauss is still here from the Federal City Council. Um, but to that point, and uh, others may want to speak to this of it's been kind of touched upon a little bit on this panel of making sure that we're maintaining our competitive abilities within the region as businesses are considering locating here or considering a change of plans for those who are here. Um, can anyone speak to other jurisdictions um, that have promulgated similar rules or thinking about similar rules uh, like in California? Can anyone speak to that? Council member, uh, you're making a very important point as it relates to the potential impact of this legislation um, as on the district's competitiveness to do business. And I'm sure there are other panelists who are gonna to speak to that to a great issue, but it is a very legitimate concern. Um, too often we find um, some members, some elected officials who are proposing measures where the district is the first to do it in the country. And that's one thing. This measure would be, would be the first in the world to do it. And that's too far. Um, uh, this does impose serious concerns, significant concerns for small and large businesses alike on the potential exposure. And it also, another impact for small businesses is the potential to lose these service providers. Um, you've heard testimony that some of the service providers said under this, the threat of litigation or liability of this legislation, they just couldn't do business in the District of Columbia. Um, so this could be very disruptive um, um, in many, many ways. Uh, council member. Uh, sorry, uh, go ahead. I didn't mean to interrupt. No, I, I saw you trying to participate. Go ahead. Uh, yes, uh, thank you. I just guess wanted to be a little more like concrete about what this who this bill covers. Right, it starts at a fifteen million in revenue, and then it's also about possessing or controlling information of twenty five thousand residents or data. Right, so it's not as if we haven't uh, or the bill hasn't considered sort of um, it, it or it's not sweeping in the let's say the restaurant that's trying to hire five people, right? And we're asked, we're trying to, we tried to set some sort of um, ceiling, I guess. And then um, I guess the second point I was trying to uh, make is that, I mean, think we wouldn't let um, someone hire a bouncer to turn away marginalized people from the restaurants or banks, right? So why would we let them do it through a computer? Um, and I think that is a uh, um, imperative point to make. And I think we, are we lose the sort of the people centeredness of what we're trying to do here. Um, and uh, so just wanted to sort of, again, think about and think about the sort of people 
um, that we're trying to sort of protect against these sorts of discriminate, discriminatory tools. Uh, Council member, can I make one quick clarification putting on my professor hat? On page six, line 14, it's an or for who's included. Yeah. So if you are any one of them, you are covered, not if you are all of them, you are covered. That's an important distinction that I do not want to be lost. The small business ex exemption is, is 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 so narrow as to be unworkable. Yeah. Okay. Well, I'm out of time. Thank you all very much. And I hope that in the coming months, we can work together to remember the kind of initial impetus for this mission to make sure that we, as a city, are not allowing discriminatory actions to happen, even if they are in effect and not by design. Um, and also do so in a way that is not so overly broad as I think that this current draft is. Um, so we'll keep working with you all on that. Thank you, Chairman White. Thank you, ma'am. Uh, thank you, Council Member Pinto. Thank you very much to this panel. Uh, we will move to our next panel of public witnesses, Tom Folks, Sarah Guggen. Uh, Gohigan, uh, Katharina Kopp, Doyle Mitchell, Peter Romer Friedman, Bennett Borden, Annette Tymon, and Will Mary Escoto. Tom, folks, welcome. You can begin your testimony when you're ready. Thank you. Uh, thank you, uh, Chairman. Uh, good afternoon, uh, Chairman White, members of the committee. My name is Tom Folks. I serve as the Senior Director of State Advocacy for BSA, the Software Alliance. On behalf of our member companies, thank you for allowing me the opportunity to share uh, our perspective on General Racine's Stop Discrimination by Algorithms Act. Uh, just to uh, reset from our earlier panel, uh, just want to mention uh, to, the, to the Chairman and, and uh, the Council, Member Pinto as well. Um, on behalf of BSA and our members, I agree that bias exists. I agree that discrimination exists and that as a society, uh, we should work to address this. Uh, BSA members are enterprise software companies that create business to business technologies that help other businesses innovate and grow, including cloud storage services, uh, customer relationship management, human resource management, and other collaboration software tools. These companies are on the leading edge of providing businesses in every sector of the economy with trusted tools, including artificial intelligence. As leaders in the development of enterprise AI, BSA members have unique insights into the technology's tremendous potential to spur digital transformation and the policies that can best support the responsible use of AI. BSA and our, member and our members support the general intent and purpose of the Stop Discrimination by Algorithm Act, as we fundamentally agree that the use of high-risk AI should be subject to safeguards. While the adoption of AI can unquestionably be a force for good, we also recognize the significant risks to society if this technology is not developed and deployed responsibly. This is an area of particular focus for BSA and our member companies over the last several years, including the June 2021 release of BSA's detailed framework that sets forth a risk management approach, approach for confronting concerns about bias. This document, it's entitled Confronting Bias, BSA's Framework to Build Trust in AI, is available uh, at our website at bsa.org. In addition, BSA has been engaged with elected leadership throughout the U.S. and Europe, calling on Congress and the EU to enact legislation to require private sector companies to perform impact assessments on high-risk use of AI technology. In addition, BSA's President and CEO, Victoria Espinel, was recently appointed to President Biden's National Artificial Intelligence Advisory Committee. We are also doing work uh, with the uh, other members of the panels that have mentioned NIST. We're also doing work uh, on that framework as well. Regarding specifically the Stop, uh, Stop Discrimination and Algorithm by Algorithm Act, BSA strongly agrees that when AI is used in ways that could adversely impact civil rights or access to important life opportunities, 
the public should be assured that such systems have been thoroughly vetted to identify and mitigate risks associated with unintended bias. However, as currently drafted, uh, we have a number of concerns with the legislative language. For example, the bill appears to require third-party audits of AI systems, even though there are no existing standards or professional accreditors for such audits, in contrast to other fields like privacy and cybersecurity. In addition, the bill contains expansive reporting requirements that could require companies to disclose large amounts of data, even though such disclosures may create significant security and privacy risks. Moreover, the bill uses several broad or undefined terms that can create uncertainty about how it would apply. So due to the importance and complexity of this legislation, BSA and its members strongly encourage members of the committee to engage directly with a broad range of stakeholders, including members of the technology sector that create and deploy AI systems, as you consider regulating the use of AI by businesses operating in the District of Columbia. So thank you again for the opportunity to share our perspective uh, on this important policy issue. We look forward to continuing the conversation and serving as a resource uh, to you and to other members of the council. Uh, and I'd also be happy to uh, to talk to earlier questions about other jurisdictions as um, uh, we have been wandering those and engaging on those closely over the last several years. Thank you. Thanks so much. Uh, Sarah Gogian. Hi, it's Sarah Gagan. Gagan. Um, hello, Chairperson White and members of the committee. My name is Sarah Gagan, and I am counsel at the Electronic Privacy Information Center, or EPIC, on the consumer privacy team. And I'm a proud resident of DC, living in Ward 6. I speak today in strong support of the Stop Discrimination by Algorithms Act. Over the years, we at EPIC have flagged many of the issues that this bill addresses. We have taken, taken action against companies including Airbnb, HireVue, and online proctoring companies for their unfair and deceptive use of algorithms. My colleague Ben Winters from our AI and Human Rights Project spoke earlier today to discuss algorithmic transparency and accountability. I speak today to explain how this bill protects consumers in the district. This bill will have a positive impact on housing determinations by platforms like Airbnb. Airbnb makes algorithmic determinations about renters without the notice and other protections required by this bill and relies on data that can act as proxies for protected characteristics like race. In 2020, Epic filed a complaint with the FTC against Airbnb for its use of such algorithms to determine a potential client's trustworthiness. Just last month, Epic highlighted another algorithmic sorting tool used by Airbnb, so-called anti-party technology, which discriminates against would-be renters on the basis of geography, age, and other undisclosed factors. Similarly, we filed a complaint with the DC Attorney General in late 2020 against the five largest test proctoring companies to protect students in the district who are subject to their unfair, unproven, and opaque algorithms, which purported to determine a student's likelihood of cheating. However, independent third-party testing of those systems proved that the systems rarely, if ever, caught any cheating student. Other reports show that students of color students with disabilities, and gender non-conforming students were falsely flagged at disproportionately higher rates. The SDAA will improve these systems by requiring independent third-party audits to determine any discriminatory patterns in their algorithms. Finally, I would like to speak about how important the audit requirements and disclosure requirements are to, protect, to protecting consumers in the district. In 2019, Epic filed a complaint against HireVue with the FTC. HireVue is a company that provides pre-employment screening services on behalf of employers to evaluate potential job candidates. HireVue uses biometric analysis and algorithms to create a score of each candidate's employability. Unsurprisingly, the opaque software collects way too much personal information and like all algorithms based on biometric analysis, presents a significant risk of disparate impact. Importantly, HireVue had claimed that an independent audit determined that the, its software was free from bias, but HireVue significantly overstated the findings of the audit, in part because it did not need to report the audit's findings to any regulatory body. The SDAA will help prevent such harmful commercial practices, 
with its strong audit disclosure requirements. This act will ensure that companies who use algorithmic decision-making comply with notice requirements, perform actual audits, and disclose reports about the audits to the Office of the Attorney General to protect renters and people from these types of discriminatory and unfair algorithms. These audits will help prevent certain, certain characteristics such as race, gender identity or expression, sexual orientation, religion, familial status, national origin, and disability from being used to discriminate against individuals. Thank you for the opportunity to speak today and for working on this important legislation to protect consumers in the district. Thank you so much, uh, Katharina Kopp. Yes, thank you, Chairperson White and committee members. My name is Katharina Kopp. I'm a privacy and data justice advocate and the deputy director of the Center for Digital Democracy. CDD is a DC-based nonprofit public interest advocacy organization with 20-year track record of advancing digital rights, consumer protection, and privacy. I'm also a proud Ward 3 resident and appreciate the opportunity to testify here today. I am testifying in support of Stop Discrimination by Algorithms Act of 2021 and urge the committee and DC Council to pass this legislation. I concur with the previous speakers who spoke in support of the bill. I would like to focus my time today on one particular aspect of the bill, the importance of holding service providers accountable for algorithmic discrimination. So what is a service provider? The, the bill defines service providers as entities that perform algorithmic eligibility de determinations or algorithmic information availability determinations on behalf of another entity. Such an entity could be a landlord, an employer, a school, or a financial institution. Importantly, it would also cover big tech companies like Meta, formerly known as Facebook. Research shows that Facebook was using an algorithm to make determinations as to which Facebook user received housing advertisements based upon certain protected characteristics. This produced discriminatory results. Facebook acted as a service provider to advertisers, in this case, landlords. Another example of the service provider is Leasing Desk. Leasing Desk uses AI to generate a tenant score based on credit information, criminal records, and a host of other data inputs. Leasing Desk acts as a service provider to landlords. And similarly, Good Hire runs background checks on job candidates and acts as a service provider for employers. What makes these company service providers is that they sell their software and screening services to companies, let's call them the first parties. First parties rely on service providers to inform their eligibility determinations. Effective legislation to address algorithmic discrimination must address both the first party and also the third party service providers. And why? Well, service providers are in a unique position to determine whether their own algorithmic software products are exhibiting discriminatory bias and to adjust their inner workings if needed. First party covered entities of all kinds look to service providers precisely to provide this capability and expertise. Holding service providers accountable is more effective, it's a more effective course of action than focusing on their customers alone. Placing liability on service providers ensures they are held to account for the harmful consequences that can flow from their products and services. We know that self-regulation and market forces do not work in stemming the tide of algorithmic discrimination. Relying on contractual ties between a first party and the service provider is also not enough. Moreover, service providers' discriminatory practices may risk affecting so many individuals downstream that it is only common sense to hold them accountable given their risk profile. Holding service providers accountable under the act also means that they must proactively counter potential discrimination in their systems, which is going to help detect issues early and avert harm. Um, so to sum up, the Center for Digital Democracy supports the SDAA because it holds not only first parties, but also service providers accountable when it comes to algorithmic discrimination. This is an effective and efficient way to regulate this space. Thank you for considering this bill and inviting public testimony. I believe that the bill is extremely important for addressing growing social inequities and the legacy of slavery and racism. I would be happy to answer any questions. Thank you. Thank you so much. I believe uh, Dora Mitchell had to depart. I'll confirm. Peter Romer Friedman. Welcome. 
Uh, thank you, Chairman. Uh, my name is Peter Romer Friedman. I'm a civil rights lawyer at Gupta Wessler, which is a public interest law firm here in DC. I previously worked as Senator Kennedy's Labor Council on the Senate Labor Committee. Really appreciate the opportunity to speak today in favor of the Stop Discrimination by Algorithms Act. Algorithms are everywhere today in our society, but especially in the area of economic opportunity. Recent history shows that companies have readily used algorithms and technologies that discriminate based on protected statuses, especially in advertising things like jobs, housing, credit, insurance, and educational opportunities, the very areas that this bill aims to address. Now, I've represented real people who have been harmed by real algorithmic discrimination. In 2017, through an investigation that my clients and I did, we identified hundreds of employers who were advertising jobs on Facebook in the DMV area, and they were excluding women and older people from ever receiving their job ads. I represented a number of workers uh, to challenge this activity. They had been looking for work, including in DC, but were largely being excluded from receiving these job ads and it made their, uh, because of their age or their gender, and it made their job search harder. We filed dozens of charges with the EEOC's Washington field office and as a result, the EOC declared that it's, that it's unlawful under federal law to deny ads to people because of their gender or age for jobs. Now, in some cases, these companies knew exactly what they were doing. But I would say that in most cases, the companies were engaged in these practices, but their leadership was generally unaware that this was happening. Very few companies have said that they need to engage in this kind of uh, discrimination. But it's instructive that so many companies were still engaged in this crude form of digital bias, and their leaders didn't even know it which tells me that we have to address this problem. In 2018, we also found that a large number of property management companies in the DMV area were denying their job, their, their housing ads to people older than 50. My client, Neita Opio Tenione, is one of those people. She's a 50, 56 year old woman, a DCPS employee, and has lived in DC for decades. In 2018, 19, she was looking for an apartment and she was searching for housing, but she was also using Facebook. She wasn't getting any ads on Facebook for housing, and she found it so difficult to find suitable, affordable housing, she gave up her search for a new apartment. But she later found out that some of the largest property management companies in this area and in the nation were denying their housing ads to all people older than 50, companies like Bazudo, JBG Smith, and Kettler. Now, my client filed a lawsuit under the DC Human Rights Act. That case is still pending. I would note in response to some prior panelists that the housing companies and many of the DC based law firms um, that represent corporations have defended the right of companies to deny housing ads as well as other kinds of uh, job, job ads, credit ads to DC residents based on protected statuses, including race. So in their view, the DC Human Rights Act does not prohibit this form of digital discrimination in housing. And that makes it even more important to adopt a strong law to adjust, address that issue. Now, prior litigation involving Facebook advertising led Facebook uh, to, to abandon and prohibit job, housing, credit advertising, where you can target the ads based on protected statuses like race, gender, age, and a lot, a, a lot of other platforms like Google and Twitter have followed suit. But there are, some, there are still some significant problems when it comes to digital advertising that need to be addressed. For example, when you get beyond job, housing, and credit advertising, there's still explicit targeting of other uh, ads, uh, for example, for insurance and education, where you can exclude all women or, or all older people from receiving those advertisements. And there's also al algorithmic discrimination and delivery, as some have mentioned before, as the DOJ explained in its lawsuit against Facebook, and as academic research has confirmed, um, the people who actually receive the ads on Facebook are determined by Facebook, not just the advertisers, and that often results in a disproportionate effect of, of, of people of color or older people or women being excluded from receiving those ads. The Stop Discrimination by Algorithms Act would address this problem uh, and stop it in its tracks. It would ensure also that consumers and workers receive notice when, when they lose out on opportunities because of algorithms. Right now, people are in the dark when it comes to learning about why they're denied opportunities. And that's the case, whether it's old style discrimination in the real world or, or online. Uh, but there's no transparency about why these are made or how they're made. And the notice, in my view, in this act is one of the most powerful and important aspects of it. Likewise, the auditing and reporting is hugely important. It'll ensure that responsible companies clean up their act and will deter bad actors. And I would just say, if large companies can't spend the resources to, uh, to assess and evaluate whether they're discriminating through their algorithms, they shouldn't be using them in the first place. Um, as, to, as to the enforcement, both public and private enforcement of civil rights laws are critical. Congress and the DC Council have always said that we need private attorneys general to enforce people's civil rights. 
And to date, there's been a real lack of enforcement when it comes to uh, digital discrimination. And that's just because people don't know when they're being discriminated against. So, Mr. Romer Freeman, I'm sorry, you're about a minute over time. So I'm going to ask you to be brief then. Yeah, I'll just wrap and say this, this is a bill that is a terrific proposal. It's a real problem. And I'm glad that a lot of folks are thinking about it. But we need to get past these kind of old, old views of, you know, we putting our head in the sand and doing nothing. Thank you so much. Uh, Bennett Borden, welcome. Thank you, Chairperson White. Uh, my name is Bennett Borden. I'm a partner at the law firm of Fagery Drinker, Biddle and Reef in Washington, D.C. And I'm the firm's chief data scientist. Um, I have degrees in both data science and the law. And so part of my role is working with clients on their development and use of these AI systems, algorithms, and automated decision makings, and doing so in a legal and ethical manner. I work with clients in a lot of different industries, including the insurance industry and some of the companies who are there. But today I'm not speaking on behalf of any client. I'm really speaking as a practitioner who is seeking to um, help clients through these issues of developing regulation. I'm the guy in the trenches who is actually trying to measure these things that we are all talking about. I am deeply grateful for the council in considering legislation in this important area of algorithmic fairness. Having worked as a data scientist and a lawyer for 20 years, I'm keenly aware of both the astonishing benefits that can come from these data-driven automated decision-making systems, but also some of the un possible unintended consequences that these systems can create. The fundamental purpose of the DC Human Rights Act is for citizens to be treated according to individual merit. And that is one of the most precious purposes that I think our government can accomplish. As a longtime DC citizen and as a gay man whose life has been impacted by a lot of stereotypes and discrimination in my life, but also as a data scientist, preventing discrimination by algorithms is immensely, immensely important to me. However, as you've seen from testimony today, these are very complex and nuanced questions. And so in my experience in trying to identify and quantify risks related to insurable risks, those are just categorically different than some of the other fairness objectives in algorithms and areas such as housing, employment, and certainly social media and advertising. Because of this, I do urge the council as it's considering this legislation to exclude insurance from the scope of its act. Insurance seek to identify risk, right? So that fair and actuarially sound decisions can be made to match price to risk. And there already exists a fulsome regulatory scheme of doing that. Um, there's lots of filings with the DISB and rate plans and all sorts. Um, and this scheme is based upon decades of actuarial science. This expertise of understanding that science really should be relied upon and the DISB is where that expertise relies. By including insurance in the scope of the act, what I fear is that the particularities around fairly and accurately identifying insurable risks are gonna get muddled into this, the fundamental differences in fairness between around like housing and employment and education and certainly social media and advertising. Fairness in these areas are critical. And especially something, uh, Chairperson, that you mentioned about what is presented to us about what is good and what is beautiful, that is a really critically important issue that is very distinct from employment or housing or insurance. And so as the council moves forward in considering this legislation, I would encourage it to delve into the differences in the risks or harm that we are trying to identify. And how do I measure that? The question becomes, like you've heard here, there's not really an agreed upon standard for how do I even measure by what mathematical tests do I run as a data scientist to figure out if something is fair or not? And once I get a measurement, is that a good measurement or a bad measurement? And really the worst part is once I figure out whether that's good or bad, what do I do to fix it? These questions have not been fully answered, even in the academic community where I work um, with these experts constantly trying to answer this question. So while I commend the council's movement in this very important area, I would urge that first that insurance be taken out of its scope but also that the fact gathering process continue to understand the important distinctions between these risks that we face in our society. Thank you. Thank you, Annette Timon. 
Good afternoon, Chairperson White and members of the committee. My name is Annette Tyman. I'm a partner at the law firm of Seiferth Shaw and co-chair of our People Analytics Practice Group. In my role, I advise employers on the legal implications of using sophisticated algorithmic technologies in the workplace. Like the committee and the employers with which I work, we are committed to non-discrimination in the employment context. My testimony today will fo focus on the challenges in the bill as it relates to employment in particular. Developing, implementing, and operationalizing algorithms to make employment decisions is complex. The war for talent, particularly after the pandemic, has created unique challenges for employers, including increased complexities due to the remote workforce in which uh, uh, we work these days. Employers are using algorithmic tools to source candidates, retain talent, reduce turnover, increase productivity, and bolster diversity, equity, and inclusion goals, to name just a few. When carefully developed and implemented, employers have found significant increases in efficiencies and effectiveness in hiring and retention of employees by broadening the pool of applicants, improving the accuracy of assessment tools, assessing performance, and enhancing movement and mobility for workers. In my experience, the use of AI tools is focused on improving efficiencies and effectiveness of employment decisions, while at the same time, diligently minimizing any impact on the basis of race, gender, or other protected characteristics. Recognizing that the issues are complex and do require thoughtful implementation of algorithms in the employment context, I offer the following specific concerns. First, the bill fails to adequately define the use of algorithmic processes as used to make eligibility determinations. Similarly, terms like machine learning, AI and similar techniques, I repeat that in quotes, similar techniques do not give employers the information needed to understand which processes specifically fall within the scope of the pending bill. For instance, if AI is used to optimize a traditional paper and pencil test to ensure that only those questions which are most predictive of performance are used, is that an example of an algorithmic process that is covered by the bill? further clarity is needed for employees from a definitional perspective. Second, the scope and applicability of the requirements is undefined, particularly when considers the remote workforce in which employers are living today. For instance, if we look at the hiring context, would the two notice requirements set forth in the bill apply to all uh, DC employers regardless of where the positions are opened? And conversely, if the bill is instead focused on only DC employers and the positions there, do the two notice requirements extend to all applicants who may be applying to those positions, including those outside of the district uh, and potentially even globally? These are examples of key clarifications that are needed for the employer community. Uh, third, the notice requirements under the bill are exceedingly overbroad. And again, just using the example in the hiring context, the bill would seemingly require that notice be provided to any individual applicant for a position that did not move forward in the selection process. In addition, the notice would require that the employer provide the candidate with the opportunity to correct information uh, used to make the employment decision. And it's difficult to understand exactly how such a provision would apply in the employment arena, given the finite positions available and decisions being made as sometimes between hundreds and even thousands of candidates. Uh, in fact, there's currently no requirement that employers provide notice to applicants of any non-selection decision uh, in the hiring context. So this bill would significantly increase the burden on employers and just to uh, final in final final thought here is that creating and retaining that audit trail that covers a five year period is exceedingly onerous. By way of example, the EEOC requires that private employers retain records for only one year after the date of making a record. Uh, in contrast here, in, in the case of applicants who are not selected for employment, the bill would seemingly require a five year retention period, which is quite significant. This implicates data security issues, privacy issues, server space issues, all at an enormous cost to employers. I thank you for the opportunity to provide this testimony and I commend uh, the, the council for um, taking on this really difficult but very important topic. Uh, thank you very much. And finally for this panel, we'll marry Scoto.
Thank you, Chairperson White and committee members. I appreciate the opportunity to speak today in support of the Stop Discrimination by Algorithms Act. I am here on behalf of Access Now, an international organization that defends and extends the digital rights of users at risk around the world. We have focused extensively on data protection issues as an organization. And as the data protection lead, I work directly with lawmakers at local and national levels to ensure policy decisions are focused on the rights of people, particularly, particularly Latino and Black populations. The SDAA provides a framework that would significantly change the privacy landscape in the district, particularly on protections for biometric and location data, consumer rights, and civil remedies. Today, I'll focus on three critical provisions in the SDAA that protect privacy and civil liberties and should be retained. First, the SDAA gives users more power over their data and improves public transparency about algorithms. It prohibits discrimination and targeting information about important life opportunities. It gives people the right to know when an algorithm is used to make an important decision. And no matter the color of our skin or where we're born, we all deserve to live in a country, in a city, in a district where we can reach our potential and provide for our loved ones and live full lives free from discrimination offline as well as online. But opaque and often biased algorithms are deciding who has access to housing, education, and other opportunities. And we should be concerned. The companies who deploy these automated decision systems usually answer to no one. The SDAA also requires covered entities to provide plain language notice to individuals when algorithmic decision making relates to an important life opportunity. And it requires a more detailed disclosure to individuals against whom an adverse action has been taken based on an algorithmic decision. Currently, people who use online services generally have no idea that a company's data practices are collecting their biometric recognition information, or they have the option to deny the use of their data for these purposes. The SDAA would at least give people notice about the data companies collect about them. These provisions offer fundamental rights that are often missing or difficult to take advantage of online. Secondly, the SDAA also heightens protections for biometric and location data. Companies are working hard to develop AI systems based on biometric data, and they're doing it with essentially no safeguards. This bill would require covered entities to inform in writing when collecting and processing of personal info, including location or biometric data. Third, it ensures sensible and robust enforcement by empowering the OAG and private individuals to hold covered entities directly accountable for discriminating against them. A PRA can serve as an incremental tool and exposure to litigation risk does focus the collective mind of corporate management. A privacy law is only as effective as its enforcement and allowing individuals to bring lawsuits will help ensure companies comply with it. Finally, I would like to address a few comments you've heard during this hearing and highlight some key points. The term fairness has come up a lot today and fair algorithms, but the ultimate goal isn't to make fair algorithms. We want to eliminate discrimination, period. We've also heard of the challenges companies face eliminating proxy data. Well, if companies can eliminate proxy data, then that's actually an argument for the prohibitions in this bill, not against it. We also respectfully re urge you, the council, to, allow, to not allow the complexity of categorizing technologies deter you from the fact that you have to start somewhere. You have to set a baseline, and then you can adjust from there if it's needed. In conclusion, DC residents can't control their own digital identity without strong protections against algorithmic discrimination. The district should not delay this important measure. We urge you to support this bill and thank you for your time. Uh, thank you, uh, Ms. Escoto. You stole my point that I was gonna start with. Uh, so thank you. I, I do think I've um, been at board and I, I, I really appreciated your, your testimony. Um, and what I was going to raise is, is you are right, these are very complex and nuanced issues. Uh, but as Ms. Escoto pointed out, we can't stop that. We, we can't let that stop us from, from moving forward. It won't get less complex. And so we, we have to start somewhere. And I think we want to do as good a job as we can and, and, and improve uh, from there. And um, I will, um, well, with respect to insurance, uh, it, I mean, you raise a, a good point. I think there will be a lot of industries that say, okay, if this moves forward, exclude us. Um, I think conceptually insurance maybe is easier to, to understand. Um, 
can can you talk about how um, how agor- algorithms are used in the uh, insurance industry? You know, my experience is only as um, extensive as it is. I think with as with many other industries, what we've seen is that automated decision making process have evolved out of traditional decision making processes, right? The difference being that now in many different industries, we just have more data that's available to us about making decisions, whether it's employment, housing, insurance, or anything else. The the challenge is how do I get the good stuff out of that data without either pulling in bad stuff or even perpetuating um, societal issues, right? And so that's where some of the difference in this in the different industries starts to become really important. Because even if you look at insurance and consumer risks, I'm looking for a particular kind of quantification, right, of a person's life. Well, some of that quantification is things we care about and it's fair to hold some responsible. Some of it may not, right? I don't know how extensive that issue is, right? Because we just haven't measured it a lot. It hasn't, a lot of industries as was raised earlier, don't have the data to be able to tell how different people are being treated differently. Most industries don't collect protected class data. They just don't. Most of them are prohibited from doing so. And so if I wanted to start measuring today how I'm treating um, whites versus Asians differently, for example, I'd have to know who's in those two groups. Well, I can ask people for it, That's gonna take years and years to collect that information, but more importantly, to have information over a long enough period of time to see trends, right? I can go buy it um, off the market with all the problems that comes with, with representativeness and accuracy and such, um, or I can try to get it from some governmental source. It is these most fundamental things that are just, we just haven't figured out yet. I would, recommend that the council and the committee look at some of the academic work that has been done. NIST and its framework has to be published by January of 2023. So they under a very tight deadline, but they have put together all kinds of hearings and public comment. And there's a great deal of work in that area um, that could be helpful as far as insight to the committee goes. Um, And we we have a number of uh, folks from the insurance industry on the, the next panel. Um, so, so this is something we'll, we'll dig into a little more. Let me move to another point, which uh, Mr. Scotto also articulated better than I would. And so, so I'm glad that you did. But, th- but there's this issue, and I was thinking about this as uh, Peter Romer uh, Fr- Friedman was, was testifying. Uh, he used an example of a client who found out um, by circumstance that um, there was discrimination uh, happening, but most people don't know. Uh, we, we, it's it's hard to to understand exactly how systems might be susceptible to algorithmic bias, since this technology you know operates within a, a you know a business's sort of you know in a business, not not in, in public view, and so we don't know how artificial intelligence uh, or algorithms were designed. We don't know what data. Uh, uh, help build it or, or how it works. And so, um, Tom, folks, let me come to you. Without auditing this, how do we even know whether there is discrimination that we need to be addressing? Thank you, uh, council member. So um, that's the responsibility of the companies that develop and deploy. Uh, and that's part of our uh, impact assessment uh, recommendations that we make, uh, kind of the best practices uh, that we worked with well, worked with our members for uh, well over a year uh, to kind of come up with, you know, what the industry standards were, what they were doing, uh, and the responsibilities that they have there as they um, create, uh, develop, and deploy um you know, these systems. Um, so yeah, no, it's, it's definitely, that's really what the, the report that I mentioned, um, is about, uh, is, you know, making sure that companies are taking these responsible steps, uh, so that there is trust among the, uh, among the public, uh, that, uh, you know, that these systems are being used, um, in the right way. So I agree that there, there needs to be transparency here. Uh, we do recommend, um, 
uh, impact assessments, which are, you know, essentially uh, they are like audits, uh, the way that we define them, they're more of the industry standard uh, right now around these things where they're, um, you know, they're trying to determine, um, you know, the data that is coming out of these systems once deployed so that they can then assess and ensure that there is no bias and then continue to do that. And the, the, who would do the, would do or does do the impact assessments? So I, I think we mentioned earlier, uh, independence is important. Um, so uh, it wouldn't be, it certainly wouldn't be the, the same people that are created and, and uh, you know, and are deploying it. It would be, uh, you know, I think there has been some talk about third parties. Just don't think that there is a mature enough um uh, uh, market there of that. And then it also runs into other issues around, um, you know, uh, different protected uh, information and things like that. But there is, you could do effective, um, you know, within the same company, effective assessments. You just do a different apartment that doesn't have impact, doesn't have uh, engagement with that. And, but so they're aligned, uh, they're, you know, on the same, uh, you know, working on similar things, but they're not, they don't have any insight or any, um, uh, uh, you know, impact over uh, that specific uh, department. So they're uh, internal yet independent and separate from uh, the teams that are creating the AI and deploying the AI. Um, Will Mary Escoto and then uh, Peter Romer Friedman, uh, do you have thoughts on, on this approach? Yes, um, kind of. At a starting point, we kind of need to think about what's happening here. Some entities are saying that they offer, you know, these algorithms to be used in decision making about important life opportunities, whether it's insurance or anything else, but they can't determine whether or not it's discriminatory. That's a huge problem. And that underscores the need for this bill. Um, we're really in the beginning stages of this bill. We acknowledge that it will take some time to work to develop. Um, a solution to this. And I think that there's a lot of opportunity to keep working on it. Um, but I think that entities really need to work out how to responsibly collect sufficient data to detect and address discrimination. Um, it's not fair to basically tell DC residents, I'm sorry, we don't know whether or not we're discriminating against you and we can't find out. Um, so I, yeah, I'll add that. Thank you. Uh, uh, Ms. Romer Friedman. Friedman. Thank you. Yeah, I, I think it's important that these uh, audits be independent. And I think, you know, having a different department that works for the same entity doesn't seem very independent to me. That seems like just a different person working for the same boss. Um, you know, even a lot of the, the, the quote unquote civil rights audits that Facebook and other companies have done with outside counsel, those are lawyers who work directly for the company. They're not particularly independent. I think it's really wrong to, to suggest that there's not a mature group of data scientists who can do these audits. Kathy O'Neill, who wrote the, the book Weapons of Math Destruction, which I highly recommend, has often said that when she she'll, she's a mathematician, she goes to companies and says, this is what I can do for you. They're really interested in it, but they, you know, they want non-disclosure agreements and they really don't want someone telling them that they're, that they're breaking the law, they're, they're violating people's rights. So I think it's I mean, frankly, I think what's going on here is business is uh, opposed to this bill because they it's not just that they don't want to do the assessments, is that they don't want to hand them over to uh, the attorney general because they know that you know if, if there's some really bad stuff there, there might be enforcement. But I, I see the auditing as an important thing both to make, to make sure that they do the right thing in the first place, but also if there are problems that we have adequate enforcement. Uh, right now, we're just in the dark and I see a chicken and egg problem being created by saying we don't have enough people to do the audits or we don't have enough law review studies to know about the problem. Um, when we've had civil rights laws you know, since the 1860s that actually applied to these very things uh, like section, uh, section 1981, which was enacted in 1866 to address um, the right for black people to contract. Um, Katarina Kopp, did you uh, have thoughts on this? Well, I just wanted to really echo what Ms. Escoto was saying that I think um, it is not, you know, sort of sufficient to say we don't know and therefore, um, you know, we, 
you know, the insurance industry should be taken out out of this bill. That's at least that, what I understood from what Mr. Borden was saying. Um, in the areas where um, independent researchers have access, um, they have been found a disparate impact, for example, in the car insurance industry. It's just that for outsiders, it's very difficult to make those determinations. And so that's why uh, the bills are asking for the insurance companies to do it themselves. And we really should mm -hmm. adopt sort of a do no harm approach before we deploy any algorithms, um, we, we, you know, we, sh we need to make sure that they're not uh, doing harm. Thank you. Uh, and did you, were, were you saying in your testimony that we should focus on the, the, the creators of the algorithm rather than the, the businesses that, that use them or did I misunderstand? No, I was just trying to make a point that, you know, historically sometimes service providers are sort of left out of this equation and they're just sort of, you know, contracts will fix it. Um, but I just want to make the point that the service providers are sometimes very, um, you know, important companies like uh, big tech, like Facebook, uh, that have all these downstream implications and we need to look at them as carefully as, as the companies using those algorithms. Okay. I appreciate it. Um, yeah, I could I could ask a lot of questions to to this panel. I want I want to I want to keep keep moving um, because we, we do have a lot of other people waiting to testify, and and we'll have to break for a markup in the committee. Um, so let I me say, say one point, really please. quickly, on regards to auto insurance. It is more expensive for communities of color. Um, we pay thirty percent more for auto insurance premiums. I'm happy to send you that uh, those that information. There was a Public Citizen, another organization has done great research on that. Um, and there was uh, found that all state was proposing elevated rates to customers already paying a large amount. Um, so it's out there, it exists. And I just wanted to address that. Thank you for allowing yeah. me to. Thank you. Uh, well, thank you again to, to this panel. I, I appreciate you all participating today. Um, let us try for our next panel. We will try to get through it. Um, <clears throat> will be Angela Franco, Thomas Glassick, Karen Meltert, Matt Overturf, Kristen Hathaway, Kimberly Robinson, and David Snyder. Ms. Frankel, welcome. Thank you so much, and thank you for your um, for for allowing me to go first. I appreciate it. Um, greetings, Chairman White, Council members, and staff. My name is Angela Franco, and I'm the President and CEO of the DC Chamber of Commerce. As the leading business organization in Washington DC, the Chamber serves a diverse membership of over a thousand small and large businesses. Our mission has always been to be the most valuable resource and leading advocate for businesses throughout the District of Columbia. And our vision is to create a vibrant, thriving economy that improves the quality of life for all, for all in the district, establishing mutually beneficial partnerships between business, government, and the community. Thank you so much for the opportunity to testify today. I wanna convey three major points. First, on behalf of the chamber, I'm here to acknowledge that the proponents of this bill arrived at the issue of the algorithm with the best intentions. I can never ever claim to be an expert on the subject of the legislation before us today, the use of algorithms and artificial intelligence. And what I have learned is that the subject matter is highly technical and it's significantly complex. Important issues have arisen in connection with this topic, and we at the Chamber stand ready to continue the conversation about the appropriate use of these emerging data tools. But simply stated, this bill needs lots of additional work, and it is maybe not the best time to address these issues. You have now heard from dozens of witnesses from across the country, and indeed from right across town, 
who have raised a series of concerns about both the scope and the substance of the pending legislation. We also anticipate providing additional post hearing written comments to further address issues such as threshold definitional concerns, compliance issues, auditing methodology, and other matters that run right to the core of the legislation. I would only ask that you take all these concerns to heart as you consider whether to proceed, proceed further with this bill. Second, it is important to keep in front of our minds the basic fact that algorithms have become a powerful tool to help all of us draw the right conclusions equitable, just, and fair-minded. From the growing amount of information we are gathering every single day in our work together and in our communities. You have heard the same theme uh, shared by multiple witnesses today, and we anticipate submitting additional written information as well on this end. Finally, uh, for most of my life, I've been, I've been here to support businesses. Today, I serve as, passion, as a passionate advocate committed to the cause of supporting entrepreneurs and the at-large business community in the city. I have witnessed its benefits, not only for our business owners, workers, and, cu and customers, but also for the vital role local entrepreneurs play in the DC neighborhoods and the broader community. As we all know, the last few years have been some of our most difficult in recent memory, especially for many of our small business owners and workers. And that is why I'm particularly concerned about the impact this bill could have on those small businesses, low margin enterprises that often unknowingly through vendors access, access beneficial information in ways that this legislation could have significant costs to their operation. From a family owned neighborhood to dry cleaner, a startup restaurant, this bill could impact their works and their lives. And in a way at this point, we are not able to identify how much or the impact it would have. In conclusion, we stand ready to work with you, Mr. Chairman, and the rest of the committee um, on, and the staff on this important topic. At this point, with the way the legislation is written, we cannot support it. Thank you very much for the opportunity uh, to offer testimony, and I look forward to answering any questions. Uh, thank you very much. Tom Glassick, welcome. Good afternoon, Chairman White, members of the committee. My name is Tom Glassick, and I am the recently named um, Executive Director of the DC Insurance Federation. You'll likely remember my predecessor, Wayne McGowan, who led DCIF for many years. Um, worry not, I believe Wayne is actually watching this from his retirement in North Carolina and sends his regards. Uh, you have big shoes to fill. Uh, <laughs> he would also say big suits right now. It's been a, it's been a long COVID. Uh, but um, through the membership of DCIF, particularly through our National Insurance Trade Association members, District of Columbia Insurance Federation represents the overwhelming majority of property casualty life and health insurers that are licensed by DISB to provide insurance to District of Columbia. I'm humbled to share this panel, although I'm really glad you put Bennett on the last one because he's smarter than me. Um, I'm humbled to share this panel with so many of my colleagues who are DCIF members who represent each of the constituent pieces of the insurance marketplace. I will allow my colleagues to highlight their specific sectors, roles in the business, roles in the industry, and why um, B24558 is both inappropriate and harmfully duplicative of to the highly regulated insurance marketplace. And you're all well aware of how, how well, how, how thoroughly regulated we are. In short, the reason this legislation is inappropriate for the insurance marketplace is that our state insurance regulator, who you'll be hearing from later, and all state insurance regulators, all 56 jurisdictions, um, already have the authority to do what is done in this legislation. And not only do they have the authority, they're doing it, and they've been doing it as long as I've been an insurance guy um, and long before that. Um, we are not allowed to, you know, we are not allowed to, and our regulators do not permit any use of any unfair discriminatory practices in any aspects of insurance, underwriting, pricing, and anything mathematic that you can possibly think of. And like I said, this is not new. This is what insurance regulators have been doing since they started doing it. And they started doing it and created the National Association of Insurance Commissioners 171 years ago. I 
excuse me, I lost my place. I apologize. So in short, DCIF feels st strongly that unless the insurance marketplace is wholly exempt from all aspects of, of, of build 24558 insurers would be unique among DC businesses in being subject to duplicative yet inconsistent supervision and regulatory structures by two different DC agencies, two entities that both have goals to produce similarly stated outcomes and, and similar outcomes. The facility already has an effective insurance regulatory space that addresses this concern. Um, we can talk about the, the expense of duplication, but um, that's pretty obvious. It's not just expensive duplication for, for the regulators, it's expensive duplication for the District of Columbia to try to even do this. So DCIF could not feel more strongly and could not encourage the committee to make certain that none of the provisions of B24555 apply in the, in the insurance marketplace should this bill advance beyond your considerations. DCIF appreciates this opportunity today and looks forward to working with your excellent staff going forward and cleanly and effectively precluding the application of this legislation to the insurance marketplace. I also need to thank you uh, personally, I, my two more seconds. Um, this is my first time, although I was born a mile from here in the District of Columbia, this is my first time testifying as a as a public witness, I have testified as a as a, as for the executive when I was the Disney general counsel. So thank you for scheduling this so that I get to do my debut in my home legislature. We are glad to, to have you and welcome to the to the new role as well. Uh, Karen Melcher, welcome. Thank you very much. Good afternoon, Mr. Chairman, members of the committee. Uh, my name is Karen Melcher. I'm a regional vice president in state relations at the American Council of Life Insurers, also known as ACLI. And I come before you today to speak in opposition to B24-558. ACLI is the leading trade association driving public policy and advocacy on behalf of the life insurance industry. So first, let me begin by saying we are not opposed to the concept that the attorney general is seeking to address with this legislative proposal. We are opposed, however, to the manner in which this legislation seeks to address the issue of fairness in the use of algorithms and related technology. Our goal as the life insurance industry is to reach as many Americans as possible to ensure that they have the tools they need to plan for their and their family's financial future. We are not a product that is mandated by law or practice but we do provide a peace of mind that many Americans seek to obtain on a daily basis. Society is changing at an ever increasing pace. The demand for an instantaneous response is not just limited to millennials and Gen Z, even those of us who are Gen X or even boomers want speedier responses to the products and services we seek. Technology helps with that. But that does not mean we should or need to sacrifice ethical and fair treatment for all consumers in achieving that goal. The insurance industry is unique in that we are regulated at the state level. This means we have over 51 different regulatory regimes with the authority to intervene in our daily business activity. While that is beneficial for certain areas of, experience, of insurance, for instance, are you at risk for a peril that someone in another state may not be? There are other areas where uniformity is key to providing all consumers with the protections they want and deserve. If one jurisdiction imposes strict and confining requirements on an insurer's activities where others are not, that will likely lead to insurers scaling back what products they offer and how they provide them in that jurisdiction. That does not typically result in a benefit to the consumer. For the insurance industry, uniformity where needed is typically provided through action undertaken by the National Association of Insurance Commissioners. The NEAC acts as the trade association, for lack of a better term, for the insurance regulatory system. The insurance commissioners from all 50 st states, DC, Puerto Rico, Guam, and a few other locations, and their staff work together to create uniform standards that most jurisdictions adopt with little to no alteration. 
This provides a consistent regulatory playbook for both insurers, regulators, and consumers. They address issues from financial solvency to minimum benefit standards to unfair trade practices. What is in the proposal before you does not impose new restrictions on what an insurer may do. Insurers are already prohibited from instituting practices that are unfairly discriminatory. This does not go away simply because there's new technology being used. It's imperative that insurers develop new technology while at the same time abiding by the legal requirement to treat each consumer fairly. The NEAC has been focused on the use of big data and algorithms and machine learning and other new technology for several years. Recently, they created a new letter committee to ensure that all aspects of these issues are coordinated and in sync with one another to ensure that the standards that are established are consistent across the many areas under the purview of the state regulator. It is extremely important that the NEAC provide consistent and uniform standards for carriers to follow when it comes to this new technology. The H committee led by Commissioner Brain from Maryland has been holding workshops for insurance commissioners over the past several months to make sure regulators have a common understanding of terms being used, concepts being discussed, and possible regulatory approaches to the use of algorithms, machine learning, artificial intelligence, big data, accelerated underwriting, and the like. We anticipate the NEAC releasing a draft of their anticipated approach later this year or early in 2023. I know I'm running out of time, so I'll, I'll quickly um, wrap up. As I stated earlier, as in others have said, the insurance industry is vigorously regulated. We need to be able to embrace tech, new technology that helps us enhance the way we develop and deliver our products to consumers, but we must do so under the current legislative and regulatory framework that prohibits unfair discrimination in insurance practices. As new technology evolves and regulation of such activities evolve along with it, we need consistent guidance across jurisdictions so that all consumers have the same opportunities and protections, regardless of where they are when purchasing an insurance product. Based on this, we respectfully request that this committee and the council remove insurance from the scope of this proposal. Thank you. Thanks so much. Matt Overturf, welcome. Good afternoon, Chairman White, <clears throat> members of the committee. My name is Matt Overturf, Regional Vice President for the Ohio Valley Mid-Atlantic Region with the National Association of Mutual Insurance Companies. NAMIC is the largest property and casualty insurance trade association in the country, with more than 1,500 member companies supporting local, regional, and national carriers who write over 750 million direct written premium in the District of Columbia. NAMIC and our members firmly, firmly believe in the fair treatment of all policyholders and join the collective insurance industry who are adamantly opposed to discrimination based on race and unfair discrimination in general. We are committed to ensuring that our algorithms are free from unfair discrimination and support legislative policies to prevent these practices, many of which are already established in the DC Insurance Code. While we understand its intent, we are opposed to the legislation and respectfully request that at a minimum, the insurance industry, including insurance support organizations, be removed from the scope of the bill. This proposal creates a par parallel and inconsistent set of standards in conflict with the existing insurance code. The inclusion of insurance in the bill undermines the authority of the commissioner and the purpose of the district's robust insurance regulatory requirements, which are ultimately for the benefit of consumers. Additionally, the proposal prohibits the use of certain rating factors that are actuarially sound and permitted by the insurance laws and regulations currently in place. To protect policyholders and the general public, DISBY regulators apply the stringent requirements of the DC Insurance Code and the administrative regulations to all participants in the insurance market. These efforts generally fall into two categories, financial and market conduct. To highlight a few, current law already requires DISBY to do the following, conduct rate and form reviews. DC law states that rates cannot be excessive, inadequate, or unfairly discriminatory. Unfairly discriminatory is defined as prohibiting rates that treat applicants with similar risk profiles differently. Secondly, perform market conduct exams. DISBY conducts periodic examinations of company practices. If companies are not complying with the laws and regulations, DISBY may order restitution and impose penalties for violations. They also investigate and resolve consumer complaints. If an individual feels that they have been treated unfairly by an insurer, either in claim handling or business practice, they may file a complaint with DISBY who will investigate to determine if the insurer completed the law or complied with the law as it pertains to the specific consumer. And finally, perform financial audits. Financial solvency is one of the most important components of insurance regulation, which is focused on setting and continued monitoring of financial requirements, such as capital, reserves, investments, and solvency through periodic reporting and formal examinations conducted every five years. If an insurer is unable to satisfy the district's financial requirements, the insurer may find itself taken into receivership by the regulator. 
Ensuring a competitive insurance market is a significant component of protecting consumers. The commissioner of DISBY and staff are uniquely qualified to maintain the appropriate balance between the imp imposition of regulatory burdens and consumer protection to create the conditions for a healthy insurance market within the District of Columbia. For these reasons, we oppose this legislation and request the removal of the insurance industry from the scope of this bill. I appreciate the opportunity to appear, appear before the committee today. Thank you. Thanks so much, Kristen Hathaway. Welcome. Karen White and distinguished committee members, I'm Chris Hathaway with America's Health Insurance Plans. And on behalf of the health plans operating in the District of Columbia, uh, we appreciate the opportunity to provide our perspective on the bill. Um, I have submitted formal testimony, but I know we've got that four o'clock deadline, so I'm going to be fast and brief. Um, I will say health plans realize uh, the extremely important role of algorithms uh, that they have in the future, but we obviously very much uh, acknowledge uh, those of the past, and we want to make sure that we are investigating and, and not replicating historical biases. Uh, we understand and, and agree with ongoing evaluation of how health plans uh, use these algorithms. We are not pushing back on oversight of this issue for health careers in general, but by whom? Um, for three reasons, we are asking for an exemption for this legislation. That was what I just mentioned, jurisdiction, um, the alignment of our issues and duplication. So under the jurisdiction, we would just mention that health carriers are under stringent oversight of DISBY, uh, Commissioner and DC Health Inc. in many occasions. Uh, Commissioner Woods has complete insight into our operations, including AI practices. Uh, the second issue, streamlining efforts. Uh, we have been working on this issue for quite some time in the health insurance industry. We've worked with ANSI, that's the American National Standards Institute. They make sure all the keyboards look the same, the plugs are all the same, right? They have all those thousands of standards. They actually came out last year with a specific standard for AI in healthcare. So we are working together with our member plans on making sure we have those being incorporated into our companies. And then uh, also, as, as Karen had mentioned, we work very closely with the NAIC and we suspect, uh, you know, definitely the same kind of attention um, coming out with standards as well uh, when they conclude their work. Although it will always be ongoing, I should say never conclude, uh, but continue to see what we have in writing. And then lastly, uh, in particular cases of health insurance, as we see a lot of duplication here. Uh, and that's because we actually abide by federal law called HIPAA. And under HIPAA, we are already providing notices uh, of private data. We are already dealing with breaches and security and privacy and all those very important issues. Uh, so we have been dealing with that for some, quite some time. Um, I would just note every time we do an additional layer of um, oversight, unfortunately, that does add costs, although this is a critically important important because we're already doing many of these issues. Uh, I don't know if, if the additional consumer protection is really quite where we think it is uh, would be helpful with this bill. So I'm going to conclude there looking at the time and happy to answer any of your questions. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, Kimberly Robinson, welcome. Thank you so much, Chairman White, members of the committee. Kimberly Robinson on behalf of Cigna. I am a member of um, AHIP, which you just heard from, from Ms. Hathaway, and I will try to limit my testimony to just align with things you've already heard instead of fully repeating. We are here today um, requesting, I, I would say our position would be opposition, but what we really are requesting, as you've heard from others in the insurance industry, is that the, uh, that the council consider yielding jurisdiction in this particular space to our insurance commissioner and our very talented and professional regulators at Disby. You know, I'm here representing my company, but I also, like we all do, bring my whole self to my work. So I look at this through the lens as an African-American woman. I look at it as a person who spent 20 years writing legislation um, and as a person who's been an insurance regulator as well as worked for an insurance company. And one of the things that I'll say about this particular industry is that this is an issue that the industry has actually been working on for a few more years before the, the council came to put the bill in through the National Association of Insurance Commissioners. I think we are in some ways a little bit further down the road in doing the industry specific work to make sure that we are regulating and being regulated in the space of how we use data and algorithms in a way that makes the most sense for insurance. I think one of the challenges when we read the bill, looking at it as a broad regulation is that it touches 
every industry in the District of Columbia, but is trying to touch them all in exactly the same way. And one of the unique things about insurance is that it is a space where the term unfairly discriminatory exists within the statute. It is in fact a standard and has been for well over hundred years. But what that means is very unique in insurance and does differ than the way it might be applied in housing, the way it might be applied in education. And so while none of that is to allow unlawful discrimination, which is a, a separate category, there, that term discrimination just being picking between two things is often what is happening in insurance. And it's important that we allow our regulator, who is the most well-versed in insurance, to be the one to know how best to evaluate that where our products and those across the varying insurance industries are concerned. And just as an example, you know, one of the challenges and one of the things that we're very proud of that we are doing um, that uses AI, but in very specific ways, I think we would describe it, um, well, one, I think that's one of the definitional challenges in the bill, right? Exactly what does that mean and how is it being used? I think what you'll find is that there are a lot of industries who are using not pure artificial intelligence, it's really more augmented, where you're marrying what an AI process is with human intelligence. So it's not just simply being left to a computer, there's still human engagement that's happening with that. But one of the ways that I know that in the healthcare space we're doing that is around correcting historical wrongs in things like health equity and social determinants of health. These are spaces where there is a reason to include race as part of that assessment because we know that there are health disparities that are occurring and by ignoring them, we have disadvantaged communities of color because we're not meeting their needs. And so instead you have to be proactive in including that as a factor. Um, and so I think there's just nuance that's important to be considered. We do believe our regulator is the most appropriate to be able to do that. And so I just add my voice to those of the others in the insurance administ uh, insurance industry rather in supporting the concept that DISBY be selected as our primary regulator in this space as they already are going forward and in making any implementation that the District of Columbia would choose to do in this space where insurance is concerned. Happy to answer any questions, thank you. Thank you very much. And uh, finally, for this panel, David Snyder, very good to see you. Good afternoon, Mr. Chairman. I feel a little bit like the last presenter before happy hour. Um, <laughs> if you would like to carry this over, please let me know. I don't, I don't want to interfere with the all important uh, markup that, that you'll be engaged in. Um, would you like me to go now? Yes, that'd be great. Okay, thanks a lot. Mr. Chairman, uh, way back at the beginning of this hearing, I know it seems like a year ago, but it was actually a couple hours ago, you gave a challenge to all of the witnesses, which was to, to describe the best ways to achieve the legislation's important goals. We accept that challenge, and a lot of the testimony you've heard from the insurance people outlines the extent to which this, the challenge that you gave us can be effectively met um, actually more effectively met by DISB, the expert regulators there and the industry working together than they can be even under this legislation. Um, I, I do represent the American Property Casualty Insurance Association uh, this afternoon, and they're proud to have uh, provided financial security and risk management support to the citizens, enterprises, and nonprofits of the District of Columbia for decades and are committed to doing so in the future. Now, this is a rapidly evolving area. You've heard that from many other speakers. You've also heard about the National Institute of Standards and Technologies work. And in their second draft risk management framework, they make the point that AI research and development as well as the standards landscape is evolving rapidly. Insurance in the district is currently competitive, comprehensively regulated and innovative, offering consumers a wide range of choices and products and providers. Using IT, AI, and algorithms, insurers have been able to more effectively and efficiently serve DC customers. Regrettably, the legislation might chill the use of AI in such positive areas, such as more fairly and accurately assessing and pricing for risk, including telematics that records how you actually drive as opposed to large sort of demographic uh, uh, divisions, if you will. Um, AI permits insurers to more rapidly and fairly settle claims in hours. Um, I've been around long enough to, to 
remember the old days when it, you had to run around and get estimates from three different auto body shops. Um, and it sometimes took days. Uh, now, um, uh, non-contested uh, claims can be resolved in a matter of hours through the use of AI. AI also allows insurers to determine what claims ought to be paid immediately and where there might be abuse for human review um, in the future. But not only will this legislation have potentially severe consequences for insurance consumers, but it's unneeded. As was mentioned, um, all the work being done by DISB and the national regulators in support of DISB through the NAIC. Uh, insurance is comprehensively regulated pursuant to legislation that you have enacted and fully um, implemented by DISB, including definitions of unacceptable discrimination and the enforcement tools to prevent and punish it. And those include tools that can prevent dis unfair discrimination from occurring in the first place, rather than simply acting after the fact when it does occur as the AG's bill would provide. So we, we have a regulatory system that you have put in place that has the tools necessary to prevent the unfair discrimination in the first place. Uh, this bill unfortunately creates in the Attorney General a parallel and inconsistent set of standards and regulations in conflict with the insurance code and DISB. And it's unlike insurance regulation in any other state. This runs the risk of creating instability, unpredictability, and even solvency issues in the district's healthy and competitive insurance market with negative consequences for consumers. For all of these reasons, we respectfully ask that you um, reject this legislation at this time, or at least remove the business of insurance from it. And let me conclude with this statement. We are not asking for you to wait. We are not asking for you to give us an exemption. What we're asking for is to allow the institutions and tools that you have put in place to come up with the very best approach, the very best ways, as you said at the beginning, to achieve the legislation's important goals. Mr. Chairman, thank you very much and thank you for the opportunity to, um, to address uh, this legislation. Uh, thank you very much. I, I, I wanna thank this panel. You all have given us a lot to think through and I know many of you have uh, briefed my team already and, and raised some questions for us to, to grapple with. Uh, so as we, as we work through this bill and this idea, uh, we look forward to, to working with you and I appreciate you being part of this hearing today. Thank you all very much. Um, at this time, as I mentioned, we, we have to do a, a markup in the committee. We'll take, uh, I hope, about 20 minutes and not much longer uh, than that. Uh, we will do that as quickly as possible, and then we will resume with the next panel of witnesses. Uh, so again, thank you to this panel, and this hearing is in recess. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Chairman.
Good afternoon. Uh, cable team, do we need to do anything with you before resuming? We're good to go, Sean. Thank you. Great. Thank you. It should be just a couple more minutes. Okay. Thank you. Council member, we are uh, still live on YouTube and recording. Uh, you may uh, resume the hearing when you're ready. Well, thank you very much. We are resumed. I appreciate uh, everyone's patience while we attended to a committee markup. We will proceed with our final uh, panel of public witnesses. Uh, just a few more. Justin Palmer, Ariel Levinson-Waldman, and Jennifer Holloway. Justin Palmer, are you with us? There we are. Sorry about that. No problem. Welcome. Uh, All right. Uh, greetings, uh, Chairperson White, members of the Committee uh, on Government Operations and Facilities. My name is Justin Palmer, and I'm the Vice President for Public Policy and External Affairs at the District of Columbia Hospital Association. I appreciate the opportunity to provide testimony on B24558, the Stop Discrimination by Algorithms Act of 2021. Uh, um, uh, as an associ association, we recognize the importance of preventing discrimination and support the intent of the legislation. That said, we are concerned about the unintended consequences this legislation may have as currently written. This is especially true regarding how the legislation might be applied to healthcare providers. We believe the legislation may be too vague and needs more work to avoid um, accidentally harming organizations, particularly healthcare providers. The need to address equity, diversity, and inclusion has only grown exponentially during the pandemic. In fact, the DEI initiatives are now part of our joint commission surveys, which are a condition of participation with the Medicare and Medicaid programs. Our members are concerned that the legislation could create barriers to achieving equity in healthcare and possibly in inhibit their work to addressing long-term health disparities. Algorithms are utilized in healthcare and are becoming essential in supporting interventions and treatments, uh, prohibiting health algorithms from considering items like race, gender, gender identity, or other characteristics may have unintended consequences and prevent healthcare providers from using or knowing the proper evidence-based interventions determined by particular or several specific demographic characteristics and social determinants of health. Moreover, this could have important public health consequences. During the initial rollout of the COVID vaccine, providers were asked to conduct outreach to their patients based on characteristic, uh, characteristics that supported equitable distributions to priority populations. In part, this was done by using algorithms based on characteristics determined by public health priorities. Similar methodologies uh, were used during the 
or are being used in the ongoing monkeypox outbreak to help the prioritization of vaccine allocation. Again, I will say that we support the aims of this legislation, but fear the consequences on public health and health equity programs. We do not take the time to understand the implications of the legislation. Um, thank you for the opportunity to testify and I'm happy to answer any questions. Well, thank you very much, uh, Arielle Levinson Waldner. Welcome. Thank you, and Councilmember White, thank you. Uh, thank you, Councilmember Pinto, Councilmember Henderson, and staff and colleagues um, who are engaging on this critically important issue. Uh, I also want to thank. Uh, along with you for your leadership, Council Member White, uh, the leadership of Attorney General Racine in this area, uh, which has been extraordinary. Uh, and I'm looking forward to uh, his and the OEG's testimony. Uh, but I note that that leadership has been both through the office and, and here is personal today. Uh, and, and that really matters and I think reflects an important commitment to these issues of justice in the district in 2022 and what we can get done. Um, uh, I wanna say a couple of things. Uh, first, um, uh, by way of introduction, uh, Aria Levinson Waldman, I'm a Ward 4 resident and the founding director of TEDx DC. TEDx DC is a nonprofit organization headquartered at the University of the District of Columbia. Our mission is to safeguard the legal rights and financial health of DC residents facing debt related problems. We come at that mission through a racial justice lens, which we've talked a lot about today uh, from a lot of different angles. I don't wanna mention that for two main reasons. First is the massive wealth gaps that several panelists have noted today, the track race in the District of Columbia, where a statistically typical white family has wealth that is an estimated 81 times that of a statistically typical black household. Second, because the mass enforcement of debt and debt collection and impairment of residents' credit disproportionately impacts black and Latino neighbors here in the district, this has to be an area of focus in our racial justice work. I'm joined here today on this panel by my terrific Tzedek DC colleague and Equal Justice Works fellow at Tzedek DC, Jennifer Holloway. Jennifer is likewise a DC resident, is an alum of Georgetown University, and has both a legal and social work professional background. And she'll bring a particular focus in today's discussion on medical debt. Two quick points before I turn it over to Jennifer. First, Tzedek DC will support the bill going forward. If passed, this bill is gonna address an urgent need for systemic reform to help ensure fairness in the algorithms used to determine access to credit, loans, and a number of other critical life affecting opportunities. I wanna second turn to, I thought a really important framing, Councilmember White, that you introduced earlier in the hearing, which is how should this committee, how should this council uh, go about addressing the decision-making process. I wanna lift up and applaud a three-part syllogism that we heard from you today. Number one, the question is, does racial discrimination and algorithms exist? Anecdotally and data point after data point, this hearing has stood for the proposition that the answer is yes. And although you heard hints and attempts by several witnesses to avoid acknowledging that. It is clear from the record, and I can cite just one example, the very important local examples from here in the District of Columbia and in the DMV detailed in Peter Roman Friedman's testimony. Part one of your syllogism, racial discrimination and algorithms exist, and it exists right here in the District of Columbia. The second question you posed, also a critical one, should we do something about it? Attorney General Racine, a fantastic group of experts nationally and locally have spent going on two years assessing the data and policy questions here. What sits before you as a result of that expertise and effort? And the answer is absolutely, this council should do something about it. Every day that goes by, the extensive harms to residents across a very wide variety of areas of life occur. And we've heard about those wide varieties of area today um, without, um, without a change. Um, and we should do something about it. You heard arguments that, you know, uh, the district shouldn't be a leader. Let the feds address this issue. Let Europe address this issue. Let other states address this issue. Let uh, people convene and hold symposia. Um, 
experts have been working on this issue and have set up the district through that work and through the work already done by the Office of the Attorney General to be a leader, which we should be nationally on issues of justice. And we have expertise both in the development of the policy and in important and nuanced considerations of enforcement in our Office of Attorney General, led by an outstanding current AG, and we expect an outstanding future Attorney General and Brian Schwab and colleagues. Well, uh, Mr. Levinson Wallman, you're about a minute over time, so I'll ask you to uh, wrap up briefly. Thank you. I'm happy to wrap up. The last question you posed was if we're going to do something about it when our colleague from the Urban League made, I thought, a very powerful point that for several generations, folks waiting for change in the civil rights and racial justice context have gotten tired of being told it's not your turn. And it reminds me of something that is posted on our walls at Cedic DC next to pictures of John Lewis, next to pictures uh, 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 of Dr. King. And it's a phrase by uh, Rabbi Hillel who said, as to matters of justice, if not now, when? And I think you have raised the question of urgency and I appreciate that. Uh, and I'll turn it over to my colleague, Jennifer Holloway. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Ms. Holloway, welcome. Thank you. Thank you for holding this hearing on the Stop Discrimination by Algorithms Act of 2021. As Ariel mentioned, Zedek DC supports the bill and its goals. Algorithms in a variety of areas perpetuate historic patterns of discrimination in making the decisions that most directly impact the lives of DC residents. This bill would promote greater transparency in how algorithms shape access to important life opportunities and holds those who use such algorithms accountable through annual audits and a private right of enforcement. One such opportunity is access to credit. Existing credit score algorithms discriminate against people of color who have historically been denied access to traditional lines of credit. For example, Zedek DC served a client whose rental applications were rejected because she had not used credit enough to establish a credit score. Even though she paid her bills and rent on time, her decision not to use a credit card or take out loans counterintuitively prevented her from finding new housing. The credit score algorithms keep track of mortgage payments, but not renter utility payments, thereby discriminating against renters. The inputs for these algorithms are based on historic patterns of discrimination that favored mortgages, which were more available to white Americans. Today, algorithms often continue to perpetuate these patterns. The disclosure and transparency promoting features of the bill would help ferret out discriminatory algorithms. Beyond credit scores, certain existing algorithms discriminate against hopeful home buyers and renters through biased lending and tenant screening algorithms. One study found that mortgage lenders nationally were 40% more likely to deny Latino applicants and 80% more likely to deny Black applicants for loans compared to white applicants with identical financial portfolios. For renters, automated background reports use biased algorithms that too often falsely report criminal charges for applicants, particularly when consumers are members of marginalized groups with more common last names. Further, the algorithm used by many lenders penalizes applicants for medical debt, even medical debt that has been paid. In DC, residents of color are three times more likely to hold medical debt than their white neighbors and are thereby biased against under this algorithm. The high rates of medical debt hold true despite the widespread use of a hospital algor algorithm that systemically referred black patients for care at lower rates than equally sick white patients. Algorithms used by hospitals and health insurance companies have demonstrated biases against people of color, disabled people, and women with particularly negative consequences when those identities intersect. This bill would help remove the black box around so many discriminatory algorithms and require self-assessment and make feasible government assessment of such algorithms. Across the range of important life opportunities, it would prohibit any practice that has the effect of making adverse algorithmic determinations on the basis of a protected trait. One of the features of the bill that we think makes good sense is empowering the Office of the Attorney General to issue regulatory guidance pursuant to the act if it becomes law. Future regulations and other guidance promulgated by the Office of the Attorney General should, under the bill, provide further guidance to help covered entities comply with these requirements and address questions that may well come up as to implementation. 
We note and applaud the efforts to create federal protections against algorithmic discrimination spearheaded by ZDC's partners at Color of Change. We also urge that the council proceed, both because progress in Congress is slow and elusive and because states should act above any floor and limitations set by federal rules. This bill would be a major step forward. Systemic racism perpetuated by both conscious and unconscious biases cannot be allowed to hide behind an algorithm. Thank you for your leadership and work on these critical issues. Uh, thank you very much. Um... We've asked a lot of questions to a number of panels. I, I don't have any for, for uh, this panel. I, I do wanna thank you very much for your, your testimonies. Um, I'm looking forward to digging into to these issues with uh, three separate government agencies. Uh, let me see if uh, my colleague, Brooke Pinto, has any questions. I don't have any questions for this panel, but thank you all very much. Important perspective. Excellent. Uh, well, thank you all very much. Again, we, we do have a lot of work uh, to do, but um, we've got to do it. So uh, we will we will forge forward and, uh, and work through uh, next steps with our agency. So again, thank you all very much uh, for, for being with us and be a part of this, this process. Thank you. Uh, we will move to our first government witness for today. And I need to get back to my notes. Uh, this is a, a witness we don't often see in this committee, but uh, who was motivated to testify on this bill by the impacts of algorithm on the healthcare industry. Uh, Diane C. Lewis, chair of the DC Health Benefits Exchange uh, Authority Executive Board. Uh, Chair Lewis, welcome. Yes. Thank you so much. It uh, is the practice of this committee to put all of our government witnesses uh, under oath. So I would ask that you uh, raise your right hand. Do you swear or affirm under penalty of perjury that the testimony you are about to provide to the Committee on Government Operations and Facilities is the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? Yes, I do. Wonderful. Yeah, you can begin your testimony. Thank you so much. Good afternoon, Chairman White, members of the Committee on Government Operations and Facilities and staff. My name is Diane Lewis, and I am the chair of the executive board of the DC Health Benefit Exchange Authority. Thank you for the opportunity to appear before you today to testify on Bill 24558, the Stop Discrimination by Algorithms Act of 2021. HBX is an independent agency established by DC policymakers to implement the Affordable Care Act and to build and operate DC's state-based online health insurance marketplace, otherwise known as DC HealthLink. More than 100,000 people get their health insurance through DC HealthLink, including more than uh, 5,300 district small businesses and nonprofits covering 85,000 people, including Congress and 15,000 residents with individual marketplace health insurance. My testimony today is limited to Bill 24558 application to health insurers offering coverage under the DC Health Link and the medical care our enrollees receive. In that respect, we are supportive of the goals of the legislation to root out unjust discrimination. That being said, there are a few clarifications to the bill we would like to see made. Clarifications we uh, have uh, we have also shared with the Office of the Attorney General. Events over the last several years continue to expose the systems of inequity and racism in which we live and work, including in healthcare, and have forced our country to take a more honest look at ourselves, our values, and our commitment to justice. These events, including COVID-19, highlighted the long history of racism and mistreatment of people 
of color in the healthcare system and the subsequent travesties that result when left unaddressed. As Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. said, of all the forms of inequality, injustice in healthcare is the most shocking and inhumane. The HBX Executive Board believes it is critical to be part of the solution and to help end systemic racism and injustice in healthcare. In 2020, the HBX Executive Board created a working group on social justice and health disparities, which I chaired. And Dr. Kara James, President and CEO of Grant Makers in Health, Vice Chair. We asked the working group to identify ways HBX can help while rec recognizing it was important not to displace or replace the work district agencies, community leaders, providers, and payers are already doing. Our goal was to identify specific solutions within HBX's authority that HBX can implement with health insurers that offer coverage on DC HealthLink. All our health plans served on the working group and voluntarily agreed to take significant actions to help address health disparities and racism. The working group issued many recommendations, including, for example, modifying health insurance benefit design for DC Health Link standard plans to eliminate cost sharing for conditions that disproportionately affect patients of color in the district. In July, 2021, the HBX board adopted unanimous recommendations of the working group. And in July, 2022, received a report on, on health plan implementation of the new requirements. In our initial research and implementation work with our health plans, we identified how healthcare clinical decision-making tools and algorithms perpetuate health disparities among communities of color. For example, one clinical decision-making tool called GFR estimates how well kidneys function. The tool race adjustment automatically added points to the score for black patients, making it look as though their kidneys function better. The artificially inflated score delayed kidney treatment and prevented some patients from receiving life-saving transplants. Importantly, DC Health Link insurers all agreed to prohibit the use of race in estimating GFR by their network providers. It should be noted that the National Kidney Foundation revised its guidelines to prohibit the use of race in estimating GFR. Moreover, of people of color, are less likely to be, excuse me, to be eligible for intensive care management or receive timely diagnosis or appropriate care for heart failure, kidney disease, certain cancers, osteoporosis, and many other conditions. To that end, our carrier partners agreed to conduct reviews, report to HBX, and take steps to address clinical management algorithms, which may introduce bias into clinical decision-making and or influence access to care, quality of care, or health outcomes for patients of color. Several of our carriers are putting systems in place to conduct ongoing reviews of clinical diagnostic tools that use race adjustment. As a result of these efforts, we support clarifying the bill 24558 to recognize the work that health plans are doing with us to avoid duplication, while also allowing the provision uh, in Bill uh, 24558 to serve their goal of rooting out discrimination perpetuated through bias in algorithms. In addition, we support clarifying the bill to include clinical guidelines. Many clinical standards developed by national clinical organizations use race in treatment guidelines. In a New England Journal of Medicine article in 2020, researchers identified 13 clinical tools that use race adjustment, exacerbating health disparities and inequities. For example, vaginal birth after cesarean risk calculator 
referenced previously in other testimony, deemed black women high risk and classified them as candidates for C-section delivery if they had a prior C-section, while white women would be given a choice of C-section or vaginal birth. C-sections are not only more expensive, but have a much higher medical risk of severe complications and death. The good news is that this is the standard. This standard was revised recently to eliminate this race adjustment. Unfortunately, many other clinical tools continue to use race adjustment to the detriment of Black people and other communities of color. In our work, we learned that some healthcare algorithms can introduce and exacerbate bias in healthcare and therefore health outcomes. Basic instruments like the pulse oximeters to determine blood oxygen saturation level, a device we learned more about during COVID, are cal calibrated based on white skin, resulting in less accurate results for those with darker pigments. We should note that the FDA is recent, has recently established a committee to look at this problem. Bringing transparency to guidelines and algorithms is an important step to understanding and correcting embedded biases that discriminate against people of color. In conclusion, while we believe that algorithms have the potential to be unbiased neutral tools, we cannot turn a blind eye to the history of inequitable care and must purposefully act in ways that do not perpetuate those disparities. We must be intentional in our efforts to address injustice and ensure health equity. Racism and bias are institutionalized and manifest in many ways. The need for Bill 24558 is clear. Thank you. And I am happy to answer any questions. Uh, thank you so much for your testimony, for the examples that, that, that help us look at this. Um, let me start with, with one example that, that you use. Uh, you, you mentioned that people of color have faced delayed kidney treatment because a race adjustment in the clinical decision-making tool artificially made it seem like their kidneys functioned better yeah. is, is that right is it yes that's correct okay um now did, do you know how that tool was developed um no i don't um i mean it has a it has a long history and it's not from some of the reading at least in its literature it's not exactly sure that it was based on any accurate assessment of, of uh, black folks and their kidneys um, mm -hmm. But at some point, the decision was made to add that that added uh, uh, arithmetic uh, determination to any of the tests that were run, and so you wound up with uh, two different uh, assessments. Um, I should uh, just mention to you in a personal uh, in a uh, medical. Um, uh, tests that I had run just on regular uh, healthcare, the lab, um, LabCorp, which is one of the national uh, large lab, uh, labs in the country, had on its uh, results uh, that the two tests were run um, and gave the results for both. Um, it then said that starting in a specific date, and it was last year, so I think it was October or November, that they would no longer use the uh, one for uh, that gave a different uh, result for black patients. So there was a recognition of the bias and a decision um, by the National Kidney Foundation to change that standard. Um, and it's being implemented uh, across the country. Okay. Um, and so along the same lines, what's, what's the basis for using race adjustments as part of um, these, these algorithms, um, if, if the outcome is poor outcomes for people of color, why, why would, why would, why would we use those? Um, I, I have to start by saying I'm not an expert. Um, I have done some reading and, um, some of, some of the biases that we see are historic. Um, they date back, um, 
many, many years um, and were adopted uh, without question um, and have continued uh, to be part of, of, of medical care and built into those algorithms. Um, and I guess I wanna make one additional point um, that I think has been um, uh, said in, in some general ways, but I'd, I'd like to be more specific about it and say that algorithms are not neutral. They are designed by people um, and people bring biases in development of algorithms. Um, one of the things that's really important about this legislation is not only that it looks back at algorithms that currently exist, but one of the things we know is every day, new applications, new IT, new artificial intelligence approaches are being developed. Um, I wear a Fitbit every day and every day I get some kind of text or email talking about additional applications. So they are being, they are being developed every single day. We need a way to think about how we use algorithms. We need a way to assess how they're being used, who they're being used for and with and when. And we need to be able to be critical in our assessment about how they impact populations. So I think the legislation in our discussion today is important for all those reasons. I appreciate it. I'm, I'm inclined to, to agree. Uh, yeah, I think one of the things some people miss, not everybody, uh, is that the sort of you know, bias and uh, deliberate discrimination are not always the same thing. Um, and, uh, and I think this bill tries to address both of those. So, it, you know, it's not an accusation, um, uh, or if it is, it's one that applies to all of us. All of us have biases and uh, we need to be abundantly cautious when those biases get baked into programs that start uh, determining our, our, our financial treatment, our health treatment, uh, our employment options. And, and it, this is a, a space that we have to uh, regulate, with, you know, uh, whether it starts with the district or another state or the federal government, we've, we've got to go uh, down this, this path. So I appreciate you making that point. Um, the, your, your, your testimony mentioned eliminating cost sharing for uh, health conditions that disproportionately affect people of color. Can, can you talk more about that? Uh, yes, um, we looked specifically at diabetes, which is one of the diseases that has multiple implications uh, for people of color, and um, we are disproportionately reflected in the data, um, and um, it leads to a host of other issues and, and often to death. Um, and we know that there are multiple reasons why people are not able to adhere to the regimes medical regimes that are offered to them. And so it was important, and one of them is cost. So it was important um, to meet, to talk with our carriers and figure out a way such that we could develop a product that allowed people to be able um, to adhere to their medical um, decisions and to the doctor's uh, determinations with regard to diabetes. and. We are hoping to see some really good results um, as we see um, the number of people who are able to, to buy their medications, to get their special treatments, to go to all the specialists that they need to go to um, in order to deal with that disease. Uh, I'd be interested to know, I don't, I don't know if you know, um, what, um, what conditions currently have uh, cost sharing um, for, for treatment? Um, all of them. All, all conditions have cost sharing? Have, have cost sharing, yes. Okay, I, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. You meant to hear today. Did you mean <laughs> which, the reverse? Which conditions have eliminated cost sharing? Just um, diabetes, we just, at the moment it's just diabetes. Just, okay, just that, okay. Yes. okay. Yeah, yeah, I, I thought you meant the, the reverse. <laughs> um, it, it be, uh, based on your work with DC Health Link Health Plans, uh, can you tell us more about how far along uh, they are in this work and, and how you're monitoring their, their progress? Um, 
our carriers that have, have really uh, been committed um, through the work that they've done with us um, to moving that forward. Um, and um, they continue to uh, set forward um, standards um, in their respective environments um, with regard to their systems and their providers uh, to make the determinations about whether there are biases um, in, in their work um, and to find ways to correct it. So there's been a real commitment on their part to do that. Um, and then um, we have, as part of the working group, um, a, a reg, um, reporting back um, to the exchange um, on the work that they're doing. Um, and we certainly um, support that effort. And to the extent that they need further guidance, we work with them on that as well. So I'm sorry, have they done any reporting back to this point or are you still waiting for that? Um, yes, we have a we had a report back um, in uh, this this year, July of this year. And what um, what lessons have have you learned at, at this point about the use of algorithms um, in, um, in in our health plans? Um, one of the things we've learned and actually I think you You've heard it uh, both testify to it um, earlier today, although the, let me finish that answer. Um, and that is that um, often software comes from third parties. And so um, health plans are not always able to know what bias um, is in the software um, since they haven't uh, developed it and produced it, they've, they've purchased it. Um, and so the, you know, the question becomes, you know, how do you get a handle on that? Um, and the other, one of the other issues, um, and it was raised by the GFR and the kidney discussion, and that is that there are national um, groups that develop guidelines around how to treat diseases like kidney disease. And so in recommending um, a particular tool or algorithm, um, that then uh, builds that bias into how that disease um, is ultimately treated and, um, and diagnosed. Um, and so that's an issue that our carriers are, are looking at and dealing with. Um, we're looking at it as well. Um, our hope is that uh, more of the national uh, medical groups um, will be looking at it as well and starting to ask those those tough questions and, and make some decisions as well about those guidelines in the same way that the National Kidney Foundation did. Um, look, my last question, are, are there any aspects of this bill that, uh, that give you pause? Um, not really. Um, we are completely um, supportive of the, of the direction that this legislation is going. Um, we started down this road um, in our work um, on social equity and health justice. Um, and we really felt that looking at algorithms was as, imp as an important part of the discussion around health disparities. It's not the only issue, but it is an important issue and it's one that has to be a has to be discussed, it has to be dealt with, and it has to be addressed. So we are very committed um, to supporting this legislation um, and to clarify it in, in the ways that we've suggested with regard to the exchange. I appreciate it. Thank you very much. Let me turn to my colleague, Council Member Pinto. Thank you. Thank you so much, Chairman White. And thank you uh, very much, Lewis, for being here today. I'm so glad that you were able to join the hearing and share your important perspective. I think the healthcare industry um, may be the clearest example of one that has had one of the most problematic histories with discriminatory outcomes, and also one in which the information um, could be most useful to help rectify some of those previous disparities. And so, I'm curious your perspective, and you touched a little bit about on this in your testimony, but how, how should we be thinking about balancing our efforts to ensure that the use of personal data is not used to unfairly discriminate against protected groups while at the same time recognizing 
that the same personal data might be useful in promoting greater health equity. Thank, thank you, uh, Council Member Pinto. Um, I think, um, I guess I'd like to separate the issue a little bit and suggest that when we talk about those algorithms, um, which I have a math background, this may not be the best way to explain it. Um, it, it has a, a there's an, an equation essentially um, built into those algorithms that's, that state that require certain things to happen as, as soon as you put information into that algorithm and that tool and you get out a, a, a result. And that really is separate and apart from, um, at least I think it's separate and apart from the discussion about um, private information, which um, at the exchange, um, we hold very dear. We're really, we, we recognize and have built into our system um, many checks, balances and, um, and security, secure systems to ensure that any information that we get on the folks who are insured through the exchange are protected. Um, and um, we have built in uh, through our IT system um, ways to protect people and to make sure that those systems um, are not violated. So I really kind of see those as two separate things. Um, the, the algorithms operate no matter what. So if, as long as you plug in the information that the algorithm is looking for, it then operates um, to do whatever is necessary. And the, the embedded discriminatory racist efforts that are part of that um, algorithm operate on a continuing basis unless you change the algorithm. Um, unless you evaluate the algorithm and you change it. Um, and so it really is separate and apart from protecting private information. Okay, so when you say you support this bill and you wanna keep working on it to tailor it properly, how do you envision that more appropriate tailoring? I don't know that I'm an expert on determining how you would do that. Um, one of the things we've always done um, since the inception of the exchange um, is to bring in, is, is to have working groups. Um, and we bring in folks with the expertise as well as folks who are advocates and for folks who work in the field to begin to sit down at a table and work through um, all the specifics of the issues um, and then to make those determinations. I would hope that we as the District of Columbia have some sufficient commitment to this effort to decide that algorithms have to be addressed um, in this city um, because of the impact it has on communities of color in this city. And as a result, um, begin to bring in the kinds of folks, including the, the folks with the technology, um, to begin to figure out how to change those algorithms um, and determine the ones that create that bias, if they can be, if they can be fixed, fix them if they can't, um, do away with them and find a better way to make those medical assessments. Um, but I think the moment and time has come um, and as one of the other um, folks who testified said in the time is now. Okay, thank you. Um, to what extent, if at all, are you or other regulators in the healthcare industry analyzing the current use of algorithms and the types of personal data that is now being used to make healthcare and coverage decisions? Um, through our working group, um, we, um, we meet with our carriers and, uh, and providers. Um, they really um, use these algorithms every day. And so it's through their guidance that they help us to understand how they use them and the impact that it's having. Um, there's more work going on with, with uh, the the federal government in terms of some of the work, FDA is, is doing some of this work and others 
And so it's bringing all of that knowledge uh, to the table to make those determinations. Okay. And is there an existing requirement that health insurers disclose the algorithms or underlying data that they're using to make decisions? No, there is no such requirement. We've asked them to look at what they are using and uh, to understand how they impact um, various populations um, and then uh, to begin to work at making changes. Um, and they've begun that process, but it, they are certainly in no way have they completed it. It's an ongoing, ongoing study, ongoing review, um, and, and they continue to work at it. Got it. Okay. Well, thank you very much. Appreciate you being here and sharing your insights. Thank you so much. Greatly appreciate it. Thank you, Chair Light. Thank you, uh, Chair Lewis. Thank you very much for, for being with us. Uh, today, we, we look forward to working with you and the health exchanges as, as we proceed with this. Thank you so much. We look forward to working with you. Thank you. Uh, we will uh, call our second of three government witnesses, um, author of this, this bill, uh, Attorney General Carl Racine. General Racine, welcome. Good afternoon, Mr. Chairman. Good afternoon, Council Member Pinto. Uh, it is the practice of this committee to put our, our government witnesses under oath. Uh, so I would ask you raise your right hand. You swear or affirm under penalty of perjury that the testimony you are about to provide to the committee on government operations and facilities is the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. I do. Uh, thank you. You can begin your testimony. Thank you very much. And um, I've been monitoring along with my team um, the testimony throughout the day, as well as the excellent questions, uh, Mr. Chairman, that you and Council Member Pinto um, have propounded. Um, I do want to say um, that we appreciate the questions. We appreciate um, business's perspective. We appreciate the perspective of Disby uh, and others. And we are happy to work uh, with uh, any and all uh, concerned about particular specific issues that they may have or concerns about uh, the bill being uh, overbroad uh, or you know, even concerns about um, some uh, overlap with uh, responsibilities with the uh, DSB. Um, let me just hit that one first. Look. DSB is uh, the agency that is responsible um, for daily um, regulation and oversight over finance and insurance um, companies. Um, we respect them immensely. The fact of the matter is, however, where consumers are involved um, and DC residents who are consumers, the Office of Attorney General has broad jurisdiction under the CPPA. And yes, we're able to get involved in substantive areas, and we have over the years, um, where arguably DSB has similar jurisdiction. Whether they choose to, to exercise their jurisdiction or not is uh, on, 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 on them as an agency. Um, we focus on protection of consumers, uh, and certainly, um, protecting consumers from discrimination is an important concern. You know, I went back and looked at our work uh, in the area of insurance companies. And I want to tell you that one of the most important pieces of work that we did was around mental health. And in fact, what we did was we investigated the insurance companies in the District of Columbia, those healthcare providers to determine whether or not they were making uh, accurate information available regarding accessibility of, of mental health um, care. We found that they were not um, providing residents who have mental health issues, and we know how important those issues are now with accurate information and timely information. And so we 
investigated the companies and eventually entered into an agreement whereby they promised to fix the errors uh, and keep the information up to date so that folks who needed uh, insurance uh, for mental health issues, including depression and suicide, would be able to access that. We did that because it was important and necessary. And yes, Disby arguably had jurisdiction over that, um, but we just took the matter because we thought it was important. Um, so I think these issues around redundancy are overblown, um, and I'm happy to work with any agency um, going forward on this. So discrimination and bias can change people's lives. It can literally impact their opportunity to achieve the American dream, impact where they live, where they go to school, their access to capital, including basic loans, cars, home loans, and other needs for capital, employment, and if we, as we've heard, extremely well delivered by Ms. Lewis, devastating impacts on healthcare. Our country has taken critical steps to help prevent discrimination and support equity and fairness in these areas. For example, by passing laws like the landmark civil rights laws of the 1960s, building on these federal laws in the 1970s. Uh, and I know the district passed the Human Rights Act, one of the strongest civil rights laws in the country. It outlaws discrimination based on 21 traits or suspect classifications, including race, religion, national origin, sexual orientation, gender identity, or expression and disability. We also know that a law on paper doesn't mean much if it's not enforced. And we at the Office of Attorney General will not hesitate to enforce reasonable laws passed by this council. One of the unfulfilled promises of these civil rights laws is the prevention of discrimination through tools that could not have been predicted nearly 50 years ago. Modern technologies like algorithms that many companies and institutions now use to help make critical life altering decisions. These algorithms, tools that use machine learning and personal data to make predictions about people can determine who, to, who gets hired for a job, how much interest to charge for a loan, whether to prove a tenant for an apartment. And again, underlining the important criticality that these algorithms now play in healthcare. Without laws in place to clearly address discrimination by these tools, they'll continue to result in widespread but nearly invisible bias and discrimination against marginalized communities. That's why our legislation is critical and is necessary. It will modernize our civil rights laws for the 21st century. And it'll take us to a, a point of greater insurement that discrimination isn't allowed in any form. At the Office of Attorney General, we're committed to enforcing the law to stop discrimination in the District of Columbia. With your help in 2019, our office established a robust civil rights enforcement practice to investigate and bring lawsuits to challenge discriminatory policies and practices. Our work, excuse me, um, with the technology in my fingers, one second. Our work has included taking action to stop discrimination in areas ranging from denials of fair housing accommodations to denials of services to residents east of the Anacostia River. OAG has led the nation in protecting consumers by scrutinizing new technology practices and reining in big tech giants. We sued Amazon, Google for antitrust violations. We took Facebook to court for data privacy violations. On top of that, in the last year alone, our Office of Consumer Protection has handled more than 2,500 consumer complaints. 
returned more than $600,000 to consumers through mediation and more than $5 million through lawsuits. And we've levied nearly $5 million in penalties. Excuse me again, the arrow. I think the algorithm is messing me up there. Your indulgence, we're almost, um, we almost have resolved the issue. On top of that, um, I was mentioning that uh, we've levied nearly $5 million in penalties against large tech driven companies like DoorDash, GetAround, Instacart, you name it. The experiences have equipped us to recognize when we face a new civil rights frontier like the algorithmic discrimination challenge, we now confront, yes, algorithmic systems can expand possibilities for some, but for many marginalized communities, they unfairly foreclose options for the future. This startling inequity requires us to adapt our laws for the digital age, which is why we're proposing action now before it's too late. And it's perfectly okay and should be expected that DC be a national leader. People often assume that algorithmic decisions are more fair or accurate because they're driven by data and machine learning, but that isn't the case. Unfortunately, algorithmic decision-making systems are not always neutral. Instead, they can inherit bias or systematic discrimination that is baked into historical data or that re results from a designer's blind spots and then replicate it at a larger scale. When this happens, automated decision algorithms can change lives for the worse and lock people, especially members of marginalized groups, out of important life opportunities. I think it's really important to know that whistleblower after whistleblower after whistleblower from many of the big tech companies have courageously risk their reputations to inform the public that with respect to algorithms, the focus is on revenue generation and attention capturing, not on fairness. For instance, housing advertisers on Facebook have targeted housing ads to renters and buyers based on race, religion, sex, and familial status all overtly, expressly illegal activities. And tenant screening companies use algorithms to generate automated tenant scoring reports for nine out of 10 landlords in the United States, with some scoring reports making conclusory accept or deny recommendations with little information about those determinations um, with, without disclosing any information about how those determinations were made. I wish there, were an, there was an algorithm that could identify a slumlord. Where's that product? Yet these scoring algorithms can incorrectly sweep in criminal or eviction records tied to people with similar names and are especially error prone. Please listen to this in Latino communities which share a smaller set of unique surnames. Lending algorithms have calculated higher interest rates for borrowers who attended historically black colleges and universities or Hispanic serving institutions. And in the healthcare space, an algorithm used by many hospitals and insurers 
has suggested that healthier white patients should receive more services to manage their health conditions than sicker black patients. Meanwhile, software that schedules doctor's appointments disproportionately double book black patients, forcing them to sit in the waiting room longer and experience more hurried appointments than other patients. Employment algorithms can filter applicants by how closely their resumes match the business's current workers. After being trained on a workplace's uh, data, one such screening tool suggested that applicants uh, who were named Jared and played lacrosse were the best candidates for the job. Several years ago, Amazon found its AI hiring software downgraded resumes that included the word women and candidates from all women's colleges. Other interview software uses uses video analysis that screens out applicants with disabilities. These are just some of the many examples that scholars, advocates, experts, and legal researchers have uncovered. And you've heard many of the stories today. These problems are unlikely to change without government intervention. That's because while some corporate actors are starting to take a closer look at their practices, there is currently no uniform requirement that any kind of bias testing be performed. And without uniform requirements, many companies will not do this critical work. In fact, there's an inherent misalignment of incentives when it comes to companies scrutinizing their algorithms for bias. Companies that design or use algorithms don't always know what factors go into their decision-making process. And right now they have little reason to find out. Compounding the problem, it's not always clear to consumers when algorithms are in use or when they have been excluded from an opportunity because of some aspect of their identity. And even when consumers suspect bias in an automated process, they likely lack the technological expertise and access to the algorithm to prove what happened and why. Congressional lawmakers have put forward proposals to promote digital transparency, but to date, none has gained traction and the algorithmic space remains largely unregulated. So rather than asking individual residents to take on the near impossible task of identifying and combating digital discrimination one instance at a time, we've put forward a comprehensive public civil rights solution to protect district residents. It sets standards that all companies must follow to ensure that their algorithmic systems are not perpetuating bias in the first place, and it recognizes the responsibility of the government to monitor for problems and remedy them when they arise. The bill we propose today is an effort to create equity in the 21st century by ensuring that institutions have incentives to prevent automated discrimination and promote transparency about their processes. It was developed over the course of several years in consultation with civil rights and technology experts, including at the district's own Georgetown University Law Center, a great partner, federal lawmakers and regulators and representatives from the business sector. Though it offers the country's most comprehensive digital civil rights package to date, it's built on a foundation of principles common to many model algorithmic governance documents and frameworks under consideration in Congress and other state governments. First, the legislation clarifies how the district civil rights law applies in the digital space by explicitly outlawing discrimination in targeted advertising and automated decision-making in core areas of life, education, employment, housing, and important services such as healthcare and insurance. Second, the legislation would require companies to do the work on the front end to ensure their algorithms are fair and to share information about this work, the Office of Attorney General in the form of annual bias audits. And third, the legislation would increase transparency for consumers by requiring companies to disclose when algorithms 
are in use and to offer a more robust explanation if an unfavorable decision like denying a mortgage or charging a higher interest rate is made and to explain how consumers can correct any misuse of data or errors in the underlying data. Together, these provisions implement common sense guardrails to prevent some of the most pernicious harms of this uh, forms of discrimination on an automated scale to promote a more equitable future for all of us. We encourage companies that use algorithms to support this effort. To this end, we met with the business sector representatives, many of whom testified today when drafting this legislation to ensure that we incorporated their perspectives. These conversations prompted us to, for instance, reduce duplication of effort by allowing a bias audit submitted to another state or federal government to substitute for the report this legislation requires. We also ensure that the bill applies only to larger entities with at least $15 million in annual revenue or to companies processing a significant amount of data on district residents. This means that most small businesses are not going to be impacted by this law. The standards we propose here should not be prohibitive for organizations that are following the district's current civil rights laws. In fact, some of the businesses we spoke to are already undertaking algorithmic bias audits, and we credit them for that, and they welcome the competitive advantage that this early compliance will give them over entities that have not prioritized digital fairness. Institutions that have yet to begin this work now have an opportunity to get on board and be a part of the solution rather than fighting to retain the status quo. Sadly today, we've heard much of the latter. Many companies fought other civil rights advancements like the Americans with Disabilities Act, even the civil rights laws and ended up on the wrong side of history. Company, companies respectfully should heed those past mistakes and instead work with us and this council to support this important groundbreaking civil rights bill. For decades, the district has been a leader in passing and enforcing civil rights laws. We can continue that leadership both locally and nationally by enacting this legislation as a model for uniform digital civil rights standards. Considering the number of national businesses that conduct work here, this legislation will establish a baseline for how companies across the country can root out biases in the algorithms they utilize. And there's no reason that other states should not seek to adopt a model similar to this. In fact, we're proud to have more and more localities, states, and yes, even the White House, seeking our input and joining us on this path. Let's continue to be leaders. My team and I would be happy to answer any questions you might have. And I must tell you uh, that the team, um, beginning with Elizabeth Wilkins, who's no longer at the Office of Attorney General, Brooke Pinto, who worked at the Office of Attorney General, and now carrying the shouldering oar of this work is Kate Flatch, uh, who will, uh, some, and sometime soon, as soon as you ask a hard question, replace me in the chair. I want to also uh, commend uh, Vikram Swarup, my chief deputy. Vikram, as you know, uh, not only is brilliant, uh, but he is a, a great civil rights lawyer. And I want to assure you uh, that the entire team has poured their heart and soul into this to be fair to business. And we're receptive to any concerns that you might have regarding overbreath, vagueness, et cetera. But let's get this done for DC residents and for our country. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And, and thank you, Council Member Pinto. Uh, thank you, AG Racine. Uh, let me jump into some of the, the, the details of, of the bill because we, we've spoken more broadly with, with panels. Um, the, the bill includes thresholds uh, below. Welcome. 
Uh, as a government witness, I'm going to swear you in. So I'm going to ask that you raise your right hand. Do you uh, affirm under penalty of perjury that the testimony you are about to provide is to the Committee on Government Operations and Facilities is the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? I do. Thank you. Um, and if you could introduce yourself the age you just did, but uh, include your, your title. Yes, my name is Kate Blatch, and I'm policy director for the Office of the Attorney General. Thank you. Uh, so the bill includes thresholds below which a business would generally be exempt from having to comply with the new requirements, such as evaluating its algorithms and providing disclosures to companies, uh, to customers. How did you decide on the threshold of 25 thousand uh, district residences data or 15 million in receipts over three years? Sure. Um, so we chose the threshold of $15 million because we wanted to be consistent with the way the district has conceived of small businesses in other settings. And the definition of a small business enterprise um, under district law is one that meets certain revenue thresholds. Now it varies by industry, right? In some professional service um, areas, the threshold is 12 million. In some other areas like finance, the threshold is 300 million. But when you look at the median range of revenue per year that qualifies as an SBE or a small business enterprise, it centers right around 15 million. And so we figured that that was the best way to be consistent with the way the district categorizes small businesses in other areas. As to the data threshold, that's actually based on a federal proposal um, put forward by Senators Booker and Wyden that would propose regulating companies at a national level that hold data on Americans at a certain threshold. We actually are much more generous to small businesses in our standard. We made the standard 10 times more generous than the federal proposal because we didn't want to be over-inclusive and sweep in small businesses that might not be able to shoulder some of the regulatory requirements. And so those were the guidelines for those two thresholds. Okay. Um, and it, it seems like large advertising platforms, including social media companies, would fall within this bill. Do you know whether those types of businesses typically uh, already preserve a, quote, audit trail, uh, end quote, of every individual algorithmic decision as uh, mandated in this bill? You know, one of the challenges that motivated this bill is that we don't have a lot of insight into how some of these companies conduct their businesses. And so I can't speak to what a Meta or an Amazon might do, um, but we are aware that some of the companies we spoke to that have begun to do this sort of algorithmic auditing do retain data for a period of time. I can't, I can't speak to what the large social media platforms do, but I would imagine with the many, many millions or billions of dollars in revenue that they have, they probably have some pretty sophisticated data retention possibilities. And the one of the provisions uh, of the bill states that any violation of any part of the law or any regulation pursuant to the law is a concrete and particularized injury to a person. It, does that, is that meant to convey standing? Uh, to that uh, person? Yes, that's correct. That is designed to um, facilitate the private right of action. I understand from our consultations with civil rights lawyers who represent individual plaintiffs that there have been questions in the past, particularly around trying to enforce data privacy rights, about whether an invasion of someone's data privacy or a misuse of their data actually constitutes an injury. And so we wanted to be sure to convey that it was our sense, and, and if the council agrees, it was the council's sense that a violation of any aspect of this law would indeed constitute an injury that would convey standing. And what's, what's the status of um, reform in this area in other jurisdictions? Sure, so I can speak to um, local, state, and, and federal proposals. Um, 
I don't want to take too much of our time because I know that um, you do have other witnesses you need to get in, but um, I'd be happy to submit something for the record as a supplement, but generally um, there have been several proposals enacted in other localities. Um, you heard earlier this more or earlier this afternoon about New York City's um, requirement that employment algorithms and employers conduct the kind of uh, scrutiny and transparency measures that this bill proposes for that narrower slice for the, for the employment sector. Um, Illinois has passed a privacy requirement, again, related to algorithms and video technology in employment. And then um, Colorado last year enacted similar requirements for its insurance industry. Then at the federal level, there are at least three proposals in play um, that are quite similar to what we've suggested here. Um, and in fact, we consulted with the authors of some of those bills, including the staffs of um, Senators Biden, excuse me, Senators Wyden and Booker um, to understand sort of how they crafted their proposals and to, to borrow their, their best practices. And so there are sort of several tiers of um, proposals that are either enacted or under consideration at various levels of government. And I'd be happy to submit a more comprehensive list for the record. Um, that, that would be helpful. Um, and, oh, a few of the witnesses mentioned sort of very slow progress in uh, in the EU uh, on this issue. I, I, I read an article that mentioned it, I think since 2007, I, I can't remember when, but it has been a long time that they've been kicking this around. Uh, do, do you have any context on their progress or process? Uh, why is it taking so long? Um, is this an indication that it's too complex uh, to deal with uh, mm. with a legal framework? Well, I wouldn't want to purport to be an expert on European law, but I, I am familiar with some of the work that they've undertaken. And my understanding is that they've been very successful in advancing baseline data privacy standards that have become a model for the rest of the world and that they're now returning and layering on top of that with more nuanced civil rights data protections. And in fact, much of what they've proposed and considered over the past few years are the similar sorts of principles that we've put forward here. They have to do with transparency, accountability, and prevention of bias on the front end rather than waiting for harm to result on the back end. Um, my understanding is that there are comment periods going on to revise those regulations that will layer on top of the existing data privacy structure, um, but I can't speak to sort of exactly where they are in their process beyond that. One of the other concerns raised by witnesses today was um, the uh, impact on on businesses. Uh, obviously, the district is, is a relatively small jurisdiction served by many very large national and international companies that use algorithms. But what do you think would be the impact on our economy of us setting up this kind of enforcement system uh, when it doesn't exist elsewhere? Yeah, so we've heard from regulated industries and in other settings that if you impose whatever this new threshold is or, or requirement is, you know, the sky will fall. Um, I'm going to use it, Illinois as an example. Illinois has been leading on implementing sort of narrower targeted data and civil rights related uh, provisions. They have a biometric privacy law. They have a regulation for um, use of video interview technology in, a, in employment. They've started to, you know, chip away at this issue one piece at a time. And in each instance, when their legislature proposed one of those narrower bills, industry came and testified that the sky was falling and that it would be impossible to do business um, in Illinois. But the data just doesn't bear that out. There has not been a mass exodus of insurers, employers, small businesses from Illinois. And so I think that those concerns are overblown when you look at the empirical data. And in the last seconds, what would enforcement uh, look like for international uh, companies? So we do have a set of standards that outline when our law applies and when it doesn't. Um, to the extent that an international company met 
the qualifications in the bill, you know, held data on the requisite number of district residents or engaged in any of the important life opportunities and used algorithms in that space. Um, to the extent that the hum, excuse me, the Home Rule Act and our um, local jurisdiction laws would apply, then the, this regulation would apply to those companies as well. Thank you, uh, Council Member Pinto. Thank you very much, Chairman White. And hi, Ms. Lodge, nice to see you. Um, I want to start, and then I'm going to have some more technical questions. You may want to stay um, in that seat, but what was the initial intention of this bill? Yeah, so you've heard um, from a number of civil rights groups and local advocates who have been raising the alarm about the way that algorithmic discrimination is sort of occurring under the radar and in a largely invisible way, but in which its effects are most felt on vulnerable populations. And that reality was something that we kept in mind as the attorney general space and as other states started to really get serious about data privacy, right? You've heard California, Virginia, um, New York have all been passing data privacy laws. And we thought those were important, but those weren't enough to solve the kinds of problems that we really care about in the district, which is the ways in which the misuse of data most harms vulnerable populations. When you do data privacy, you're equipping sophisticated consumers with tools to control their own data, but you're not doing much for folks who don't have the capacity or the agency to, to operate those controls. And so instead you need a public civil rights answer to similar problems, and that's what this bill does. And so that was sort of the origin or the impetus, which is to combat this kind of discrimination, but in a way that shares the responsibility between industry and government rather than leaving the burden on the shoulders of individual consumers. Okay. And because you bring up data privacy, I think it's an interesting comparison of the lack of action from most local jurisdictions or states because of the interstate consequences of regulating this space. And I'm certainly not persuaded by arguments that the district shouldn't be a leader with civil rights or that the district um, shouldn't be a leader because it's preventing, uh, preventing discrimination is gonna make it too hard to do business. That's not an argument, but uh, that's persuasive to me. But the argument that this may be a better federal standard because how are businesses going to figure out how to comply if in a few years, every state within the region has slightly different rules that they're trying to abide by in an ever globalized world? Um, how, how do we account for that? Yeah, so I'm not persuaded by the argument that we should wait for a single nationwide standard. Um, discrimination by algorithms is a problem today, and district residents shouldn't have to wait for Congress to act. Um, we have different civil rights laws right now at the state level. Every um, jurisdiction has its own version of our Human Rights Act, and the standards in each of those laws vary slightly, and businesses have figured out how to comply with those regimes, and so we don't see this um, as, a, as a unique scenario. Same with the consumer protection laws, right? We have our CPPA, other states have their own UDAPs. There are some variations, but there's also commonality across the board. And so state, excuse me, companies have figured out how to operate in all 50 states. And I would expect them to bring that same ingenuity to this set of regulations. Okay. How do you think best to define artificial intelligence and algorithmic discrimination? Yeah, so there are a bunch of definitions, out, possible definitions out there. Um, we've heard today from some advocates who would like to see a broader definition of the types of algorithms that could be covered. Um, we heard invitations to ensure that um, simpler statistical processes or healthcare um, guidelines be considered a, a type of covered algorithmic process. On the other end of the spectrum, right, we've heard from businesses that would like a much tighter 
definition where perhaps only a truly black box system where there's no visibility into the process and, and no kind of human involvement um, might be the appropriate standard. We think that our bill proposes a definition that falls somewhere in the middle. Um, it's, it's not sweeping in any kind of process that involves math or statistics, but it's not exempting tools that really do um, hold a lot of potential for perpetuating bias. That said, um, I'm very glad that you're holding this hearing because part of the legislative process is iterating and refining and stress testing the language. And so to the extent that companies or other stakeholders would like to put forward other possible definitions that might be more workable for them, I would be very open to hearing what those are and figuring out sort of where on that spectrum between the folks who want the bill to cover everything and the folks who want the bill to come cover almost nothing to figure out where we should land. Okay, thank you for that. Is it legal today for a business to engage in discri discrimination through AI? Yeah, I'm glad you asked that because I think there's been a little bit of confusion about the status of current law. It is the Office of the Attorney General's position that discrimination on the basis of any of the 21 protected traits under the Human Rights Act is illegal now, whether it's accomplished through analog means or digital means. What this bill does is add clarification on top of that baseline protection to say, and especially in the digital space, we want you to understand the details of what that discrimination might look like. So this is not prohibiting conduct um, that right now is currently legal. If it's illegal to discriminate on the basis of race right now, it's gonna be illegal to discriminate on the basis of race once this law is hopefully enacted, right? And so what's additive about this legislation is that it clarifies the application of current law to the digital space. And then of course it adds the transparency increasing and accountability increasing mechanisms. But we already have protection against discrimination in any form. And I certainly wouldn't want any business to think um, that we didn't take that interpretation of the law. And we certainly will use the law as well as we can as it stands now to root out these problems um, and lessen until we can add to the legislation, excuse me, add to the law with this legislation. Okay, thank you for clarifying that. And so under the current regime, what, tools do you have at your disposal to enforce these types of cases in the event they are happening with algorithms? So we have all of the typical investigative tools. And in fact, we're hoping to permanently codify all of our civil rights tools. Um, we talked about that actually with you and some other council members this morning. Um, but we could bring all of those traditional investigative tools and um, tools for resolution to bear. So that means pre-suit investigative authority, that means filing a complaint in court, that may mean you know mediating the claim um, to seek resolution or ultimately resolving the conflict um, under a judge's guidance. The challenge here, however, is that through that subpoena authority and through those investigative mechanisms, we can't force companies to create data that doesn't exist. And so if they're not already auditing their algorithms, if they're not already monitoring for the effects that their decisions are having and, and retaining records, we can't conjure those up, um, conjure up records through that process. And that's one of the reasons we really want to emphasize this incentive for transparency so that companies are taking on the responsibility of looking at what their processes are doing and preserving records that might help them and potentially us come to better solutions. Okay, thank you. And I wanna use this last minute and a half to talk about the vendor issue of how attenuated are we gonna get with um, who is held liable? And it's been a concern that was repeated a number of times today about the administrability of liability for the practices with with other vendors and which covered entities um, are who are contracted with are covered. And I can understand this concern uh, that it might be considered unadministrable for a business to identify or understand all of the potential algorithmic decision-making processes that every vendor uses. But I imagine from your perspective, there's also a concern that we could create a system where folks are outsourcing everything um, and therefore being exempted. And so 
how do you advise we think through getting that balance right? So the legislation provides a mechanism for small businesses or or even larger businesses that have outsourced sort of these algorithmic processes to ensure the compliance of those vendors. Um, They are encouraged to, and there's a provision where um, it says that they should seek certification from those vendors that those vendors are following the law. And in fact, I think that that would provide some measure of protection. There's also a contractual provision, right, where what we are interested in is the complete picture. A vendor is going to know what's happening kind of under the hood and all the technical processes. The business owner, the restaurateur, which I know we heard from today, right, they're not going to have a lot of visibility into that, which is why we set up a mechanism where they can ask the vendor to provide the bulk or perhaps the entirety of the required report because it's the vendor that actually has the visibility into how all of this is working. And so we do anticipate and and account for this sort of interrelationship between third party vendors and um, local businesses. And we're hopeful that the mechanism that we've put in the bill works well. But again, if there are other ways to um, specify that relationship and there are solutions that folks want to put forward, I I would be all ears. And I know that the council is committed to really refining and, and uh, honing the language. And so I think other proposals would be welcome. Okay. Well, thank you so much. And I know I'm out of time, Chairman. I think that will be an interesting piece to follow up on at a later date of the distinction of the goal of transparency to access the data um, and uh, widened culpability that that seems to be uh, making people nervous that aren't necessarily accountable for all the activities of their vendors. Um, So I look forward to to working with you on that moving forward. Thank you, Chairman. Uh, Thank you. I I had some questions on that, so I was uh, glad that that you raised a a question. A couple couple things that were on my mind, so um, I appreciate it. Um, I I didn't hear this uh, come up are there any areas of, um, this did come up in, in testimony, are there any areas of federal preemption either currently or in the future that we should be worried about here? So my understanding is that there are some federal proposals under consideration um, that actually explicitly contemplate the fact that states or localities may have already stepped into this space um, and recognize the importance of deferring to the civil rights protections that may have a a higher um, threshold that may offer residents more protection than the federal floor. And so what I've seen in a few of the proposals is that they actually carve out a space um, to preserve local civil rights laws that address um, digital civil rights. Um, And so my hope is that if when the federal government moves towards implementing a standard, that those compatibility provisions will remain in whatever becomes law, such that there won't be preemption concerns, but certainly we'll have to see um, what is ultimately enacted and, and whether those pose a conflict. I look forward to that kind of conflict. I think um, I'd love to see the, the federal government move, uh, move on this. We, we, we heard a lot of testimony raising concerns about the impact this bill would have on, on various uh, industries today. Um, the insurance industry in particular, uh, and uh, Attorney General Racine raised this uh, in, in his remarks, uh, they've been particularly vocal in their concerns about the impact on the availability of insurance in the district. Uh, and uh, I, I guess I wonder, how, how do you, uh, the Attorney General sort of uh, opined that their concerns were, were overblown, but do you have concerns about whether this would um, impact the availability of, of insurance in, in DC? So I want to, go back to a point um, that council member Pinto helped us foreground, which is that the existing Human Rights Act already regulates discrimination by 
a number of entities in the district, including insurance brokers and insurance carriers. And so any concern that a prohibition on considering someone's sex or age or what have you in uh, making an insurance decision is not really an argument with this bill. Um, it is a complaint or a concern about the underlying Human Rights Act. And so I would hope that any insurer doing business in the district has figured out a way to comply with those baseline standards already. Um, and I don't think that this bill adds any new prohibitions um, or hurdles to doing business in that regard. So um, I, I'm a little bit confounded by the mm -hmm. assertion that somehow this newly bars a certain kind of conduct. Um, it really just reiterates the existing requirements of the DC Human Rights Act and then add some affirmative obligations to promote transparency and accountability. Uh, what about the concern about, uh, for instance, privacy? So if we subjected uh, this data to uh, inspection, investigation, what have you, would that uh, invite uh, privacy violations, impact trade secrets? How do you view those concerns? So the bill is currently drafted includes um, all of the typical protections and exemptions in FOIA, including the ability for companies to assert um, a trade secret privilege on information. Um, I did hear and, and certainly would be interested in, in revisiting with stakeholders the issue about the timeline for data retention, um, that some companies currently hold data for one year or two years as opposed to five. And I think that that's an area where we could certainly talk about what might be most uh, technically feasible and workable for them. Okay. And um, risk to consumer data, uh, an issue raised by uh, the credit union industry uh, do you have a response to, to that concern? So you'll have to help me if I if I don't um, fully grasp the the concern. What I recall from from what the representative said was that by retaining additional data for a longer period of time, it may place consumer privacy at risk. You know, increase the risk of breach and and that kind of thing. I think that's the sort of concern that could be folded into the conversation about the appropriate retention period and what might make most sense for that in, for for industries that are regulated. But if there was a nuance to that that I missed, I'd be happy to think about it a little more. Um. If there's more of a nuance, then 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 I'm not clear what. But there's there's that concern, and then the one which overlaps with with what we were just talking about, which is that you know in, in inspection of of, of data um, would uh, create another opportunity for a data breach. I see. Well, what we're asking for in our audit reports that are submitted to the Office of Attorney General is sort of an aggregate summary. We do ask that businesses retain their own data should there be a need to examine it more closely. And so we're not asking for them to hand over individualized personal data records, but I do hear, and again, what we talked about just moments ago, the issue related to the retention period. Um, I think that that would be the best place to solve the sort of in-house um, privacy and breach concerns. Okay. Um, I'm just checking my notes because I think... That is... Um, those are all the questions I have. Let me see if uh, Council Member Pinto has additional questions. And if not, um, the Attorney General would like the opportunity to just say uh, a word or two in conclusion um, once the questions wrap up. Okay, well, that's uh, that, That's the end of the questions. And uh, we, we do I'd have to get to the uh, DISBE director, but welcome uh, Attorney General to make uh, final remarks. Thank you very much. <clears throat> mm. 
thank you for allowing me to uh, just uh, wrap up and perhaps add a bit, um, not much, uh, to that excellent uh, testimony and uh, responses by uh, Ms. Vlach, who literally has spent uh, a lot of time uh, and effort on this. And I thank her for that. I think um, the question around states um, enacting laws uh, that might be burdensome uh, on businesses who may have to comply with conceivably 51 state laws is an interesting question, particularly in the privacy space. Why do I say that? The first privacy legislation, federal legislation, uh, came about in the Watergate era, 1974. There really hasn't been federal privacy legislation since 1998, COPA, that related to privacy around children. The federal government, sadly, Congress, unlike the DC City Council, is at a stalemate where significant, extraordinarily important privacy issues simply are not moving. Two reasons why they're not moving. One, of course, there's honest debate. To be honest, the big reason why it's not moving is because of all the money that the lobbyists are plowing into the issue around privacy. And so there's no chance for federal legislation uh, to move forward. And if we wait for federal legislation to move forward on privacy and states don't act, then residents of those states, including the District of Columbia, will be the ones disadvantaged. I wish it weren't the case that Congress is in a stalemate mode, um, but they are. That's all. Uh, thank you, Attorney General Racine. I, I agree with you. Um, I, I, I wish, uh, I believe that Congress was going to act on this issue anytime soon. Uh, they're not, realistically. And so it does leave it to the states and uh, future state uh, to move down this, this path. So uh, we, will, we will work to do that. And we'll, we'll work with, uh, with, with partners and, and people with various interests to make sure we, we get it as, as correct as possible as we do. So thank you for, 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 for being a leader on this. And uh, we look forward to working with you and your team uh, as we progress on this. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Uh, we will move to our final public witness. Um, and I uh, welcome Commissioner Karima Woods of the Department of Insurance, Securities and Banking the uh, designated representative of the executive on this bill. Good afternoon, good evening. Good evening. Uh, welcome, uh, Commissioner Woods and your team. Uh, as you all know, uh, it is the practice of this committee to put our government witnesses under oath. Uh, so I see Philip Barlow with you. Will there be anyone uh, in addition to the two of you who may uh, answer questions or testify? We have one other staff member, um, Adam Levi, who is our assistant um, um, General Counsel who will be joining us as well. I don't see him on the screen, though. All right. Uh, Adam Levi, if you are here, please turn on your camera momentarily. Yes, Thank I'm you. here. Thank you. Wonderful. Thank you so much. I will ask Thank that you. everyone uh, raise your right hand. Mm -hmm. Do you swear or affirm under penalty of perjury that the testimony you are about to provide to the Committee on Government Operations and Facilities is the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? I do. Thank you so much. Uh, you can begin your testimony. 
Great, thank you very much, um, Chairperson White. Good afternoon to all, good afternoon to Council Member Pinto and any other council members that have joined uh, and the staff of the Committee on Government Operations and Facilities. I am Karima Woods, Commissioner of the District's Department of Insurance, Securities and Banking. On behalf of Mayor Muriel Bowser, I want to thank you for the opportunity to share the department's concerns about Bill 24-558, the Stop Discrimination by Algorithms Act of 2021. DISB's mission is threefold, to cultivate a regulatory environment that protects consumers and attracts and retains financial services firms to the district, to empower and educate residents, and to provide financing for small businesses. We accomplished this by effectively regulating the district's financial services industry I'm gonna... to ensure district residents have access to a wide choice of financial services and service providers. This V also provides a variety of targeted financial empowerment programs, promotes a positive business climate that encourages fair and open competition, supports economic development, and fosters business growth in the district. As currently drafted, the bill prohibits covered entities from using algorithmic eligibility determinations on the basis of the protected classes set forth in the district's Human Rights Act. Such determinations include access to, approval for, or offer of credit and insurance, among others. The bill also establishes annual auditing and reporting requirements for covered entities and a new notice requirement. Finally, the legislation would vest the Office of the Attorney General with civil enforcement authority and create a private right of action for persons aggrieved by violations of the act. For decades, we have benefited from technological advancements that have impacted every facet of our daily lives. In recent years, these advancements have become more sophisticated and allow for better delivery of services to countless individuals. The financial service industry has been no exception. For example, financial services companies use algorithms, artificial intelligence, machine learning, and big data to make critical underwriting and pricing decisions that allow for a well-functioning marketplace for insurance and loan products and services. While DISBY supports the intent of the bill, we request that the council amend the language to exempt entities and individuals licensed and regulated by DISBY, as well as national banks and federal credit unions from the definition of covered entity. DISBY regulated entities should not be subject to the provisions of the bill for the following reasons. First, the bill duplicates core insurance and lending regulatory functions currently administered by DISBY, which could create unnecessary confusion and uncertainty. Second, the bill includes standards that are inconsistent with existing laws governing financial services companies. For example, it is standard practice for insurers to equitably distinguish between individuals or groups of individuals who have similar risk characteristics in order to make accurate predictions and develop appropriate rates. Third, the bill would impose significant and costly regulatory compliance burdens on financial services companies operating in the district that will be passed along to consumers. And fourth, the bill would adversely impact the financial services marketplace in the district by stifling innovation, reducing competition, and increasing the cost of financial products and services sold to district residents and consumers. DISBY's mission requires the agency to balance the regulatory burdens it places upon the entities it regulates with the district's interest. This delicate balance that DISBY staff work diligently to strike must be achieved while providing robust consumer protection and fostering dynamic competitive markets. 
Disby has cultivated a broad and nuanced perspective from the collective experience and expertise of its staff and its well-developed relationships with members of the industry, consumers and other regulators, and should continue to be the sole entity in district government tasked with regulating such entities. The council has already delegated to the commissioner of Disby a comprehensive and highly technical regulatory scheme, which has been codified in the insurance and banking codes and includes expressed anti-discrimination and unfair and deceptive trade pr practice provisions, including the Insurance Unfair Trade Practices Act, the Compulsory No-Fault Motor Vehicle Insurance Act, and the Mortgage Lenders and Brokers Act. Specifically, the Insurance Unfair Trade Practices Act prohibits discrimination between individuals in the same class for life insurance, accident and health insurance, and property and casualty insurance. The act also prohibits unfair discrimination in a property and casualty policy or a life, health, or annuity policy solely because the applicant or insured or an employee of either is mentally or physically impaired. Likewise, the Compulsory No-Fault Motor Vehicle Insurance Act prohibits discrimination in motor vehicle insurance for any reasons provided under the district's Human Rights Act. Lastly, the Mortgage Lenders and Brokers Act prohibits engaging in any unfair or deceptive practice toward any person. The act also prohibits making in any manner false or deceptive statements or representation, including with regard to the rates, points, or other financing terms or conditions for a residential mortgage loan or engaging in bait and switch advertising. The act also prohibits unfair steering and improper use of credit scores. Presently, DISB has existing authority to issue data calls to insurers to collect the appropriate and necessary information to effectively review and evaluate the algorithms of insurers. Earlier this year, DISB initiated a review of issuers of private passenger automobile insurance in the district to examine any unintentional bias exists in the algorithms used by those insurers. This builds upon previous work by DISB to determine whether certain insurers' use of models is operating as expected. To date, DISB has held a public hearing and issued a request for comment to the industry and public on the scope of the examination. The treatment of underwriting and rating factors, how actuarial guidance applies to protected classes and criteria for evaluating potential bias. We're in the process of developing a data call to request relevant information from all insurers riding automobile insurance in the district. Disby has engaged an algorithmic auditing consulting firm to assist in its review. If Disby determines insurers underwriting and rating practices result in unintentional bias, we will take necessary actions to address violations. Further, we also know that the Federal Reserve, the Office of the Comptroller of the Currency, the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau, and the Conference of State Bank Supervisors have all made it a priority to address discrimination and bias in the development and marketing of financial products and services. Finally, according to the National Conference of State Legislators, of approximately 58 bills that have been introduced to address bias and the use of algorithms. 17 of those bills were rejected. No state has attempted to impose the type of comprehensive regulatory scheme or delegate regulatory authority to the state attorney general as contemplated by Bill 24-558. Of the seven bills that have been enacted, four established task forces to study this issue Two, Illinois and Vermont, delegate authority to the Department of Commerce and Economic Opportunity and the Agency for Digital Services, respectfully, to monitor limited act aspects 
of the use of algorithms. One, Colorado, creates an insurance-specific law by amending the state's insurance unfair trade practice law. In conclusion, an algorithm is simply a process used to perform a calculation. Like any other technology, it is not inherently good nor bad. We support this bill's goal of ensuring that district residents and businesses are not harmed by businesses that would use technology to exploit them. However, we believe the legislation goes too far for the reasons I have stated previously. Accordingly, we ask the committee to amend the definition of covered entity to exempt entities and individuals licensed and regulated by DSB, as well as national banks and federal credit unions. I appreciate the opportunity to appear before this committee and thank you for the opportunity that you have shown to DSB. I look forward to answering any questions you may have at this time, um, as does the two representatives from my team. Thank you. Uh, thank you so much. Um, so the, the mayor designated your department to represent the perspectives of the administration. The, the major request in, in your testimony is to exempt everything DSB regulates from the bill. Does the administration have a position on the bill's application to areas outside of DSB's regulation? At this time, that position hasn't been um, made clear to me. And so um, I would say that's something I would need to follow up with you on as to whether or not there are any other areas of the bill that the administration um, is taking a, a, an issue on. I will say overall um, that what I do know is that a bill like this does cut across a number of different areas of government. And so um, we would want to make sure that moving forward, um, that um, those voices are represented in the direction in which any bill would go in if the bill moves forward at all. This is their, their opportunity. Um, it is, I'm trying to, I, should, should we be drawing a conclusion from your testimony that there is not bias or discrimination uh, in the algorithms of uh, banks and credit unions and other entities regulated by DSB? I don't think that that's the accurate assumption. Um, I, I think for us, it's more or less that we're in a position as the district's regulator, financial regulator, um, to assess that. And in fact, we are in the process of addressing it um, through our own process. And so we're asking if we could be, if you could remove the definition of covered entities and exempt those entities in which my department regulates, um, which would include insurance companies and also lenders. And how do you review our algorithms to examine bias or discrimination? So at this exact time, um, we do not review algorithms per se. Um, what we are in the process of doing is conducting a review through our diversity, equity, and inclusion efforts to really assess um, whether or not there is, in fact, any unintentional bias as it relates to automobile insurance, private passenger automobile insurance. That is one aspect of the work that we're doing in this space. Um, and looking at that, we will, through our consultant that we've brought on board, um, determine whether or not there is any unintentional bias in the usage of algorithms um, through automobile insurers. And so that is work we're currently doing. It is a work that um, it has been an iterative process. We've been building upon it over the years um, and something that we have engaged in over the past year and have brought on board um, a consultant to um, do that work. Um, I would also just um, say to, to Phil Barlow and my team who's spearheading that work, um, if you want to add anything to that, feel free to do so. Um, thank you, Commissioner. Um, so we we did do a uh, we did do a review of um as part of as commissioner said we've this is a something that we've been looking at for a while trying to understand 
the way insurance companies use uh, models and algorithms and, uh, and, you know, whether they're, how there might be um, bias in those models. Uh, so as part of that, we did do uh, examinations of some insurance, insurance companies use of models in private passenger auto insurance, because that's that's a big line that affects a lot of people in the district. Uh, and, uh, and in that review, we, uh, we determined that A, that the models were working as they were intended. There was no, there was no sort of direct um, bias kind of built into the models. Uh, but how, how do you determine that? Uh, well, we we looked we looked to see what the we we had our consultants, uh, actuarial consultants, look to see what the what the models were intending to do and if they were acting as if they were operating as intended, and you know and so I mean there were no there, there was no specific um, there were no specific characteristics in there that uh, that were that triggered. Uh, a concern about bias. So, so you know, they they did not they did not, for example, they did not have a specific factor to uh, to look at race or or something like that. So there were no there were no obvious intentional things built into the models that looked at those things. But that but that just led us to the work that we are doing now to see that if that whether the models. Um, include any unintentional bias. So it's an ongoing process that we that we again we've been working on for some time trying to uh, trying to understand the way this works and 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 so you know we so, so all right so at this point your conclusion is no intentional bias what, what about um what about disparate impacts driven by sort of correlating or, or proxy traits now, how do you sort of delve delve that deep in your review that's that's the work that we are doing now so so we are we we will do uh we and that one that one we are for that one we are going to look at all companies writing private passenger automobile insurance in the district mm -hmm. uh, rather than selecting a few companies um to look at because uh, the the method that we're doing it is um, makes that a, a reasonable approach to do. How well? What's the timeline for completing that review? Uh, we we expect to uh, we expect to have the results of that probably in the spring. Okay. And any plans to extend that review and analysis to uh, the other industries regulated by DISBE? Yes, this this is a first step um, for us to um, for us to learn, you know, uh, what we need to do. And so I the certainly the intention once we finish this is to uh, to take the knowledge that we get from this and and take a look at other lines uh, where uh, where we could apply sort of the same techniques and, uh, you know, and do the same kind of evaluation. Thank you. Um, and um, Commissioner, you, you mentioned in your uh, statement, uh, mortgage lenders and, and brokers, and, and uh, I believe you said that you, you already analyze them and their work for unfair lending practices and, and false statements. Is, is that right? Um, well, what, what we do in that space is we conduct um, examinations um, of um, those entities that we regulate on the lending side. Um, and so um, through that examination process, uh, we look um, at the institution, we conduct a meeting with them, we go on site, we examine um, their records, there's a set of information in which they have to report to us. And so um, through the examination process, we are 
are looking for a number of things. And so to a certain extent that is factored in, but that is not the sole thing that we're looking at through our examination. And how do you, uh, in a broad examination, how do you uh, make the determination that there are no um, unfair lending practices or, or false statements? So there are a series of requirements and I'd be happy to follow up with the committee and kind of share with you a list um, of, of what those are. Um, we do review um, Home Mortgage Disclosure Act data um, with the mortgage loaner, uh, lenders and also um, brokers, um, but there are a series of steps and in, in information that uh, the, the lender is required to share with us through the examination process and I'd be happy to follow up um, and share that information with you. Yeah, I, I'd appreciate it. Um, now, what about for mortgage lenders and brokers, things like um, how, how would you find uh, or identify inadvertent bias or discrimination in advertising? That is not something that through our examination process we would be looking at. So that wouldn't be necessarily factored into um, our examination process. So we, we, we wouldn't be looking for, um, for, for advertising to be factored into that. That is a place that companies use algorithms. And so doesn't that create at least one blind spot that exempting these industries would sort of leave uh, hidden? It could create um, a, a blind spot, but it is something that um, uh, we're we're in the process of looking at across the board all of our existing laws and regulations through um, a comprehensive code modernization process. And so, um, on the banking side, it's something we've been involved in all year long. What we're really looking at um, how we can go about updating um, all of our our load our laws and regulations to make sure that they're um, up to date. And so um, we're we're waiting on the final report of that. Um, and that report will include actual recommendations and steps that we would need to make to change um, some of our practices around how we're regulating in key areas. And so um, that is something that I can um, follow up with the committee on once um, that that information is reported out. Um. At least one of the witnesses mentioned something I, I saw in my research, which was a pretty significant uh, issue with Amazon's algorithms that they used in hiring that resulted in uh, discrimination against women. Uh, and one of our uh, witnesses uh, mentioned this issue. Uh, if there were um, bias or discrimination in the hiring algorithms of entities regulated by DISBY, do you have mechanisms to, to catch and, and rectify that? Uh, that, from my understanding, is not included in the scope of our, um, our, our regulatory examination process. Um, now, so are you asking that the uh, industries covered by DISB uh, only be excluded to the extent that uh, uh, only to the extent of DISB's regulations, or are you asking that the entire industries be excluded? I'm asking that the entire industries be excluded. So we've identified two places where algorithms play, as we know in some places, um, a role in discrimination and bias that are not covered by DISB. Are we comfortable leaving those possibilities of discrimination open? I would say on... I'm sorry, I'm sorry, Commissioner, and I apologize. I'm about to join my youth football team and I apologize to go coach them, but I'm just saying. Um, if right I can interject, I'm, I'm Adam Levi. I'm one of the assistant general counsels with the department. And I just wanna clarify, I think what we are asking for is really that the, the industries regulated by the department be exempted, not that they be exempted in totality because we recognize that the attorney general always has authority, jurisdiction, to uh, bring enforcement actions for violations of the Human Rights Act, regardless of the industry or the, with, you know, throughout the economy. And so I think our ask is really that they be the financial service industries that we regulate be excluded to the extent that we have regulatory authority over them. So I just wanted to make that distinction. Uh, one additional point I did want to follow up on as well is that 
um, as, as everybody knows, the um, uh, evaluating bias and algorithms is, is, is somewhat new in terms of regulators taking this up at least. And so what we have traditionally done is looked at whether there's discrimination facially, meaning on its face in terms of the rating factors that we may use. So we have not really, um, that has not unfortunately been the, the focus. It's good that uh, the trend now is, is going in that direction. Even as, we, as we, if we've heard from the other witnesses, um, a lot of in terms of the methodologies, the standards are still being developed even in academic settings. We have right now, we've retained one of the leading authorities on that from ORCA, uh, Kathy O'Neill, and she's working with us and, and she's the same Kathy O'Neill that, that uh, consulted with the, the OAG in drafting their bill. And so we will be relying on her. Um, I think the commissioner alluded to the fact that she sits on um, the H committee with the, with the National Association of Insurance Committee. So she's getting the benefit of witnessing firsthand and hearing from all 50 state regulators what the national trends are, as well as from a practical standpoint, taking this initial four-way and looking at private passenger automobile insurance. And so, um, you know, combating and, and addressing discrimination is something that goes hand in hand with what the department does in terms of, you know, right alongside of regulating the solvency of insurance companies. And so um, we have the expertise in house and, and, and so our ask is really in both on the lending side, the mortgage and lending side, as well as the insurance side, just to exempt those industries to the extent that we regulate them. So I just wanted to clarify that point. Appreciate it. Mm -hmm. um, this may be in the same, uh, the same lane. Are, are DISBE regulated industries subject to the consumer protection laws that OAG currently enforces through civil litigation? I can answer that and the answer would be yes. And do, does that enforcement impact Disby's work? Well, here, here's where the, the inconsistency and the confusion could potentially come up. Um, when, we, when, when our regulated entities submit like say rates and the policy forms for review and approval or whether potentially whether we, when we do market conduct or financial examinations, when they've been, when those rates, forms, practices have been reviewed and approved, there's a potential issue for what, just using rates, is the filed rate doctrine, which is essentially like a collateral attack on a final judgment. There are cases out there where um, rates have been challenged on grounds that they're discriminatory, and the courts have found that, and, and there's not a, a lot of cases, but there is a, a, at least a couple cases out there. And the courts found that because those rates were already reviewed and approved by the insurance commissioner, and because we review our rates under a standard of whether they're not inadequate, not discriminatory, or not excessive, they were deemed to be approved and it was essentially the case was dismissed because that issue was, was already uh, uh, reviewed and approved and it was essentially treated as a collateral attack on a final judgment. Uh, but I, I, I'm missing how the um, OAG authority over entities regulated by DISB doesn't, um, mm -hmm. doesn't cause a conflict with respect to consumer protection laws, but it would with respect to this proposed legislation. Yeah. And so what I'm saying is, is that it, it, that, that kind of determination of whether there's is a collateral attack on an already final judgment where you have um, rates, for example, that have been filed with the, de the department, that won't happen in every instance. There could be a situation where, like, for example, you, you, um, I think you raised their, a, a company's marketing practices. Now, we may look at them as a part of their marketing practices are not filed for approval with us necessarily. We may review some of that information as a part of a market conduct uh, uh, examination, but that could be an area where the, the OAG could come in and file a lawsuit if there's a, a marketing practice, which is kind of at the edge, I would say, of our regulatory authority. 
Okay. And obviously, when you mentioned, I think you had mentioned too about um, employment decisions, that clearly is also beyond our, our regulatory authority as well. I appreciate it. I am uh, yeah. I'm over time in this round. Let me turn to my colleague, Councilmember Pinto. Thank you very much, Chairman White, and thank you, Commissioner Woods, for being here today and for sharing your, your insights. Um, you mentioned that the Unfair Trade Practices Act and other laws that are currently addressing discrimination in algorithms, especially in the insurance, securities, and banking industries. What, if any, mechanisms does DISB use now to identify if discriminatory algorithms are being used and how often are these types of tools being used? So I'll I'll briefly touch on it and, and team feel free to to jump jump in. Um, you know, one of the mechanisms that we use um, is through uh, market conduct examinations. Um, and so we do con uh, conduct market conduct examinations. Um, we, we recently conducted market conduct exams of kind of top uh, riders of pri private passenger auto insurance here in the district. Um, and we, we conducted that examination to get a better understanding of the way automobile insurers use models um, and um, the differences in the complexity of the models. Uh, we identified through that process a few areas that we're currently addressing in future rate filings, such as um, some models that haven't been recently validated of the data um, and, and also um, validation that is old. Uh, most of the algorithms that were used did not incorporate artificial intelligence or machine learning, uh, but we are noticing that things are moving in that direction. Um, the review overall did give us a level of comfort related to the insurer models. Um, however, um, uh, we, we know that um, you know, things are shifting in terms of the role the technology um, is playing in the space. And so it is something that we are proactively monitoring. So that's one mechanism that we use. We also have a pretty robust consumer complaint process where um, if complaints are brought to our attention, um, we, we do investigate those complaints. Um, we also, under the, under the uh, Trade Practices Act, um, have issued cease and desist orders. Um, we, we do have the capacity to um, issue um, monetary fines and sus suspensions or any um, insurer's licenses can be revoked um, over um, a period of time um, as a result of our uh, regulatory authority. And we have done that over the years. Okay. And your general counsel was just talking about the desire to exempt industries that you all regulate. And so what type of added attention to the problems that have been raised today uh, would be brought to those industries in the event they were exempted from this bill? So our our main concern, um, so there, there are four areas that that I identified that are of grave concern for us as it relates to our regulatory authority. Um, the first around duplicating uh, core insurance and lending functions. Um, and we strongly feel that the bill um, would uh, in fact duplicate some of those um, existing functions and things in which we're currently doing related to um, the covered entities. They would be required to comply with certain notices, disclosures, and other annual reporting requirements and be subjected to um, uh, express uh, prohibitions, um, um, all um, of which um, will have an impact on overall business practices. And so, um, you know, for us, um, that is an area um, of concern. Uh, the second area is around the standards um, that the bill um, would is inconsistent with our existing laws that are governing financial services companies. Um, and then the third around uh, the, the regulatory compliance burdens um, that um, would be uh, uh, move to uh, financial services companies. And then, as I mentioned before, um, stifling of innovation, reducing competition, and the increase in the cost of, of financial products. Um, so those are the, the four main areas that we oppose and think that um, would um, uh, uh, intercede with our existing regulatory authority in that space. And if I could just 
piggyback on on those sure. comments right there. I would just want to add that, you know, that's our clearly our objections with the bill. But in terms of also what we plan to do going forward is we're using not only are we um, looking to all of this um, in terms of what the industry is doing, working through the NEIC, looking what federal regulators are doing, because we believe that the algorithm addressing algorithmic bias, there has to be some um, consideration given to the industries that you're going to uh, uh, be trying to enforce these laws against, because some of them are very unique. Uh, the, our, one of our problems with the OAG bill, I think, is that it's kind of a one size fits all. It does not um, delineate among the different industries. And so, but in terms of going forward, not only do we have all of our um, comprehensive, very finely tailored um, anti-discrimination laws in our Unfair Trade Practice um, Act, which are adequate right now to address algorithmic bias. But as we continue through this process of reviewing private passenger automobile insurance, working with our consultant that we have out there, one of the things that we're clearly going to do is apply those lessons learned. And if there is a need to um, uh, promulgate new regulations to impose additional affirmative requirements that are going to be tailored again to our regulated industries, we think that's good. One of the problems again, you know, in terms of having this one size fits all is that the OAG bill has essentially occupied the whole field. And so anything we do is just going to add to yet an additional layer of regulatory um, compliance uh, for our regulated industries. And we think that you know the laws that we'll, that we have on the books now, if there's a need to do, do something on the in the future, that we can make the we can recommend and if the laws need to be uh, amended, we can recommend amendments to those laws. If we can do it under our existing authority, we'll promulgate regulations under our existing authority, which the Unfair Trade Practice uh, Act delegates broad regulatory uh, rulemaking authority to the commissioner. So we are starting on this path and we are going to, again, apply these lessons learned uh, for what we'll need to do here going forward. And also just to, one other point, we also, under the Unfair um, Insurance Trade Practice Act, have restitution authority too. So if there are consumers that are harmed by that activity, uh, we can order that the companies pay restitution. Okay, thank you. And, for that. and if I could, if I could add just one more thing, sorry, sure. Council Member, if you if you don't mind, um, sure. you know, I think this has been mentioned before, but maybe just to reiterate. Uh, you know, we are very actively engaged with the National Association of Insurance Commissioners on identifying uh, other areas that need to be addressed and working through them to, you know, so, so we will continue, we will continue that. And that of course is, as was mentioned earlier, very important so that we, we work towards, uh, even though we use state regulations, we work towards uh, national standards um, for, for these things so that we uh, avoid, um, contradictory uh, efforts in, in the various states. Right, and, okay, thank you. And, and, and council member, if I may just build upon that, that point, and I think it's important, and I, I did hear some of the other witnesses um, um, attest to the work of the NIC, and it's important in our work because uh, the National Association for Insurance Commissioners really is a coordinating body of state regulators, insurance regulators throughout the United States, the District of Columbia, and also five territories. And so um, their, their work is important. Um, their work is directly tied to the work that we do here in the district to regulate the insurance industry. Uh, I am um, a member of the Innovation, Cybersecurity, and Technology H Committee and the Big Data and Artificial Intelligence um, Innovation Technology Working Groups. They have a number of working groups that we're a part of. Um, and this, this, this topic is being discussed at length. Um, there's a lot of research that is being done on big data and artificial intelligence. 
Um, there um, are current audits and, and certification programs and other frameworks that are being designed through the NIC. And my office is a part of that conversation. They're also looking at data and various regulatory tools. Uh, more importantly, they have convened a collaboration form um, entitled Algorithmic Bias Project of a Collaboration Form um, that is set up to address unfair algorithm bias, how it emerges, um, the right type of regulatory approach to mitigate uh, and to detect um, artificial um, algorithmic bias. Um, the project recently held a multi-day collaboration session, which my team and I participated in for state regulators, insurance regulators, and other academic experts. I did find that a lot of what we heard today um, was discussed in that context, and I think that as it relates to insurance specifically, um, that um, there are some unique aspects to the way in which insurance is regulated um, that I think speaks differently to other aspects of industries that were identified in the bill. And so for us, it is important that we um, request that those covered entities, including insurance and lending, are exempted from the bill um, because there are just a set of unique characteristics that come along with regulating in that space and are being discussed at length um, with other regulators, with other academic experts um, to better understand what the framework looks like and what the potential outcomes of that work would look like in your respective marketplace. Okay. Thank you for that, Commissioner. I appreciate it. I'm out of time, but I thank you all for your testimony today. And I'm looking forward to working together in the coming weeks and with the committee on addressing some of the concerns that have been raised so we can keep moving in the, in the right direction together. So thank you all. And thank you, Chairman White. Thank you. Uh, so picking up from, from there, there, there is a lot of discussion about uh, algorithmic bias, I think, some uh, folks who testified uh, have a lot more patience uh, with bias than I do. Um, and I don't want, and I don't think the agency or administration wants to be sort of stuck in a discussion limbo for years or, or decades. Um, and, and, and so I wanna make sure that <clears throat> where we are in the position of, of the agency is that you are saying that the attorney general's bill is not necessary for the industries covered by DSB as opposed to uh, don't pass it because you already have the authority because having the authority and, and sort of acting on that authority uh, as a priority are different things. So are, are, you, are you saying commissioner that um, algorithmic bias is a priority of, of the agency that you and tend to stay on um, in the immediate future? I'm saying that algorithmic bias is included in the areas that we are currently um, looking at and addressing through our diversity, equity, and inclusion efforts um, through, um, I referenced the data call that we're in the process of engaging in. Um, so this is an area that we are, are looking at, we're addressing, and we plan on having a result as to what actions or steps we will take um, based upon the current review underway. Um, I will say, as I listen to a lot of the witnesses today, um, what's clear is that there's a lot of complexities involved um, around algorithmic bias. What it is, how it's detected, how algorithms are designed, what the inputs are, the outputs are. Um, and so for us, it is important that we go about it in a very measured way um, where we are um, uh, studying this issue, but also reviewing the data because the data is key. And what we found when we engaged in our DEI efforts um, was that one of the questions that came up continuously from the industry was whether or not we had data to support our concerns. Um, and so for us, it was important for us to conduct this comprehensive 
review to really look for bias um, as it relates to personal lines uh, insurance. And so that is something that uh, we're in the process of doing, and we want to continue to do that. So um, we're saying that algorithmic bias is very much um, included in the area in which we're addressing as it relates to our diversity, equity, inclusion efforts in the insurance space. All right. I want to ask again, because I want to make sure I'm on the same page. A lot of people these days are talking about diversity, equity, and inclusion. Taking steps on that is a different thing. I'm trying to ensure that algorithm addressing algorithmic bias is a priority uh, that DISBY plans to take action on uh, now. So to answer your question, yes, we are currently taking action on that. Um, as I mentioned, we, um, we, we engaged a consultant, the O'Neill Risk Consulting and Algorithmic Auditing Company, who's assisting us in our review. We held a public hearing. Um, we um, are in the process of completing our request for comments um, on the data call, and we will be issuing the data call. Um, and we plan to wrap up that entire process, as Phil Barlow mentioned, by the spring of next year. Um, so it is something we're actively working on and addressing and looking at. Um, one last issue, you, you noted one of uh, the concerns that I addressed with OAG earlier that the district acting first uh, in this space might result in businesses pulling out of the district rather than complying with these requirements. I think you said uh, that it could this bill would stifle innovation. Could you, you share your assessment of, of that risk? Sure. So um, one of the concerns that um, we have continued to hear from the industry um, is been around how the bill would stifle innovation, reduce competition, uh, and increase the cost of financial products that are sold here in the district. Um, we know that there are um, a lot of new innovations that are coming online in the financial services industry, many of which are driven by startup companies, they're driven by small businesses. Um, these companies use technology to deliver products to segment um, segments of the um, market, particularly to unserved and underserved um, um, populations. And so uh, we want to make sure that that innovation continues so that we can provide unique products to district residents. Um, and we do not want a bill as such to stifle that, particularly to legacy companies. Um, we've heard from a number of banks, we've heard from a number of shores um, around how this could directly impact um, the work that they're seeking to do here in the district. There are a number of efforts underway um, to create unique products, to um, provide loans, home loans to um, black and brown residents, to um, provide uh, loans to small businesses. And we want to continue that, that, that work. We want to continue that flow of capital um, to support district residents. And so we see this bill as um, a deterrent in that sense that could stifle the innovation that we're seeing, um, the competition that's currently in the market. We don't want to reduce that in any way. Um, I, I think realistically, uh, industries don't 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 want this because it will impact sort of their, their business and their their obligations. And and that historically, I agree with the attorney general in his testimony, historically that has been the case for civil rights laws. And, and we have to be very careful about the extent to which we allow industry to drive the, the timeline of progress on this. Uh, that's not what you were suggesting. Is that that's right? Not per se, no. I'm, I'm not suggesting that um, in the least bit. Um, I, as I mentioned early on um, in my testimony that I think the overall intent of the bill we support. We recognize that um, bias does exist um, as it relates to algorithms. And so um, we're not necessarily in support of any type of discriminatory activity where technology would exploit um, you know, our residents in any shape, form, or fashion. Uh, what we're saying is that there are 
measured steps that need to be taken. Um, I did listen to the Attorney General. I listened to his testimony. I'm pleased that they've been working on the bill for two years and have engaged with other regulators and researchers. Um, what I do recognize is that we're the regulator here in the district, and I know during that two-year period, we weren't necessarily consulted. The work that we do does have a direct impact on the market. It has an impact on the industry, and it has an impact on consumers. And it's important that that is factored into any bill or measure that's moving forward, because it does have grave implications on the work that we do day in and day out. And we do have a lot of experts, and we've engaged with um, external experts as well. And so um, I would just encourage the committee to um, think critically about how to move forward with such measure. What we've seen from other states, as I mentioned um, in my testimony, that there have been at least 58 bills that have been introduced to address bias in the use of algorithms, 17 of which were rejected. There are a number of bills um, that have been enacted, um, four of which have established task forces. I'd recommend that the committee consider um, creating some form of task force to better explore the full ramifications of algorithmic bias and how it shows up across the different industry areas that are included under the definition of covered entities. I think there are a number of government stakeholders that need to be involved in that conversation and a number of stakeholders outside of government, including including consumers that need to be involved in that conversation to come up with the comprehensive bill that really does reflect what the issues are, the needs are of the district's current marketplace. And that for me is something I haven't yet seen. I know that the Office of the Attorney General modeled aspects of its bill off of the um, bill, the Algorithmic Accountability Act that was introduced by Senator Booker um, and uh, Senator Wyden, I believe. Um, and we've looked at that bill. Um, and what we've noticed is that the authority of that bill was delegated to the Federal Trade Commission, not to the US Attorney General's Office, Office, but to the Federal Trade Commission. And even with that bill, um, you know, one thing I haven't heard come up at all today is how will the Attorney General's office, in fact, stand up a program like this? When you look at the federal bill that was introduced, um, it creates an actual Bureau of Technology in the FTC. Uh, it includes up to 50 positions, new positions of new talent that would be hired that include specific areas of expertise and technology. Um, and so what I'm suggesting to the committee is to really think critically about what is going to work best here in the district, what should be included, what shouldn't be included, forming some type of task force and removing the covered entities that includes insurance and lending from the definition, including federal national banks and also federal credit unions. So those are just some of the concerns that we've seen and some of the caution that we would wanna share with the committee today. Uh, I, I appreciate that um, and um, appreciate the, the, the perspective and, and, and thoughtfulness. Um, those are all the questions that, that I have. I, I do want to thank uh, thank you and, and your team. I uh, want to thank uh, the Office of the Attorney General, the Health uh, Health Exchange, uh, and all of our public witnesses for, for joining us for, for what I know turned out to be a, a long day on an important issue. Um, I do want to mention uh, for the public, uh, if there are people who want to submit testimony, uh, you can submit written testimony and it will be made part of the official record. Uh, you should send that testimony by email to the Committee on Government Operations and Facilities at facilities at dccouncil.us. The record for this hearing closes at the close of business on, on uh, Thursday, October 6, 2022. So submit testimony prior to that date. Uh, again, Commissioner, Thank you for being with us uh, today uh, for the public and, and our other agencies. Thank you all as well. With that, the business of this, uh, with that, the, this hearing is concluded. The time is now 7.10 p.m. This hearing is adjourned. Thank you. Thank you.